Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the GSL Code S. We're about to get started in Group B of the round of 16, and I'm State. Today, joined with me is Gemini as Tasteless has the day off. Jemmy, it's good to have you here. How you doing, man? Thank you so much, Stady. Oh, what a nice introduction. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I, I regret calling you Jemmy already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's great to be here. Uh, I did a GSL way back uh, with Artosis one time. It was super fun, and I'm just honored to be back again. It's a real privilege. Yeah, and it's going to be a really fun day, too. We got two Protosses in this group as long alongside Dark and Bunny, so we can flex your Protoss skills a little bit here. Get some of that analysis in. And so far, it's been a pretty interesting start to the season. Group A was a banger. If you guys missed that last week, definitely go back and check out that VOD. And, you know, coming here on this new weekly format every Thursday just keeps on trucking along. And all this extra prep time these players have, I think we're in for some good games today. Yeah, no, I'm just really excited. I mean, I, the, yeah, like, I, like you said, there's two Protoss players, so I'm very much excited to see that, of course. Uh, I mean, Dark is looking like one of the best Zergs in the world. Uh, and then Bunny is also just this player that always has these super exciting games. He plays super action-packed, super just like really f uh, fast, essentially. He's like a really fast player, just always in your face. And so it's really fun to watch any, uh, any of his games. Yeah, Bunny, I feel like, has quietly been one of the best Terran players in the world for the better part of a decade. Going back to, I think, 2017, Bunny has always been in Code S, more or less. He's always vying for top 16s, top 8s, top 4s. Just a little bit overshadowed by the other players we have. And of course, if you guys want to come down to the studio, if you're here in Korea or making a trip out to Korea, this is the on-site viewing guide. You have to buy your tickets online. And it's good to get them early. Although, usually the round of 16, it doesn't sell out. We don't have too many people showing up to the crowd, although I'm sure they will slowly fill in as they usually do here on Thursdays. Get those tickets early, come down to the studio. 6.30 p.m. KST is when we go live. Make sure you bring your identification, your mobile ticket, and uh, if you have any trouble getting in there with the mobile ticket, I'm sure the people out front can help you. Yeah, it's just the, the tickets also go live at 5.30 p.m. KST the week, the Friday before the live match, so make sure yeah. to try and get them right at, right at the start whenever you, uh, whenever you want to come. And of course, we are crowdfunding a significant portion of the prize pool carrying on from last season, of course, losing, losing some publisher support. If you want to support the GSL, support your favorite players, your favorite eSport, you can buy Star Balloons there on Afrika TV or go to patreon.com slash GSL. You get some really nice perks too. I think, uh, what is it, the, the $10 tier, I believe, gets you replay packs. Yep. Which... Even the even even the qualifier replay packs as well. So not even yeah. just the main events. So you get plenty of them. It's super awesome. Uh, but yeah, we've got a total of forty-eight thousand dollars already raised. It's actually of money. kind of insane considering it's of money. It's, we just started March. It's the third month in. Yeah, we're almost up to fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's that's a lot. Eighty thousand dollars in total going to be going to GSL season one and season two prize pools. And we're already halfway past that mark. It's good. I mean, the amount of community support, not just here for the GSL, but across the scene in general. I know the Korean StarCraft League, which is a community fund org, also has some pretty substantial support. You know, fans going in, helping support the Korean scene of players. It's fantastic to see. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, uh, you know, the more that we have, the better for sure. But uh, today I'm really excited as well, though, to be doing some more GSL. And I'm just really hoping that these games end up being uh, really cool because, I mean, well, who doesn't want good StarCraft, Stadium? I think we're in for a pretty good treat, I have to say. Dark absolutely on paper the favorite to advance from this group, I think. I can't really imagine a world where he doesn't advance out of Group B. And we were talking about this even before we went yeah. live. I, I feel like if... Even a 0.1% chance. Yeah, it, I mean, you would have to be able to see into like every foreseeable future and then choose exactly the situation that leads to dark. Like maybe he gets food poisoning the night before, he doesn't get any <laughs> sleep. He stays out all night drinking soju. There's, even a then, there's a mosquito constantly flying around his head <laughs> on the stage and he can't he can't focus for his life. I, I feel like even then, all those things combined, Dark comes in today and he is still gonna be the favorite to advance from this group as Maru and Shin advanced in first and second place on last Thursday in group A. Here in group B, of course, Dark Stats, Classic and Bunny. Dark absolutely the favorite. I think Stats a little bit of a dark horse coming in. Let's see. 저는 그냥 좀 꿀조 만들고 싶어서 혹시 비조 하고 싶으신 분 계신가요? 아무도 없이 그렇게 말고. 오늘 예선 꿀조 뚫은 변현우 씨. 저희가 뭐 뭔가 뽑아주면은 뭐든 괜찮은 것 같은데요? 변현우 씨 보고 싶으신가요? 아니요. 
재선 씨. 어, 저 아니야? 끝나러 왔어? <웃음> 아너 똥놈이 동원이 형 뽑아가지고 와. 인수하는 거. 인수가 나 살려준 건데. 아 그럼요. 혹시 대엽이 형 뽑으면 무슨 종족 뽑으실 건가요? 무슨 종족을 원하니? 테란이면 좋은데 딱히 상관 없어요. 아 그래 나는 토스 먹을 생각이 없어. 토스 누구 있지? 아니 뭐몇 시간 몇 시간 동안 지금 그냥 아무나 뽑으면 되지 아니 그냥 아, 너무 챙기는 거 아니야 세상 봐봐 안돼아 아, 어렵다 저는 그럼 대우비 형 뽑겠습니다 지금 토스들 중에 보고 있는데 누노나 도우 형이나 현우나 저희 조에 들어오고 싶은 사람 있는지 좀 의, 의견 좀 물어보세요. 네, 뭐 령우는 싫긴 한데 또 대엽이는 잘 만하다고 생각해가지고 원래 토스는 올라가려면 토스 뽑아야 되거든요. 어, 저는 딱히 가고 싶지 않아서 어, 도우 형 뽑아주시면 좋을 것 같아요. 네, 저는 A 조 존버 중이고 대엽이가 같은 조 아니면은 제가 많이 알려줄 수 있어서 아보가 되겠습니다. 결정했습니다. 그러면 저 도우 형 뽑겠습니다. 오. <웃음> 다 포기고 싶었는데 말이 안 들어도 돼. 재선이랑 현우 중에 생각 중인데 지금 저는 재선이 형 추천합니다. 왜냐면 서로 이제 괜찮을 것 같아가지고 도영이 테란전 워낙 잘하시기도 하고 제가 도영한테 약하거든요. 제가 가면 질것 같긴 한데 도영 좀 높이 올라가셨으면 해가지고 뽑아줄게. 대선이는 그냥 100% 거짓말을 하고 있는 것 같아서 실망이긴 한데 그냥 대선이 뽑아서 이기면 될것 같아서 대선이로 뽑겠습니다. 제가 봤을 때 제일 괜찮은 조인 것 같고 그래도 재밌을 것 같아요. 아, 네, 저는 뭐 좋고요. 대엽이 형이랑 이제 카톡체에서 연습을 굉장히 많이 했는데 제 마음을 잘 읽고 계시네. 아니, 근데 그때 카톡체 때 연습했을 때. 어 대엽이 형아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아아
that kind of is true. He really hasn't been able to get the same footing that he had before. Yes, he is qualifying for GSL, but it feels like almost every single time he's out in the round of 16. Yeah, I mean, it's a little confusing to know exactly what's going on with him because we really held him to such high standards. And so, I mean, maybe he's, this is going to be the tournament. This is when he'll finally be able to kick start it off and really uh, find his form that we really so are accustomed to. Would love to see it. Let's go into match number one. Dark versus Stats here in GSL Group B. Spawning down to the bottom right, the blue Zerg Dark. I almost forgot that we're doing the introductions this yeah. season. We don't have the voice. It's a little <laughs> bit late on that one. Stats, top left of the Protoss. Luckily, it's not a mirror matchup, so not too confusing. Oh, but. God. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be rough for the throw in, throwing you in for the first one. It's a mirror match. You can't even remember what's going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my goodness. Yep. I do love the new like uh, player intro like cards or whatever they're showing at the the start of each match. They look very nice. Oh I yeah, like I feel like the the graphics this season are so much better than they were in the previous seasons of GSL. I mean, we stuck with that chains theme for like the entirety of 2023. That's true. <laughs> and that is true. Every season, me and Taste would come back to the studio. We would go into rehearsal. We would see the chains again and be like, oh no, it's <laughs> back. But. No, the art team really did a fantastic job this season. So, you know, if that's the trade-off for not having the, the player introductions, I will take that. Yeah. Well, going into this match, like you were saying before, I mean, Stats is someone that is, in general, not been playing up to snuff compared to what we were used to him before he went to the military. Since coming back, he's had a really tough time. First, Dark especially. I mean, Dark is one of the best Zerg players that we have in Korea, but Stats himself has only won a single match against Dark in professional play, like broadcasted matches and whatnot, since returning, and that was all the way back last summer. So this is something that Stats, I mean, he might be on the back of his mind just a little bit and just knowing, like, I mean, how many times am I going to have to keep playing and how many times am I not going to be still playing to that level that I'm so used to? Yeah, especially coming here in GSL and effectively having this entire season's Tournament life on the line here because it's not going to get too much easier from here should he lose to Dark. This is a very well-rounded group with both Classic and Bunny waiting in the wings in that next match. And even coming in here in terms of preparation, Dark is a hard player to prepare for because he has such a wide range of builds. I feel like oftentimes when I am watching Dark play, it's like I'm watching the SOS of Zerg because he really comes out with some zany strategies he is not afraid to go for proxy hatches. He's not afraid to go for Nidus all-ins. Sometimes you watch his first person view when he's playing, say, in an IAM. And mechanically, I mean, obviously, he's one of the best in the world, but you compare him to Serral, and mechanically, no, he, he does not seem as good. His build maybe isn't quite as tight, but he just has such a good read on the game, especially the late game and the strategic elements of StarCraft II that he is a really terrifying opponent to go up to in a best of X series. So I'm curious what stats is going to go for here. And it looks like just standard vanilla Oracle opening here from the Protoss. Yeah, I'm curious to see what he's going to go after this. You know, to, if, if Dark was really the, the SOS of, of Zerg, I feel like we would see like, you know, a proxy hatch in the main and then- <laughs> Like, like and cats then, would. Yeah, no, he, the, the crazy, he would, he would do a dropper Lord to get the drone into the main base as well, you know? And then on top of that, he's making a hatchery, but then he makes a Nidus Storm next to the hatchery anyway to get even more reinforcements in. That's, until he does that, I'm not calling him the SOS of Zerg, okay? So I'm just gonna put that out there. I, I mean, Zerg doesn't have quite the same Range of cheese as Protoss does. I don't think it has to be it's that not thinking enough but... state. They have to be, get more creative. <laughs> the big brain Protosses are not there. Wow. First Oracle is going to come in. Unfortunately, not really getting that much done. Losing a lot of HP on that as well. That's hull damage, not shield. That's not really what you want to be going. He got actually zero there. I thought he got at least one for a second. No, that was unfortunate too because the Spore Crawler of the main base wasn't even done yeah. by the time the Oracle got in. It was just a really unfortunate path there for the Oracle. Ran into the sight lines of three separate queens, took a ton of damage. Now he's going to come in with a second one, take more whole damage, go down to about 60% HP, and he only gets a single creep tumor for it. So value, man. That's not, value. Not the end of the world, but as far as things go here for stats, 
I, I have to say, it's not feeling great. He does have a third Oracle out on the map, so he will have some presence. This will allow him to take that third base a bit more greedy than you, know, you would should this absolutely be a disaster where you lose the first Oracle, but he's only been able to find two drones in total. And usually at this stage in the game, you'd expect Protoss to get three, maybe four to kind of pull in to about an even stature with the Zerg. So not the end of the world, but stats certainly playing on the back foot here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's not, yeah, like you said, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to spell the end of this game for sure. But on the back end of it, we've got the blink transition, which is totally standard from the Protoss player. He's getting a lot of extra gateways as well, though, without an extra forge with that mm -hmm. Twilight as well. So I'm curious if he's actually going to be going for some earlier blink pressure, which usually you would have it combined with the plus one as well to just kind of, you know, continue yourself into the later stages of the game. But I'm not even sure exactly how much. It looks like he's only got about, I think, six gateways, which is not even really that much if you're going for some sort of early three base all in or anything. So I'm kind of curious exactly what Stats' plan is here. But Dark maybe the one that be striking first with a couple, uh, I think it was Queens loading up into that Dropper Lord to get sent across the map. So he's the one going to be going for a big Ling Bane Queen attack onto this third base and stats is going to try to meet him in the middle with all of the queens inside luckily all of them do drop out though and that's going to be a big uh, re relief here for dark yeah that's a big link surround but i don't know if there's gonna be enough surface area oh the queen's coming in yet again able to pick off two oracles right out of the gate so that's a lot of dps gone here for stats and with reinforcing links about to flood across the map oh this is a very precarious position you see stats now scrambling he's going to try and warp in more stalkers Throw down shield batteries, and he hasn't even seen the Banelings just yet, but... Oh, you gotta be careful, Dark. Those Blinks, if they come through, this could be a really dangerous proposition lifting up. And this is kind of interesting, because, like, at first it really looked like Stats was getting completely surrounded and overwhelmed, but this is actually now buying him some time to get some shield batteries up, because he had no idea this attack was even coming in the first place. But now that the Banelings are finished up here, they're... It's obviously going to be much more difficult for him to defend against this, and the probe line can also get extremely annihilated here, especially with that giant wave over on the right side. The blinks behind the mineral line are going to have to be perfect. Shield batteries getting targeted by some of those banelings to really prevent the uh, the stalkers from getting healed by the batteries, but none of the stalkers are even dying, it feels like, and now all that's left are these queens. Stats can now aggressively blink, blink forward. This is looking like an excellent hold. Yeah, Dark might have overplayed his hand a little bit there with that opening attack as Stats now blinking forward, picking off even more Queens. And this has been a surprisingly well-executed hold there from Stats. I thought Dark really had him up against the ropes, but Stats just able to play surface area behind that mineral light to perfection there. You see the units lost have 1,500 more resources lost there for Dark. And that doesn't even tell the full story because in terms of probe losses there for stats, very little went down. It is currently 60 probes to only 47 drones. And Dark isn't even really macroing behind this. Yes, he is throwing out an evolution chamber, but the fact is he lost so many queens, he lost so many lings. He doesn't really have the flexibility to just drone up willy-nilly right now. He has to make some units. And that's gonna be more hydras and lings coming out on the map, so Dark just poking forward a little bit here with the Zerglings, and actually it's gonna be Glaives now what? coming in from stats. This really surprises what? me. That's wild. Who, who goes Glaive in this position? That's insane. I would never have expected that. I mean, especially after ever. already seeing Banelings, but... I mean, it's like an initial... Re I'm guessing it's a response to, like... Okay, I think he canceled it. Okay, I think mm. that was a mistake. That, that had to be I mean, a total <laughs> miss. Like, there's... <laughs> who... Like, I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, the, the Blink Sockers are going to come across and try to do some counter damage. I, I mean, the, the reason why they're not even able to do some damage here, though, is because of the fact that Dark cut all of his drones and instantly switched into the Hydra transition, assuming that he would eventually get counterattacked by the Blink Stalkers since his all-in did not work. But this is still, sure, it you know saves him for right now, but is this just stunting him for later on in the game? Because look at his drone counts at 54. When do you ever see a Zerg player with 54 drones with a fourth base finishing at nine minutes in the game? This is not the setup that you want as a Zerg player. No, this is certainly plan B after the opening attack failed there for Dark. And you know, one thing that Stats historically has been really good at is playing defensively from an advantage. And that is exactly where he's at right now. He was able to deflect and parry the first attack there from Dark. And now he knows that he's in a pretty good position economically. So he's going to be taking this fourth base. His High Templar count is already up to six and should Storm complete. I'm really wondering what Dark is going to be able to bring to the table in terms of aggression, because the way this game is going right now, I kind of feel like if you're Dark, 
You have to try to slow it down and wait for stats to make a mistake attacking into you. That's why he's going into Lurkers right now, because they're very supply efficient. They're very good at holding down defensive positions. And should he be able to get Lair, or not Lair, excuse me, Hive Tech done with, you know, potentially some Vipers and all those high level Lurker upgrades, then maybe he will be able, able to stabilize and get his drone count up to 80 or 90 with an additional hatchery. But the path to victory here for Dark barring some huge misplay by stats, is going to be dragging this game out and finding significant value with Spellcasters in the late game. Yeah, if this game, if Dark wants to win this game, we are seeing at least a 30-minute game right here. 30 minutes? <laughs> I, I, that's, I mean, he, he's he's been behind this entire time after yeah. that all-in has failed. His only strategy at this point, his only tactic, is to sit behind Lurker Viper. There's nothing else that could possibly work for him right now. He cannot go across the map and just try to end it with a big Hydraling Bane Swell or something like that. We already have carrier transitions coming out for stats, so the, the time for a Lurker push as well is also dwindling. And it's not like his army is ob obscenely larger than his opponents either to make that a possibility. So the only thing that Dark is really uh, hoping for right now is like what you said, that stats makes an overcommitment. He goes too far, doesn't realize that the, the, the defensive setups for Dark are still fairly solid because Lurkers are just kind of, you know, very good in this type of position, especially in the hands of someone like Dark, who is very good at these really scrappy late game situations. <laughs> so it's it's really up to him now to be able to just sit back, wait for the Viper Lurker to fully uh, come into effect and make some incredibly efficient trades. I just kind of glimpsed the production tab. Stats right now producing a mothership. Spicy. Yeah, something we haven't seen. Give me, give me a recall of the main. <laughs> give me oh, a I recall would love of the main. that. Do uh, it, stats. Do it. I dare you. First two carriers coming into play right now. And just going back to the point you were making earlier, Joe and I, about the uh, end game here for Dark. Notably, he doesn't have any melee upgrades. So it is pure range and carapace. And usually once you get up to Hive Tech, it's cracklings with 3-3 three, three that really provide a lot of firepower. They can quickly take down bases, even with shield batteries and cannons, unless there are Archons or Templar supporting. But Dark is not going to have that capability in terms of counterattack, and you already see him throwing down a Nidus for him. He's going to try and find some ways of sneakily starting to peel stats apart, but I'm not sure he's really going to have the tempo to do that. Even now, stats, he's maxed out. He has those original six Templar, which surely by now are all maxed in energy. Mothership is entering the field, plus one air weapons. Stats is also on double forge, and he is taking his fifth base, so Unless Dark can really make some play happen right here with aggressive Lurkers, potentially with Vipers, as we do now have two on the field, and some Nidus Canals in the main base in the third place, so somewhere on the map. It's actually very interesting the way he's going about this. I, I really like this from Dark. Mm. After getting maxed out, just deciding to go across with the Lurkers on the right while trying to get Nidus Storm set up both on the left in the main base and also just to reinforce his main army on the right side as well. So this is gonna actually still be a bit threatening here as stats, especially because he's actually got as his army just a lot of stalkers. He never really traded them out after making them in the, in the beginning of the game. Oh, nice pull <laughs> on the Immortal and the Mothership. We'll be able to get a second one as well, killing that off, only getting a time warp off. Very useless Mothership. I, what is it, 350 now is the, is the thing? Minus 350, minus 350, here we go. But there's the nice storms over top of all the Lurkers and Hydras coming, trying to come up. So this is the problem here as, uh, as Dark, is that even though you can still kind of push forward with these Lurkers, you still have to be very careful because there's still a lot of storms that can still blanket your army. I mean, yeah, the storms, they did get a lot of damage done, but they didn't really kill that much. They only bruised these Lurkers, whereas Stats lost a Mothership. He lost a Carrier. He lost an Immortal to the Vipers. And now there's a Nidus Canal about to stop here at the third. That's four Lurkers getting burrowed right now. There is no Photon Cannon, although luckily there is an Observer here to detect. But Dark, I mean, he's so good at maneuvering this army, he's going to pounce forward, take down this base here, and that's going to be significantly less income here for Stats, who at this stage of the game really wants to pad that bank on five bases, and Dark from a position where he is playing from behind, taking some really cost-efficient trades, and also being able to eliminate a Nexus is a huge win for him. Yeah, this is great play out of Dark. The, the, the ability to split his army up and actually do multi-prong with Hydra Lurker is like not really something I was expecting to see too too much here. Sure, you get a, a, a Nidus in the main to throw some Lurkers out and then you push the side or something like that, but the way that he's bouncing around a lot of these exterior bases as well is extremely impressive. Getting another pull on one of these carriers, excellent pickoff for Dark. 
I mean, Stats has to start getting a little bit more creative with how he's going for these engagements and, engagements, and he needs to make sure that he's not just bleeding out units constantly, because otherwise this is going to slowly and slowly become more and more Dark favorite. I would say it's already possibly even in Dark's favor, considering the fact that we still have so many Stalkers as the army here for Stats. This is not something that you can really win with a straight-up engagement as. He's going to try to go for it to try to clear some of these units out, but... I. We really need, like, wait, we need more carriers. We need, I think, maybe even some Archons to help out for some of the splash damage as well. So, I don't know. I feel like the Stalker count needs to get bled out a little bit here. Yeah, that Stalker count's been 24 plus for pretty much the majority of this game, ever since he held the initial attack there at the third base. And as you said, Gemini, that is army supply that is not going into carriers. It is not going into Tempest. And Dark, or Dark excuse me, Stats finding a really keen opportunity there to blink forward, take off another Lurker of his. An attack here on the right side as well. And one thing that Dark doesn't really have going for him is mobility. So unless he has Lurkers, Spine Crawlers, Spore Crawlers positioned on these ulterior bases, these counterattacks are always going to be a threat. But at the same time, Stats, he hasn't really been able to hold on against these Nidus Canals very effectively yet. Luckily for him, the last two Nidus has actually had no units <laughs> in them. It's a prank. <laughs> and just putting the knights there, expecting that there might be units coming out. There's not actually anything there. Nicely done, Dark. Very cute move. I mean, I honestly think that might be part of this, because you see him move forward with yeah, his yeah. list. Like, you know, maybe Stats is over reacting to this and pulling too much nice of his army part. back, but... Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you. I think it's, a, it's actually a pretty decent play. I really like this by, by Stats here now, though. Seeing that the Hydras are so out of position on the right side, trying to make use of that Nidus uh, distraction. Moving with his main army, with the Immortals and the Carriers on the left side. Now that he's got so many Immortals with these Carriers, it's really helping to bolster the army. And you can see that now he can really make use of that and push through these positions and force Dark back on his side of the map. I mean, but Dark is still just being so consistent with these Nidus's. It's going to still make it very difficult for Stats to get anywhere else on the map here. Yeah, and I like that Stats is just using these small groups of Stalkers to try and find any cost-efficient trade he can because... What he really does need to build is a more efficient army. He now finally has an Oracle, so that should help him react positionally to the Vipers and not get caught off guard, because at this stage, you really don't want to be bleeding out any more carriers. You don't want to lose that mothership again. And having Revelation is a critical part of that defense here as the Protoss player, because Observers always can get sniped by Hydras and Overseers. And Oracle Revelation is really one of those few abilities that is hard to deny there as the Zerg. And if the Protoss is on top of it, you can track the Zerg army really well. But the fact that we still haven't seen any Tempest from stats is a little bit puzzling for me. And carriers, I understand in this straight up engagement, they do have a lot more firepower, especially with the upgrades. And it seems like that's going to be Stats' path to victory here is actually Time War popping in. It's going to pair quite well with the Storm. He's getting some nice damage there, both on the Hydras and the Lurkers. Ooh, that's some really good Templar usage. Those Lurkers are low HP. I would not be surprised if he poked forward with these what? Immortals. And oh, Dark, a little bit of a missed micro. Did not retreat with all the Lurkers. Going to lose two more there. And Stats actually finding some good damage. Now, this is great. There's very few Hydras. So many of them died off to those storms earlier on. This is an, ex an excellent position now wow. for Stats to really punish this army. Fungal's coming out of nowhere, though. It's a nice little Fungal there, but with there's, when there's not that many uh, Hydras there or even Corruptors to capitalize on it, the Fungal is not very useful right now. Oh, that's a huge oh. Fungal, though, Gemini! On four different carriers, and the Hydras are going to creep forward. They should be able to get one or two of these. It felt like that Fungal lasted forever. Three carriers go down. Can he get a fourth? No. Saved by the light of Sight Blocker, but that was an incredible, incredible win there for Dark, and one that he desperately needed after losing that hatchery. Yeah, that was excellent timing from Dark. All of his Hydra reinforcements coming right when that fungal hit to really pounce on those carriers. Very nicely done by him. It's going to really kill a lot of the momentum that Stats was about to start building for himself because he was actually getting really good trades over on that right side. Killing the base at least is a very good... Uh, it's just good to be able to get that in the first place. So it's not like the world is totally over for him just yet. And he still had a very solid bank uh, built behind all of that as well. So he's able to rebuild. It's still going to take some time, though. And that time is what will now allow Dark to get more Infestors, get more energy, more Vipers, and really make it so that way this army cannot die. Yeah, Dark is really investing heavily. Pretty much every expansion he's taken, he's maxing out the geysers. He wants to play that really high-tech Zerg style, and those Lurkers are in a tough position to push themselves out from as the carrier count is dismally low. Mothership going to get yoinked again. I mean, I got to tell you, 
It's nice we have the patch because he's saving 200 resources every single time it dies, you know? It's only minus 300, 300, right? I, so. I'll be honest, man. These these relationships have not been hitting. I'm, I'm going to be real. That, the one on the right side with the time warp, it did yeah, pair nicely. I suppose so, you're right. With the storms, but yeah, it, they really have been quite a miss yeah, thus I just far. find it so funny when he pulls it in and you just see the panic. You just like, quick, do all the abilities. Time warp, cloak. There's no units under me, but I'm going to cloak them anyways. Like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's like really funny. Yeah, it is a, a little bit fumbling, but I mean, Dark is just playing this position so well. It, it is really tough as Protoss, especially if you don't have Tempest, to hold on against this Zero composition when they push here on the top right side because they can, with Lurkers, siege down that base there in the middle. They can pivot up to the base around the uh, 1 o'clock position as we see Dark moving in right now. And without the range of the Tempest being able to threaten the Vipers at all, we lead to situations that we've seen time and time again where motherships, where carriers, where immortals get abducted and Dark takes cost efficient trades. And this is a nice counterattack for stats, once again hitting this mining base. But on the back foot, he is losing two Nexus back at home. He's getting reset back down to four bases. Only two of them are really mining. He yeah. needs a very cost efficient trade here, but looking at his army, how do you really engage into these lurkers again without Tempest? I, I feel like he is missing a part of the puzzle here in terms of composition. I mean, if he doesn't get that, he needs some sort of flank to surround this army. Otherwise, going in at one angle is going to spell absolute doom for stats, doing storms on top of the Hydras whenever they try to poke close, but that's about all the energy he's got left. There's not anything to be able to really actually kill the army unless these carriers can get on top of the lurkers while the hydras are out of position, which is what he's going to try to go for. The time warp on everything is also excellent. Oh, Kills no the Nidus Worm before everything gets in. It's a ridiculous engage out of stats, out of absolutely nowhere. That was exactly what he needed. Dark had no overseer with his army. There was no detection. The mothership, its cloaking popped. And I got to say, that mothership right there was worth all of the three mothership. I was about to say the same lost. thing. That, we finally got it. The mothership hit. Oh, my God. An excellent engage. Something that we've been really, that, that, that's the kind of stuff we've been waiting to see with that mothership buff. That's the kind of engage that we've been looking for. And Stats capitalizing on it so heavily here. His carrier count is getting pretty high at this point. Oh, nice Vipers, Yoinks as well. Oh, oh lots of wow. them. Getting so many of those units in. Kind of forcing Stats' hand here to commit to this fight. Actually, was this a total misplay out of Dark? Because now all of a sudden, everything is dying on the ground as well. Yeah, I think he might have bit off a little bit more than he could chew right there as the Hydra count was not plentiful enough to deal with all those carriers. At the end of the day, a relatively even trade. And that storm on the right Ooh. side and the bottom. Just killer there for Stats. Playing a really nice macro game. And this is his element. This is where Stats shined in the past. It's where he's shining now. If he can get to this stage in the game where he can have a maxed army and control it and find keen engagements like he did right there in the natural expansion, Stats can still hang with the best of them. And he's proving it right now against one of the best late game ZVP players in the world. Yeah, this move right here by Dark as well is something that's really going to be keeping him in this game any longer is that he's trying to go for these random little lurker counter attacks behind the mineral lines. Anything to stretch stats thin at this point is something that he needs to do because if he just lets stats continue to dictate the pace of this game, this game will be ending. And stats is someone that when he knows he has the advantage, he's going to be able to capitalize that on, on that in the most efficient way that he can. And I mean, Dark has been doing an excellent job this game, doing all these little counter attacks. Nidus is everywhere, moving with all the, the Hydras, the, Ver the, the Vipers, and the, um, the Infestors. He's been doing an excellent job of that. But it's going to be getting much, much more difficult as this time goes on here. And here we go into one more fight. There are double-digit carriers on the map right now, Gemini. This army is looking so potent in a straight-up engagement because Stats right now is sitting at 45 probes. And okay, Stats, he's going to pivot to the triangle third here for Dark. It's already almost completely mined out, and Dark's going to be able to use that opportunity to push forward here on the left side in a kind of pseudo base trade situation. But that means there's very little anti-air back home here for Dark. It is just the static defense. And Plus if Warza. Stats realizes this, he has the potential to move in. Those <gasps> investors, they're really low on energy. Yes, the fungal is great, but there's no follow-up. So Spore Crawlers now are falling here for Dark. Yes, he is able to take down the best mining base there for stats, but suddenly the static defense back at home is getting dismally low. It's just pure Hydra right now. There's very little spellcasting energy. I feel like stats doesn't quite realize how up against the ropes Dark is. He has those 27 Hydras, three Infestors, no Vipers, and the Infestors are completely out of energy. 
This is still very tricky, though, for his stats. Even though his army is gigantic and it's extremely lethal, he still has to be very careful because one misstep and these Hydras could actually shred a little bit more than you expect, especially if the Lurkers are close enough to get a massive line shot onto the Templar. And you saw it right there. Stats was about to start to go for the engage, but the Lurkers stepped a little too far forward as the Hydras were coming back, and it really did force them off. I kind of wanted to see him go into the main with the carriers even, to like really mm. force everything off, and I think that would have been a really good play. But the problem here now is that this army that you see from Stats is going to... It's, it might just be about what you get, essentially. He is finally now mining that middle base uh, quite comfortably, though. He was really <laughs> unable to take that for basically the whole game before this, because Dark kept uh, attacking it so often. But losing that left base and all the probes there has really stunted his economy. The problem on the flip side, though, is that Dark himself doesn't actually even have economy to the begin with. So I think we might be getting what you want, Gemini. That oh mothership boy. is going into the main base. The army is collapsing here in the center. Woo! It all gets recalled. We are in the Let's main go, base, baby. circumventing the static defense, holding the main. And this means that Dark is going to lose all his critical chat tech. No more Vipers out of that hive. The Double Spire is here. The Hydralis Dead is here. And Dark knows he is in trouble. He's going for the counterattack. This base here is undefended for stats, but all of the tech for Dark is getting wiped off the map. There are still no Vipers in play here. This is going to be a really rough base trade for Dark's point of view here. I mean, oh, nice recall. Just <laughs> comes right back. And that's why, State. Yeah. <laughs> that's why it's such a tough base trade, because he can't actually kill everything in time before the recall comes right back. You recall once with the mothership, recall back again. The oh, Templar. the storm drop coming in from the War Prism. He gets almost every single Hydralisk. That is all the anti-air there for Dark. We still have 10 carriers on the map, and I think Stats might have just done it. The army supply for Dark now dwindling below 70. Doubled by Stats. And Stats in a big upset here in game number one. I think he is the chance to close this one out, man. It is getting so close to the end. Just a few more steps. He's going to push up the ramp. Microbial Shroud right there on the Lurkers. Cloak coming in yet again. The Spore Caller, the only detection. Stats, he takes it out. I think this might be it. GG and man, what an upset here in game number one. Stats was able to hang on against the Bane Ling Ling Queen Drop attack in the third base. And from there he played an immaculate game. You know, there was a hiccup here or there, but against Stark, there's always going to be those situations. And, and honestly, a really surprising turn of events. He played one of the best macro PVZs we have seen in Korea in a very long time. And now it is match point here in that the first was, series of the day. That that was wild, dude. <laughs> we, I mean, we love seeing Protoss win, obviously, because we are Protoss players. But that was just some good StarCraft that we just witnessed right there. That was a crazy game. The fact that it did start with that Bane Ling Queen attack as well, by the way, like, we completely, you would not have possibly guessed that if you just tuned in in the last 5, 10, 15 minutes even of that game. A total... A total roller coaster of a match right there. That was absolutely incredible. Stats showing the form that we are so used to seeing him from years past, finally shining through again. Will he be able to actually do it in game number two? I want to see so bad if he can close this one out. Dark, the blue Zerg in the bottom right. Spawning in. Man, I really don't have the timing to bring these things down just yet. <laughs> they, I need like a stopwatch they, or something, I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, they, they, gave, oh. they gave such little showing to stats in the bay top right there. Like, they're, yeah. like, little, they're, they're messing up on their timings as well. I don't no, know. We'll, they're, 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 it's a learning process for everyone here. We were, <laughs> we, we were coddled that dark for a decade. Favoritism. Yeah. Oh, finally made it to the GSL Life Goals. Ooh. Welcome, everybody. So good to have you here. <laughs> Life Goals, indeed. Excellent. Best casters. <laughs> tasteless <laughs> scratch down. Oh, man. Get him Love out of here. Love to see it. Get Tasteless out. So, Gemini, now we have a gas first opening here for stats. And this is something that I don't see too often in PBZ. This is not something that, I mean, I, I have been playing a fair bit on the Korean ladder recently. And this is not one of the builds that I really like to experiment with. I'm wondering, do you have any insight into why stats might be going gas first here as opposed to what we saw in game number one with a more standard, you know, gateway into Nexus, into core, and then slowly working up to that first Oracle? 
Yeah, so the the reason behind this is essentially just variety because mm -hmm. when you go for the gas first style is it's actually scoutless as well. The 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 efficiency of it is that you go for gas first with a still a normal gateway and nexus, but it just gets it just slightly faster and you get that gas income slightly faster as well. So you can Got get you. your tech going a little bit quicker. And it's, it's a bit of a gamble, sure, because you're not scouting at all. And uh, if they're going for an early pool, then, you know, it's that's that's kind of that. But, but at this level of play, the ability to be extremely versatile in the minute differences of your builds is extremely important. And in PvZ especially, it really actually dictates a little bit more than what you would normally expect. Wow, viewing yeah. from a from a uh, you know an outside perspective or just a ladder play or something like that. That was a four second faster Stargate coming in from stats. So that is <laughs> value, buddy. That's what we're talking about. I wish the viewers about. at home could Woo! see the face you just made when <laughs> four seconds. Oh man, you, you like, don't get that. You, you don't get like, that in your ladder games, man. You look like Salt Bay, like about to sprinkle. <laughs> about to sprinkle the steak right there. It was. Oh, that's man, the yeah. efficiency, man. That's what you need at the pro level, all right? Four seconds, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's four seconds earlier that that Oracle starts, four seconds earlier that it finishes, four seconds earlier it goes across the map, four seconds earlier the spore's not ready. That's, that's right. Time. I mean, if we go back to game number one, even dark in the main base to not have that spore crawler true. in time, it was really Very just true. stats taking kind of a inefficient and perhaps slightly unlucky route going through pretty much every single queen on his way <laughs> to the main base and not finding any that's damage. That's not the Protoss experience. I don't know what is, man. <laughs> And uh, it'll be three adepts as well. So first two shade gonna, or first two going to shade across the map, and that oracle, as Gemini pointed out, going to be popping significantly earlier than it otherwise would. And there's yes, no spores. Zero spores seconds. even on the production tab here. Oh yeah, what is going on here with Dark? Quite late. Just gonna try and play a queen only defense here. Very interesting. This could come back to bite him if he gets caught out of position. Yeah, I mean, the queen positioning still is going to be very important here. He's got them placed very nicely over in the natural. So Dark, knowing exactly what he's doing, he's not just making no spores just because he's a dummy. Yeah. He knows that he's going to be able to have his queens in position, but much better control here from stats this time. Gets mm -hmm. two on the way out, so not bad at all for him. And, I mean, still not bad for Dark either. So sure, you know, we hyped it up. We are like, oh my god, this Oracle's going to get 50 kills. But, you know, that's that's how it goes, essentially. It's just to get a nice little quick little thing here. They get a few extra drones whenever you can. The lane counterattack could be a little bit problem here because yeah, there's no battery ready. There's no battery, but there were only a handful of lings there on the bottom side. So the service area not going to be quite what Dark wants it to be as soon as those lings get cleaned up. And that's going to allow stats with just a couple of warpins to effectively trade out efficiently there on the third base. And... Dark behind all this, he's not droning too heavily just yet. Roach Warren is coming down. I'm wondering if he's going to get aggressive again. It, it does kind of feel that way. I want to see what the next round of units is coming out of the Zerg player. Yeah, it does okay. feel, yeah, I was going to say, it does feel a little weird with that Roach Warren coming down. It feels that something is on the cookbook here for Dark, and it is going to be walk. those queens yet again. It's a small map. Oceanborn is one of our smallest maps here. Oh. Luckily, oh, great scout here from stats to throw those adepts randomly in the middle of the map, something you don't normally even do in the first place either. Very on top of it for stats here. I really like that play. Gets a massive heads up. Is he making batteries behind this, though? Did, I, did we see any? No, he might actually oh, just, just be forfeiting the third oh, base, which surprises me because the I forge. Like that. Yeah, it's an interesting call. Actually, coming in right here, the Oracle is going to go straight for the score crawler. He will trade out one Oracle for this, but he will be able to deny mining there at the second base. And also the third base, there are no queens back at home, really. So I'm not sure how much I like that move now. I like it, actually, because Dark can't mine from the natural of third. He's true. effectively on a one base economy with 36 drones. And so Stats now forfeiting this third expansion. It's not the end of the world here. As long as you can hold on, the batteries and cannons are coming up here in the natural. That seven edit score inevitably will go down, I think. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that get remade in the main at some stage here. And stats with these oracles across the map. Look, he, he's just hovering over the natural expansion. Those queens, or those, those drones, excuse me, will get taken out eventually. Yeah, he did pull the queens back as well, knowing that the oracles were on the other side and saw that the third base was abandoned. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. This is actually a, a good play here. Nice force field, even able to trap one of these ravagers. Plenty of batteries to walk back to, so he's not under any threat from those Zerglings either. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it's it's an excellent strategy considering the fact that he knew he was going to sack the third in the first place. It, 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 it felt like for a second, like if he just puts the Oracles across the map, he's losing one to the Spore, all the energies are wasted. Maybe Dark is able to just kind of bust through anyway, and then that extra Oracle energy would have been really good on the defense. But 
using it to actually deny the uh, the economy for a little bit while Dark was already going all in, well, you know, semi all in, and dedicated pressure, as we like to call <laughs> from Zerg players. Uh, you know, it, it ended up being totally fine. And, and, and it, it at this point, though, now I really want to see how this continues because Dark didn't actually commit. That's a very smart play out of him, knowing exactly what stats is playing and knowing that, okay, if I commit here, it's going to be the end, and I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to come back home and see where this goes. It's kind of an awkward situation that we don't find ourselves in very much because Zerg, as you said, they did not really trade out their army. So not much of that early investment in military was lost there for the Zerg player. But on the other hand, they did lose mining from the natural and the third base for the better part of a minute, possibly even more. So it's kind of this funky situation where there was about a minute period where Dark on his two base economy effectively had double the income of the Zerg. But then when the Zerg pulls back, and Stats goes to retake the third base. It's suddenly a three-base economy versus a two-base economy for another minute. And from there, I feel like we almost equalize. If I if I came into this game right now and I saw, you know, 68 drones to 61 workers, three-base Protoss to, you know, a three-base Zerg taking a fourth, it looks relatively normal, except for, of course, the third Nexus not being quite done just yet. But <laughs> even the a third, holy moly, what's that cooking over here? Yeah. And oh, a Nidus network coming down for Dark again. So he's going to go right back to the aggression with Swarm Ooh. Host. And this is not Dark accidentally pressing the A button once when he <laughs> selects his Larva. This is actually a Swarm Host play here for Dark. But I, I'm wondering how much this is going to be able to get done. Because if I'm not mistaken, we still have two or at least yeah, three Oracles out on the map. Link Stalkers are you know, plentiful as well on the Zerg side of things. And Dark is really committing He's really committing to the Swarm Host. 12 Swarm Hosts in production. There isn't much other army on the field for Dark except for those two units he made at the start of the game. He's just now beginning Roach production. And there is potential for stats with these Oracles if they have high enough energy to pair that with Link Stalkers and actually take some favorable trades here against the Swarm Host. So let's see how this goes. Usually the first attack with the Swarm Host is going to be the most critical ones in terms of setting the tempo here. And we'll see if these Locusts can get a lot done. Those Forges and that Twilight Council are prime targets. Charge will get denied, potentially even plus two, unless the battery is overcharged, and no, it is not. That's a strong play out of Dark to get yeah. as your first Locust Wave. Sure, you really would love to get in and just kill, you know, 15 probes or one-shot the Nexus or something, but those are very critical upgrades here for stats. You really need those to continue and prolong yourself into the later stages of the game. And this is where it gets really annoying as the Protoss player, because sure, the first wave is done and you might kill that Nidus Worm, but then that's when the army is actually maxed as the Zerg player, and they are fully in your face with both the uh, both the Swarm Host Locusts and the Roach Ravager army. And this is when it becomes really difficult to know, how should I split off my army? How do I actually defend against this in the most efficient way? Yes, yeah, stats hearing the Nidus Worm, but not getting there just in time with the Oracle, so. Not getting any significant pickoffs right there. A little bit unfortunate as the fourth base will inevitably be tonight. Oh, actually, not even a cancel oh. there on that. So that is a painful loss. I like this little blink move through the middle of the map to try and cut off these, uh, you know, the Nidus's whenever you, he can. Just always blinking and, and finding the, the avenues. I love these single little DT run bys as well. This is an mm. excellent play out of stats to just continue to pull the aggression away and just give him time to get the Oracles on the map, get the Blink Stalkers on the map. Deny that the deny these Nidus is from getting up. Nice reaction there as well to be able to warp in to kill this one. So Stats is actually playing this fairly well. There's not been any super critical damage, I feel like, but Dark is still absolutely not done with this type of style at all. He's going to continue to go for it. He's getting the Lurker Tech transition behind it as well to make it so that way his army comes, becomes extremely difficult to actually take a good fight against. Yeah, and the standing ground army here for Stats, with the exception of Storm, is not very formidable. We have a handful of sentries, and actually Dark is going to try and pounce on this position. Good force fields to start things out. Files eventually will cancel those, as these stalkers have to get back to the shield batteries. The storms, these roaches, they are very badly bruised, but not that big of an engagement there. And even these locusts coming into the natural expansion, they aren't getting too much done. Yeah, the static defense and a couple of gateways, some pylons will be cleaned up, but... Oh, oh. another meaty storm there for stats, and... You know, this is one of the reasons why that army supply is a little bit disingenuous in terms of telling you what is going on in the game because Swarm Host, Roaches, Ravagers, these are not supply efficient units, especially the Swarm Host. When those Locusts are not being used in the straight up fight, if they're getting being danced around on, suddenly that is a ton of army supply that is just straight up not being used in fights 
at all. And that's why Stats here in the middle of the map is able to parry these attacks the way that he needs to to try and stabilize. And now we see him teching in and really rounding out the splash damage. He already has Storm with four Templar out on the map. Now he's adding in double Robo Colossus production as well. This is, yeah, I, I really like this from Stats. He's being so active with these Oracles. They're doing so well at actually killing off a lot of these Nidus Worms. And then wherever those are, uh, wherever those aren't, that's where his main army is. This is, again, a pretty, just not that great, all, honestly. Swarm yeah. host play from Dark. This one not really getting any kills. Kills like a battery or something. Like, this is not the value that you normally see with this type of strategy. And like you were saying before, an excellent point is that, again, yes, when you're looking at the supplies of this stra of this uh, type of style as well, you essentially have to remove like 20 to 30 supply from the actual maxed army because that's essentially all the dead weight of the swarm hosts there. And the rest of it is Roach Ravager, which is also not something that is we consider to be the most supply efficient oh. thing ever. But this is going to be an excellent position here for stats potentially as he's denying this swarm host. Could have been a lot worse there, but nice uh, reaction there from Dark. Good recovery by Dark, only losing, I think, one or two swarm hosts there. And that will open up a bit of a counterattack here at the fourth base. His stats has been struggling to mine from this base efficiently for a really long time now as more Locusts are going to come into the natural expansion. And I, I got to say, Stats, his army straight up beats Darks pretty hard right now. There are no Vipers on the field. The first Lurkers are entering the fray. And I mean, that is kind of the ultimate ground unit there for Zerg. That, that is how you solve the Protoss problem on the ground and force them to go into Sky Toss. So luckily for Dark, that tech is now coming online. But Stat sees it almost immediately upon moving out. And he still has those three oracles all very high on energy. Revelation is in the cards. Yeah, I mean, th I'm, I'm still just so surprised at how well Stats has been dealing with these Locust Waves. He's been extremely good at them, even just keeping the units as far off to the edge as possible. That plus three denial is actually quite good for Dark, and I really do like that. So that's going to be something that really helps him later on in this game as well. Going for a oh. big push now with the Lurkers onto this fourth base position. The Mothership has no anti-air to deal with, by the way. So that's free to continue to cloak. If we can kill off that Overseer as well as Stats, this could, this could be an excellent uh, engagement, just like that last game that we saw. But he's just going to go for it anyways. On top of everything, the Colossi are doing an excellent job from afar, even doing a counterattack at the same time to get inside the base. Is this oh, enough wow. for Stats? Yeah, the Oracles come back, clean up the rest of the Ravagers. A lot of drones go down there in that base for Dark and... Oh, I thought he was going to get a ridiculous little surround there, but not quite, not paying attention, I guess, with the Stalkers, unfortunately. But should, I'm, I'm, so, I'm curious about this fight because it seemed like for a second it was going to go really well and we were going to clear up everything with the, the Colossi and the Cloaking, but mm. then it seems like Stats' army supply just kind of dipped really heavily there for some reason. I, I think it's what, the fact that he doesn't have charge because he had about 12 zealots. Oh, that's zealots true. Or, I didn't even realize that. 12 yeah. or more zealots with their army, and if they were able to charge forward and mitigate the splash damage there on the Lurkers, then suddenly it becomes a lot easier problem for him, and it's actually those Swarm are just going <laughs> to piece right back out into the Nidus Swarm. So the Simpsons gif right there, yeah. like him walking into the bar and That's just turning right around. And actually, out I'm actually wondering if Charge ever got restarted, because I did not see it on the construction yeah, yeah. tab right then. I, I don't think that it just completed. I think he straight up doesn't have it. Oh, there's a stasis trap oh. on six lurkers. Couldn't capitalize on it. Yeah. It's so sad. Oh, oh that hurts. That, that could have been a huge pickup there for stats. And oh my goodness, this lurker count actually getting out of control right yeah. now. Splash damage on the Colossi is getting a lot done. He is able to pick off the forward lurkers, and the storm is quite good there on the hydras. But again, we don't have any vipers, I think, on the field here for dark. So the the real danger here for Protoss is when your units, your high tech units, start getting yoinked into the lurkers, and he doesn't have to deal with that just yet. But still, this lurker army is very formidable on the ground. That was a good storm on some of those lurkers on the side, but. The, the thing here as the Protoss player is that you we, we've been actually denied this fourth yeah. base for quite a while. So I was about to say, it feels like our late game switch, we got the scout off onto the Lurkers quite early, but it feels like we don't really have a uh, late game army yet. We don't have a lot of carriers. We finally have three coming out right now, but I think the uh, the gas income has been quite constrained here from, from stats. I like this move as well on the left side, killing off one of these bases is, is excellent. But losing this fourth base again, still not mining gas at that natural ever since one of those swarm host hits came in as well. Oh, He's catch. got very little gas income. Look at the difference as well on the bottom. It's 1,700 gas coming in for the Zerg per minute, where stats is barely going over 500. You need late game gas for this Protoss army to actually trade efficiently. This Lurker count can get really problematic. 
Yeah, there's no way he can really switch into Sky Toss, which is the answer to Lurkers here for stats. His economy simply can't support it. So he has to find some way to get a effectively miracle engagement on the ground if he wants to finally defeat this Zerg economy. But this is a really low eco game, kind of like game number one once we reach the mid game. It is 55 drones to 62 probes. Stats is effectively on one mining base because the natural the natural is half mined out. The third base is half mined out. The main is almost fully mined out. Another excellent stasis Ooh. trap there for stats. But very soon we will have Vipers joining the fray here for Dark. And if he is able to catch even a couple of these really high tech units for stats, they are not going to get replaced. As you said, Gemini, the gas income is pretty much non-existent. Those Colossi are dangerously far forward. I would not be surprised to see one Whoa. or two of them get abducted. And yeah, that's instantly taken out. Oh, Swarmos, what are you doing? Go ahead, do something. Okay, nice. Getting those lo locusts off there before they get jumped on. So that locust wave not doing too much, but it will distract the army at least and force uh, stats, or sorry, four stats away and get Dark on top of this Nexus. So if he can snipe this again, that would be so good for Dark. He absolutely needs to continue to constrain. Sick Viper uh, feedback right there. That's actually huge. Going to allow stats to really continue to cement this position. And the carriers now, even getting on top of some of these lurkers could be very good for him, but unfortunately the Nexus does get taken out. Dark getting a nice another move here. This is exactly what he needs to continue to constrain stats and force this gas income. To He just can't get enough gas to get this army going. Yeah, he's double expanding right now to the 12 o'clock and the 1 o'clock positions as Dark continues to creep forward here with the this lurker ball that is Hard to stop for stats. This is not your typical Lurker Ball on the ground. This is a 143 army supply Lurker Ball. And yes, nine of that is going to be with a Swarm Host right there as they are still trying to cause some He just got here. the gas back. No! Oh, that's true, yeah! No, he just finally remembered and it's gone again. Uh, oh, so sad. I mean, even if stats can somehow defeat the standing army for Dark, he has the Remax to deal with. Dark with almost five, oh, he got the maybe whole base. six. I mean, that base is pretty much almost completely yeah. wiped out. But yeah, the, the gas income getting needed. lost. Ugh, this it is, does yeah, hurt. This is brutal. So, I mean, Dark doing an excellent job, though. Like, let's let's not, you know, take it away from him at all. This has been an excellent maneuvering of this mid game. After the initial uh, attack being a little bit awkward with the, the, you know, the abandoned third base and all that, nice storms going off in this army, preventing Dark from getting past this line of sight blocker. A lot of those units are quite low, could easily get one tapped by some of these carriers if they eventually get on top of them. Nice Hydra positioning on the right side as well to force the army away. Dark always on top of this, splitting the opponent's army as much as possible in a way that you'd normally expect a Terran player almost to do it. He's doing it with Hydras and Lurkers. He's doing an extremely good job of, com look at this, uh, it's, that's his entire army just got pulled over to the right side. His entire army is in between all of the bases for stats. He needs to dislodge him from this position. Chark, he's sieging down the natural and the third base right now. And with stats' army completely on the right side, he's not gonna be able to get the surround that he needs unless he potentially recalls into the main base and tries to come back down. And and said he's going to go for the engagement. Good feedbacks on the first two Vipers. There is still one with almost full energy. Finding Cloud does get dropped right there. Time Work is going to try and slow everything down. The Cloaking Mothership does get taken down by the second abduction. Immortals coming in, finding some really nice connection on the Lurkers. But, I mean, the supply there, yes, it was a decent trade for stats, but his economy simply cannot support a Remax. He has barely more than 1,000 res in the bank right now. These Zealots are going to warp in get vaporized by the locusts and once dark finalizes this remax i think he is going to come in for the killing blow because he has basically been playing i mean you know you watch maru play a tbz it's like an exhaust game where like the zerg can only take half the map or one less base than half the map and he wins that way i feel like dark basically just played an exhaust tbz but he exhausted his opponent on four bases yeah he can never secure a fourth base for more than like a minute or two and his economy was basically completely shut down. Dark just had complete map control. And we're gonna go to a game number three. That was a brilliantly played game by Dark. Yeah, no, that was excellently done by him. Like you are saying, just completely suffocating. Stats in that game at that point, I mean, the, the decision earlier on to, to back away from the uh, from the natural, seeing that stats had pulled away and just said, okay, no, you're you're I'm just I see this coming, I'm not prepared, I will just hunker down to my nap and I'll try to send the oracles over to do counter damage. And he just pulls right back. He realizes, nope, I'm not gonna get any damage done. This is gonna be too difficult to get inside, and then just 
playing a very passive game, making sure that he gets all the right moves, and once he has his army, he pulls stats apart, denies all the gas income, and just lets himself slowly take that win, and just a very well played by Dark there. Stats with a masterful game number one, Dark fighting back with an equally beautiful game there in game number two, and now it's match point here in Group B, Dark versus Stats, winner of this game is going to the winner match. Almost considering just not doing it. I was about to say, should we do some? <laughs> should we just should we do some good old Casper chicken? See if anyone decides to introduce these players or not. Uh, did, we, did we even get a look at stats as base there? We went right to the natural. If you're like, God, they're this observer. Well, no, it's just because it's completely. Yeah, it's a yeah, different yeah. meta, right? I know. We're in the, yeah, a different meta of observing. It truly, yeah, it's it truly point. is. It truly is. And stats went for. I think that was the faster pylon. Fifteen pylon into uh, setting that probe across the map to get the hash block there. Very the nice natural event. expansion and uh, wow, I mean, really an exciting series thus far. Not I have what to I say. expected. Coming into today, I love stats. He has been one of my favorite Protoss players to watch for a very long time. But I gotta say, coming in, I thought he was going to get outclassed here. But in game number one, he played a really outstanding macro game after deflecting the opening attack there from Dark. And even in game number two, up against the ropes, a lesser Protoss would have fallen apart much earlier than he did. You know, the, the first Swarm Host volley got a lot done in terms of slowing down the tech there for stats. It got the Twilight Council, it got one of the two forges. Eventually, an assimilator went down, and the gas income there for stats was also squandered a little bit. But after that, Stats did a pretty good job of dealing with the Swarm Host and the Lurkers on the ground, especially considering how long it took him to actually get up to Carriers, because really, Sky Toss is the answer to Lurker Tech. If you're trying to play Protoss at the top level against a Lurker Tech Zerg like Stats was there for the majority of game number two, it's almost like playing with one hand tied behind your back, because <laughs> you, you don't have the toolkit that you really need to defuse a lot of these maneuvers, but he almost made it work. You know, there were some good engagements there from him, and if these first two games show what Stats is capable of this season, there is a world where he advances out of this group into the round of eight. Yeah, it's not something that I was expecting to see coming into today, but looking at these games he's playing, he's playing very well. Granted, PVZ is definitely the matchup, I think, where he finds the most success overall upon coming back. Uh, so against some of the other players, even, even though this is dark of all players, it's still, you know, it's it's probably one of his better shots to get a solid series win. Whereas, uh, you know, Classic, he's had a hard time for his Sam Bunny. Is, he's had a hard time for his Terran in general. And so, uh, you know, just the fact that we're seeing such good play out of stats in this game, though, it makes me hopeful. I'm really hopeful that he will actually be able to come back and show his uh, former form, and we, we've seen it so far in this series. So really excited to continue to see him throughout this day, but we are still in this match, so we have one more game left to go here. It's going to be yet another Oracle opener out of stats here. We'll see if this is able to get anything done, but I don't expect to get too much, really, because it's, you know, it's just the first Oracle. Oh, my God, but there's nothing in the, in the wall. Yeah. We just completely glossed over the fact that there's been a couple sneak around lings get sent across from Dark, and... Stats is not prepared at all for this. He's as literally as prepared as I was. And so now, unfortunately, we'll have to scramble to defend against this. Keeps the Oracle home to help de uh, deny these Lings. But now this will also allow those two Adepts to get into the other side of the map. Does Dark have enough Lings back at home? It looks like he does. So he will be able to deny them for now. But these two Adepts could still get a little annoying. I don't think we're going to find too much done. I really hope he cancels this shade. And yes, he does. But this is kind of a disaster for Stats already. And you might be looking at this and be like, okay, well, no probes really went down, a little bit of mining time lost. Is that really such a big deal? But the critical problem here for Stats is that he spent basically all of the opening energy on the Oracle to kill three Lings that never should have been in his main base to deal with. And in addition to that, Stats, his whole game plan has been revealed. And I mean, luckily for him, it's about as standard as it gets. Even these adepts are going to get caught here in the middle of the map. Oh. Oracles are going to try and come and save one of them at least, but... Oh. 
Shade completes? Actually, in the, let's see. He's in the natural there. So that might have been an accidental shade, but I mean, oh. it's actually going to get a drone. It and now it also <laughs> allows these oracles to hey. go to the third base. Hold up. Wait a second. We're getting six drone kills out of nowhere suddenly. Possibly more Whoa. if we still have no queens at this natural base. Scratch all that that we just said. Stats gets the best opener he's had all series. I'm kind of flabbergasted at how this one's shaken out. Dark finally here at game number three. The delayed spore crawlers finally caught up to him. And that's what happens if your queens are out of position. But that was just kind of such a wonky opening to start things out with the Lings getting in the base and then the first Adept getting caught in the middle of the map. And then it seems like even Dark lost track of exactly where that shade was. That left flipped on its head so fast. I've never seen something so crazy like that. That's so ridiculous. What an amazing early game out of stats. You very rarely see so many drones getting killed off and Lings as well in these early game PVZs. It's like, you know, it's, it's so it's so mapped out essentially at this point in, in the StarCraft's, uh, you know, longevity. It's like, yeah, okay, it's like the Reaper opener. They, they tussle a little bit. Maybe a drone dies. Like, ah, whatever. That was nine kills. It was solid. Now he's got three still with energy. He could still get more. Yeah. Solid opener. Yeah, that was fantastic. I almost feel like it was it was fate. <laughs> Those four <laughs> legs got into the main base. StarCraft just... gods are like, Stats is supposed to win today. <laughs> Quick, make Dark not realize where the Orm Adepts went. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, it is kind of funny the way that one shook out because, you know, stats, the, the one time that things go a little bit awry for him, and in the ensuing chaos, he's able to find much more damage than he was over the game one and game number two with what should have been very clean opening Oracle harassment. He's still ahead on workers, 63 to 57. What a nice spot to be in as a Protoss. It's so rare that you get that. Oh my god, such, such a great position. Oh wow, Stats actually already has the Templar Archives out. That's very quick. Two Templar are already in the third base. This is one of the fastest Templar Archives I have seen in a, a long time. Even, I want to say, before Blink. Oh, it's Storm as well. Wow. The fact that he's doing it with Blink is so interesting. Usually you might see that with a fast charge plus one to go for some Zealot Archon attack. I love going for that myself. It's a very fun style, but like... Doing it with Blink as well to get super fast Storm is very interesting. It's not maybe something you normally see is usually you favor just more gateways, more stalkers, and then against uh, eventually charge. And then you might get your later tech. Wow. Ooh, nice. Another two picks. I mean, these oracles have just been so valuable here for stats. One of them did go down at some point during there, but still getting so many drone kills. I think maybe 11 or 12 in total but at this point. As Dark, for the first time in the game, is at last passing stats in the worker count after fumbling the control early on. And you know, stats, if he is able to safely get it to four bases with those early Templar accumulating all of this energy and Psy Storm, that is a scary proposition here for Dark because stats is basically, he's paved his way through the stage of the game where he generally struggles the most, which is the early and mid game in the majority of his matchups in the current of his current skill set right now. I mean, we think back to game number one and even game number two in the mid and late game there, it felt like Stats was punching above his weight class with Dark in those late game scenarios. And if Dark can't do very much about this fourth base, it looks like he might be eventually gearing up for attack here on 80 drones with a lot of tech, including a bailing nest now coming in. I am liking Stats Prospects coming into this one. He's got two Forges pumping, charges underway as you were hinting at Gemini. Immediately starting after Blink, six Templar all very high on energy against a mostly lean composition here for his opponent. Things are looking very good for Stats. This is kind of interesting though, as the Zerg player, Dark is going for a very fast Hive with a Spire combined with it. He does go for Mutants. Okay, I was wondering huh. if he was gonna be going for some kind of like, super fast Broodlord attempt because he saw how fast like the Templar were out with Blink and like maybe there's just going to be a small army and I can just kind of pounce on it or something. I don't know. But the fact that it is Mutas is also, again, still very interesting. And an Ultralisk Cavern with it as well with Adrenal. Ooh. This is a wild strategy coming out of Dark. To go for Mutas in, at this time against Blink Stalk, a Blink Stalker opener with Storm as well. And it was also a Stargate opener, so it's not like this is like one of the Twilight into to like DT drop and blink things either, where mutas really do shine. This is a weirdly timed muta transition, and then to go immediately into Ultra Ling afterwards, this could be very interesting if it actually finds its mark. 
All right, well, Meteorlisks are going to come into the natural expansion now. No fun on Cannon's his stats is certainly going to be caught off guard by this. Oh, and the double Immortal gets canceled there on the Robos. He is reacting to the Mutas, oh. and that is actually huge. A Fleet Beacon immediately gets thrown down. That is potentially for Phoenix range, and Stats does not know how heavily Dark is committing. And let's put ourselves in Stats' shoes right now. He has only seen Ling Bailing. It's been very heavy on the Lings. He doesn't know where the gas has been going here for Dark, and so it's kind of a scary proposition. He might be thinking that there is going to be a swell of Mutalis coming in after this, and he's trying to play his hand as close to the vest as he possibly can, throwing down more cannons, more shield batteries, but the fact that he canceled those Immortals against what will soon be an Ultra Tech with a ton of Crackling Bane, oh, that is, that is, is scary. This is a really nice style coming out here for Dark. It's very important for Stats to pick up on this as soon as possible. I think he's already started to do so, like, because oh. we do have some Immortals already on the production tab. Nice defensive setup here for Stats. The Spanley mm -hmm. run by not doing anything just yet, but the Immortal production has resumed, and that's extremely important for Stats. I think he's finally, he's realized, like, okay, there's no extra Mutas coming in. It doesn't look like we're trying to go for any uh, extra harass with them, so he's picked up the pieces, realized that there's something else afoot here, and is starting to prepare for that next step. And so now it's on to Dark here to see what he can get done with this Ultra Transition. And I love that Stats uses that Fleet Beacon to build a Mothership now in this situation mm. because I actually really like the Mothership in this situation. There's no Vipers, there's yep, not a lot yep. of anti-air. You haven't committed a Sky Toss. Time Warp against Lings and Ultras like this with oh, yeah. some Roaches, especially Bane Lings too. That could be potentially one more tick of Storm every single time he throws it down, and that can vaporize the army that Dark has on the ground if the control is there for stats, and especially if he's able to catch Dark out of position. So in terms of army composition now, we have six Archons, five Immortals, still six High Templar, very high in energy. If stats doesn't get caught off guard, if he's able to take the engagement that he really wants, I love this for him. Yeah, this is actually a really nice setup. I like that the Mothership is here now to provide cloaking. Unfortunately, it wasn't in the right position, so it doesn't actually get the, the cloak denial uh, to save too many pros there, but not the biggest hit in terms of economy. This is a nice little snipe, though, getting off this fifth base with these Roaches. Roaches that will become very useless very quickly here in this huh. later stage of the game. So a nice little pickoff. The Muta's also just eventually finding their death is, you know, totally fine for Dark's POV. He just wants to get more Ultras, more of this late game army set up. But I feel like he still doesn't really have the correct army that he's looking for. Because sure, four Ultras with three about to spawn is very strong. But I don't think Stats is, is unprepared for this. That's a lot of Stalkers and a lot of Immortals. Stalkers are actually pretty decent against Ultras mm -hmm. if they can find uh, some hits onto them. But this is a pretty big misstep here. Lead, let, letting all these units just walk into the natural. Getting an Immortal for free here as well is pretty nice. This is going to pull Stats pretty out of position. but. And also a nice cancel on his fifth base. So this is a nice move for some units that are completely useless at this point for Dark. Yeah, this is Dark trying to optimize his army composition right now and get some good trades while he does it. And he accomplished that task. But I, I wonder, OK, it's going to be for Broodlords. Mm -hmm. So Dark behind all of this, I almost feel like he forgot that he went Mutas because he made a second spire. Oh, did he? <laughs> he made a second spire. And we still haven't seen you know him start up on. <laughs> Flyer attack one and flyer <laughs> or, and uh, and flyer carapace. So a little bit surprised by that. The Brood Lords are in production now. I was wondering where those corpses are gonna go. Oh, oh actually, God. a Nidus canal on the main base. Those are only two ultras. The second Nidus should be able to come through as well. There is not enough energy on that Nexus for a recall. More ultras coming in. Of course, they are able to deal with these stasis traps. They do not affect the ultras at all. Those ultras will eventually get cleaned up by this army, but. I'm wondering how much more Dark has to throw into the main base. We haven't gotten a look at there at the Nidus Canal. And really, there's nothing in it. So it's just this Immortal up against a couple of Ultras. Nothing else pivoting in. Eventually, there will be enough energy for recall. I think we're almost at that mark here in the main base. This is the, the most insane harassment attack I've ever what, seen. What is this? is so it's funny. two Mutas and two Ultras. This is like... <laughs> When it's like one of the attacks this? you would see on like a box art where yeah, it doesn't no, make yeah, any that, sense. It's this like, is yeah, a ultra. box art engage, right? A box art harass. That's what this is. Get the fleet beacon. What the? This is the best few ultras I've ever seen. How are they? <laughs> why are they in the main guys. base? 
What are these things doing here? They're getting more damage than any mass lurker or ling flood I've ever seen. Do you remember a couple of years ago, there was kind of this meta tactic that a lot of Protoss players would go in where they would have two Immortals and a Warp Prism and try and snipe like, oh, yeah, yeah, production yeah, yeah. buildings for the Zerg in the late game? Yeah, there it this is. is like, it's like the Zerg equivalent of that. Like, I'm going to knight us in their main base and put two Ultras and right-click the Templar Archives of the Fleet Beacon. <laughs> like, what are we seeing? They'll never expect it. But they won't have the, prepare, the prepared defenses. It is it. We're laughing, but it is a good play. There are 12 yeah. Ultras on the field right now, and Stats is a purely ground army. I don't even know if he has really caught wind of the Broodlord transition that is waiting in the wings for him because his anti-air is mostly Stalkers. And with Infestors soon to be entering the field, this fight could go poorly for him. Now, if, if Stats is able to get the Dream Engagement with a wide arc of Archons, with Storms on everything he needs them to be on, there is a world where he's able to win it straight up against the Broods, but unless he gets that engagement, and now he sees the army here for Dark, he's already bleeding a ton of Archons out. Kind of a slow response there to retreat from from Stats, and yes, he will be able to deal with this attack at the this oh. base, but not after losing 15 probes. Oh, an ultra oh. attack here. We missed this at the top left. 20 probes getting killed off in an instant. 25, it keeps going up. We're down to less than two base economy out of nowhere. And from stats, this is incredible play out of Dark, seeing everything out of position. The whole army was split off to try and attack over there from stats. The Bling Bane on the left, the Ultras on the right. Excellently done. That's a massive blow to stats' economy. There is a silver lining to this because Stats' army composition right now, he is not going into Tempest. He is not taking up to what he needs to deal with the Brood Lords. He's going to try and beat it on the ground. So the fact that he is going down to 50 workers, he might have a chance if his he's able to huge. get enough units. His army is massive right now. Look at now. that portal count. That's insane. You're going to put ultras into that? No shot. Yeah, there's no on the production tab. There's no, none even on the field at this point. No, I think you realize that there's so many Immortals and Stalkers. Ultras are going to be useless at this point. So many links, so many Bane links. Getting Infestors as well to lock down the Stalkers so they cannot link yeah. underneath the Broodlords is vital here for Dark. The Broodlord count is getting pretty... Uh, the Infestor count is also insane. It's at 11. It's Broodlordling Infestor, and these storms oh, are nice the to soften them up. Oh, the getting stuck! Oh my god, sure they get some pretty good storms in the back, but that's a lot of Templar to suddenly lose. There's no more on the field at this point. He does have 3,400 gas that's, there, Gemini. That is a bad... That is a great... <laughs> Isn't Protoss awesome? Oh, I love that <laughs> feeling. It's like, oh, you lose all your Templar? Like, oh, wow, I wasn't spending gas the whole game anyway. Sick, I can replace that. Uh, the, the thing is, I'm, I'm looking at this fight, and stats, he has incredible upgrades. He almost is 3-3-3, three, 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 which is phenomenal. But I can't remember the last time I had that in the game. There's so many. Oh, you remember the Templar archives? You can't warp them in. The oh, my God, it's died. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my God, he never he realized. It. He never remade it. And he, so he remaxed on other gateway units. Oh, oh. my God, that's actually huge. You, you can't, he can't feed back any of the investors. I mean, the storm, obviously, but that's a massive mistake to make. I mean, just a crazy chaotic game. It's just you don't normally have two <laughs> ultras killing your <laughs> Templar archives in your main base. But damn, that is a difficult thing to have happen there. Excellent movement by stats, regardless, though, to see uh, to see the the, uh, the sorry the hatches on the left and the right, and to be able to pick those off without any of the army next to them. So he's still making moves, still trying to find openings on the map wherever he can to still grind Dark down because his economy has been going pretty well at this point. But the bank is is I mean it's pretty big actually. I was gonna say it's not the biggest, but I was just looking at oh. the gas differential. But oh, this could no. be pretty big as well. Oh no, the Stalker is not realizing it. The Ruler is on the perfect high ground position. Immortals as well getting trapped. Ooh, this is getting a little bit rough here for Stats. Oh, he just used Recall too. He's gonna have to Recall with a Mothership. He wants to get those units out of That's there. That's actually a good play though. Is he gonna do He's, it? He, that draws there all the Ruler out of position though. Yeah. So the rest of the army is completely on the other side. This could be a pretty big moment for Stats. He needs to push the throttle here to get into this base because these Ruler's are gonna take forever to get back onto the other side of the map. Dark realizing this, just frantically sending lings across anywhere to hopefully deny stats or uh, distract him from getting over here. Investors coming in. I feel like we're not, we didn't get over here quite quick enough. The investors are now really starting to push this back and Stats doesn't realize, he doesn't know where the army is exactly. He can't fully commit there. A bit of a missed opportunity, I would say, from Stats. I feel like this base has to go down. It's such a missed opportunity not to kill it. Meanwhile, attacking here on the left side. If only those Oracles were tagging mm. the Broodlords, he would have had the complete information he needed to make that call and go for both those bases because, frankly, Dark should be down two hatcheries right now, not just one. But 
some really brilliant maneuvering right now. It's still a potent army for Dark. And we have to keep in mind that those Infestors, not only are they high energy, they also have Neural Parasite. And what does stats have a lot of? Immortals, and Immortals counter Stalkers. So that's really- They also really, counter themselves. <laughs> they also counter themselves. <laughs> but really, Stalkers are the only tool that stats has to deal with the Broods. If Dark can find an engagement where he can Neural Parasite even just a handful of the Immortals and just start shift-clicking down Fungal Stalkers, I mean, Stats' army is just going to get obliterated off the map. I feel like if we were to take Stats' army and Dark's army and put them like in a map editor with no terrain, there is a world where Stats can win it, but with all the choke points on this map... Nice and nice and back there. I don't know, man. Yeah. This is really scary. I don't think he's ever going to get the surround that he needs. And so he's doing the next best thing, which is to maneuver around the map with two groups of armies. These Immortals are going to surely focus fire down these Ultras and do their best to take good trades in. Not that bad, actually. If these Immortals survive, and yeah, three of them do, Dark needs to respond to this. And his Mineral Bank is getting very low. It's uh, been a slow grind. I. This is an awkward engagement. It's actually killing off the lanes. I thought those lanes were going to come and just deny those immortals completely and just, uh, you know, just completely kill them there. But ends up getting still some decent trades here. The lanes will eventually push this back. But I still feel like that was like a big army, though, from stats. I don't know if I, how much I like losing all those units. Two immortals as well is pretty big, considering the fact that uh, Dark was also starting to remake some of those ultras as well. It's very useful to have in the army. I'm, I'm just trying to look at this and realize what is the actual end game here for stats because he is completely negating, or just completely ignoring, I should say, any air transition. He's locked in on the ground. And at this point in the game, the longer that this goes, the more better it gets for Dark from his perspective. His army will always outscale a ground army better. And I mean, Sure, Stats is doing an excellent job of doing these split pushes here, completely taking Dark by surprise, you know, leaving units here, leaving units there. Massive Veiling run by coming over here. We'll actually get on top of these Stalkers and should help to clear so some of those out. What, what, where are they going? <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't connect on anything. They just walk by everything. That was a little funny, but we'll eventually connect onto those Stalkers, so pushes those back. And again, these are not really the, you know, you can't afford to lose all these units constantly as stats. His his mineral, mineral income is not that high. He doesn't have a huge bank. He's got a bunch of gas, but not that much minerals. Stalkers still cost a lot of minerals. And so this army needs to stay together, I think, for stats to actually get some big, pu uh, big punish because he doesn't have a late game transition. I feel like he's playing this the best way he possibly could, though, because yeah. you're right. He doesn't have a late game transition. He's doing the next best thing. He's saying, yeah, yeah. Dark, at this stage in the game, we have mined out so much of the map. If you want to expand, you need to expand to the top right corner. You need to expand to the bottom left corner. It's true. What can you not do? You cannot send Broodlords to both those locations because if I collapse on one of them, mm. you lose half your army, you lose the game. And so Stats is just using his superior mobility right now to basically play whack-a-mole with all these expansions that Dark is taking. He sees the Broods, he immediately bounces back. Yes, this base will go down, but there isn't too much. Losing the Archons could be painful, but look at the bottom of the map right now. We don't have a shot of it just yet on screen. Now we finally do. More expansions going down from Dark, and if Stats can continue to whittle down this army and trade out these units, oh, he's starting Stargates again. And the Fleet oh, wow. Beacon. He's gonna have three Stargate plus Fleet Beacon soon. Tempest are potentially in the cards, and if he's able to continue to minimize the economy here for Dark, eventually Dark will not have the anti-air, because right now he is none. He recognizes that Stats is not playing an air transition. He's playing a ground game. And if he spends the remaining bank that he has because his income is slowly diminishing on just trying to fight him on the ground and then suddenly we have five Tempest, Stats might win this game. I mean, it's really anybody's call. This is a huge scout, though, from Dark. That Nidus Worm and some of those Lings coming into the main base right as those Stargates finish is actually massive for him because he had Lurker transitions on the back end right there. He was about to finally s uh, switch into the full ground and be like, Stats, you're going for ground this entire time? All right, fine. I'm just going to make Lurkers end this once and for all. He was about ready to do that, and now he sees these Stargates, and now he's fully prepared for what might come, but still has to deal with this army. The Stargates aren't actually producing right now, so this army is still the thing that needs to get dealt with. And uh, for right now, without these Broodlords in position, you can't take that fight as Dark. Stats might be doing it, man. He just took down every single base in the bottom left corner. 
Dark is basically curling into a shell in the top right. And yes, stats can't attack into the broods, but Dark's mining, he has 134 gas per minute. <laughs> New world revelation! Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, that's 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 classic dark late game, man. Yeah. Just any little thing you can find, just like, oh, give me that. I'm gonna do that on you now. But Ooh. but look at the gas right now for dark. 236, that's increasing right by about 100 fast. a minute. Stats has a 5k gas bank. Recall gonna be coming in. He's oh, now attacking sick. the main base because he sees the broods in the middle of the map. He can take down this hatchery. And I don't know if the ground army here for dark is enough. It's not a very good connection. The Immortals are focused firing down. The Ultras, there is no ground support, no Lings. The Queens are low on energy, so Transfuse is few and far between. And even the Infestors got there a little bit too late. Look at those drones. Yeah, they're yeah, just happened to scout as well, the army down there. He's just like, oh my god, don't kill me, please. Don't have an Observer. Oh. These Stargates are still not being used, which is kind of crazy. I feel like after them, after they got scouted, I think Stats is now using that for to his advantage mm. and being like, oh, look at me, I got three Stargates. Just kidding, yeah. I'm not going to actually use them. I continue are, to go full on onto the ground here. Hydras are being trained now. And, you know, a play that we haven't yet seen by Stats at this stage, because the bottom left has been so wiped out, I mean, the Zerg have just been eliminated from that corner and actually hold that thought as Dark now finally is going to get on the offensive here with these Broods. It's a big pickoff. I don't think there is a recall available. I think their cooldown is maybe another 15 or 20 seconds left on the Nexus. So Stats instead going to be going for yet another counterattack there on the bottom left side. But to be honest with you, he can afford to lose these bases. Yes, it does suck to lose the map control and the static defense, but the mining pretty much non-existent there. And now finally we have Tempest coming out of the map. The anti-air for Dark is three Queens and one Hydra. And technically fungal. And technically fungal, but come on, it's like two Tempest. You're gonna, yeah, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna yeah, chain no. fungal two for Tempest. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, this is getting quite scary for Dark. He's losing Ultras and Lings on the back end. Look at his supply, it's suddenly dipping so low. He can only make Lings. He, he's basically out of gas, and now getting the Tempest on top of all the Brood Lords. What, uh, what do you do at this point from Dark? This is extremely well done from Stats. This, this late game masterclass, essentially, of pulling apart a Zerg, Better than I think I've seen anyone do. Stats economy, his tech got reset. He was forced into this ground composition, and he has played the most miraculous positional game. He's even recalling the Tempest oh. with the Mothership, <laughs> and he's gonna have a recall the Nexus back at home very soon. All the tech is gonna get wiped out here for Dark. Not even that he can use it, though. He's making six Corruptors right now, but the Gas Head come is only just now coming back online. Dark is, Dark might be dead. I mean, what you see is what you get in terms of his army, and his army has almost no anti-air. Oh, he's even gonna get the Spires. Yeah, both Spires gonna get taken down right now. The Hive is gonna fall as well. Six Corruptors. There is not a world. Six Corruptors are gonna defend against this. He needs those Corruptors to kill these Tempests. If that doesn't happen, these Broodlords are just going to, they're, they're gonna evaporate. They're going to slowly die. The Stalkers are gonna be able to blink on, on top of them as well. He's lost everything on the bottom side of the map. He's turtling up in this tiny right side corner. All he has are these Broodlords. If these Broodlords cannot survive, the game ends. This is a massive play, though, to get this. This is going to force his recall. Could get on top of those Stargates. would be very nice, but the recall is solid. That's a very good recall. It's a big cooldown to use, though, so that's going to be out of, out of the cards for a little bit here. But it does buy Dark Time. That's, a bench, that's about what he wanted there. But it buys him time for what? He doesn't have a hive. He's going to have to restart his lair, which I'm sure he's done already. But he has lost most of his production. He can really only make Hydras right now. And Hydras on their own without Vipers, not very good in these situations. And even the Corruptors, should the Tempest count get high enough, eventually those will get one or two shot. And even the Queen count right now is so low. I love this cloaking coming in. Of course, Fungal is going to be able to reveal these units. This is a He also engage. can't lift them up here. Uh, this is losing a little bit much here for stats. I mean, luckily that though? cloak comes in. I mean, he has 3-3-3 three, three, three right now on the ground. Yeah. So those Archons are tankier than you might expect. And I think from this position with Revelation, again, with no Vipers to be found, only two Queens for Transfusion, I feel like stats can just start chipping away at this. And what's even more problematic than that for Dark is that he has lost effectively all mobility. He has no minerals, he has no gas, he's making some lings, but the counterattack is not gonna be enough. 
Stats almost has free reign to start macroing down here in the bottom left. Now, some links are going to try and stop that because Dark does have it on his radar that this is an issue he needs to deal with at some point. But I feel like we're starting to see him really bleed out here. And I have to say that Stats in this series is using Recall better than I think almost any Protoss player I have seen in the past couple of years. Oh, yeah. It's been absolutely incredible. Like, And it's because he's going the Mothership every single game. Yeah. And we were kind of making fun of no, it from at first in the beginning. These the Motherships first, have become so clutch at this point. The first three were terrible, and then like the five he made yeah. after that have been <laughs> all so good. Yeah, it's insane. Oh my god. I mean, this is just so good from Stats. This is such an amazing way to play this late game. It's it, You don't see this. You don't see this type of style being played in this late game. It goes around the side as well now to take out this position. That's one of the only bases left for, uh, for Dark. Dark brings his army to the bottom left to be able to deny this. This is the only mining base, though, for... Oh, no, he does still have a little bit more at that uh, vertical Ooh. third base there. Yikes. Oh, that's a bit of a miss rally. And, oh, that's a bit... Okay, there's nothing really to capitalize on good it, thing, so... Good thing you have plus three shields, buddy. Yeah, good thing there's only six Corruptors on the field as well. So, unfortunately, they try to get brought over, but they just get zapped away by those Stalkers and Tempest. I mean, this is getting really difficult for Dark here. He only has a few Infestors as well. A sick... Fungal on top of literally the whole army, but you have nothing to capitalize on. Look at the Brewlords try to get close. There's a cloak and a bunch of Tempest right there. They can't oh even retreat. Goodness. He can't get away. All of the Brewlords are the only thing he needs to stay alive, and he can't keep them alive. I mean, this is once again stats identifying all the Hydras are the bottom left. He blinks forward. Tempest are focusing down every single Brewlord. The Brewlord count is down to two, and now the ground army here for stats. Seems insurmountable. He has a 5k bank in his main base. Dark is doing everything he can on the other side of the map to try and get stats under control, but I simply don't think he can beat this army. The force, a force field. field at 30 minutes in the game is keeping his natural alive. What when do you ever see that? Thankfully the Ultra is able to break it, but still that gives him some time to bring these Tempests back to relocate. Get the recall off. He's not gonna wow. lose the base. The storms off everything stats with the greatest BBC we've seen in the last year. I, I'm almost speechless. That was unbelievable late game from stats. That is the stats we have been missing for years. That is classic macro stats, an unbelievable series. I think by far the best series so far this season as stats beats Dark in the late game. Game one and game three, put up a hell of a fight in game two. Look at him, he's exhausted. Wow, what a series. What a ridiculous, I mean, d deserved, man. What an insane series. Absolutely incredible. I, I just, look at, Dark is just like, what did I just play? Like, what What was this game? Like, an absolutely ridiculous series. Who plays late game like that? Just splitting all over the map. Recalls everywhere. Mothership's actually getting such strong value throughout the whole game. Not. I, I was almost criticizing him for, for a little bit there to not like go for some huge push, but I mean, just unbelievably done there. Guys, we're gonna go to a break. When we get back, Group B match two, Classic First Bunny. We'll see you in a minute.
Welcome back, everybody. What a banger of a match. Stats versus Dark was, if, if you're just tuning in or if you're watching the bot and you skip the first match, you're like, oh, it's Dark versus Stats. I mean, what, what, how possibly, how good could it possibly be? Go back and watch it because that might be the best GSL series we get this year. That was phenomenal play from Stats and going up against one of the best Zergs in the world, in my opinion, the best Korean Zerg by a long shot. I mean, what an underdog yeah. story. It was beautiful play. You we could talk about that series for, for so long. Like, that was just <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. We were talking like, about it the entire no, frame. Yeah, it's like, there's, wow. I don't know. I, I, just go back and watch it, if yeah. you did not. It's just, it was an incredible if, series. If you already watched it, go back and watch Do it, it again. again. <laughs> yes, relive it right now. Just kidding, no. Uh, Classic versus Bunny is going to be our next match here. Going into a PDT. <laughs> Bunny. Please buff Terran. I love it. <laughs> I mean, this also has a chance to be a really good PBT. You know, on paper, I think I give Bunny a little bit of an edge here just because he's been quietly so consistent and so good. And TVP has been one of his better matchups, although I do kind of think of him as more of a well-rounded Terran as opposed to Kira, who, I mean, I just have that guy locked into my mind as just the TVP killer, <laughs> right? But classic. He has been showing some pretty good form recently, I must say. It was kind of a surprise that he didn't qualify for IEM. I was so surprised He got surprised so that. close. He got one map win away playing on the European server, and I can't imagine how much ping he had and when he had to play that one. Yeah. He ended up losing to Scalus, but like American was... server, Korean server, European server, he played all the qualifiers, wasn't quite able to do it, but let me tell you, this guy is really good. I think he's going to have a stellar year. 
Let's see what we got in store for us. Classic versus Bunny here. Group B, match two. Bottom left, the blue Protoss player classic. And then the camera does like turn and zooms in. It looks very <laughs> professional. And in the bottom right, it's Bunny. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so sad. You gotta flip, flip the sign. I can't read it. Oh I can't my read God. the sign. What? What do you? Come on. What, what does it say? It's, it's a face shield. I want to know. <laughs> it's Show a, it to me. <laughs> it's a face shield. Wow. I'm so curious actually now. Wow. Aha. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. I don't know who those people are. Yeah, so many people coming down to the studio. I always love having a live audience. It was really a sad time during the pandemic. And that one season where me and Tasis were kind of like in a, I don't even know what I would call it. We're just like in a chamber separated from all society <laughs> with like a green screen. <laughs> that room was so small that we were locked into. Oh my God. <laughs> we just I remember, show up I remember that. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to black it out of my mind, You're but just it in is a locker in the dungeon of the Afrika <laughs> Studio. Basically, but it is so good to be back here and have a live audience. Thank you guys for coming down to the studio. Yeah, I mean, this game specifically that we're going into as well, though, is hopefully going to be better than. I mean, if it's better than the last one, then that's just like insane. But it's gonna be if a it good even day. matches it, then you know I'll take that. That's totally fine. But. Uh, Bunny here on the bottom is actually going to go for a bit of a cheeky opener here. He yeah. went for a one base wall off, so he's completely denied the scout into the main there with that double depot. And mm -hmm. he's going for a Reaper and a factory behind it as well. Most likely we'll be seeing some kind of Hellion Reaper strategy, but it also could be some Widow Mines very early on. And potentially if he's super based, he might even go for cloaked Widow Mines off of one base. For a second, that could be extremely lethal. <laughs> for a second, I thought you were going to say, if he's based, he'll go for Cyclones. And I'm like, Gemini, I don't want to cast <laughs> with you anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, I said based as a way to describe Cloak Mind Drops. And I you know, I, I already want to regret or just you know, take back everything I said. And it could be fun. Everything I, and all things Protoss right now is, is, is like. I'm trying to remember, but I think it might have actually been Bunny on Ocean. I could be totally off base with this, but it might have been Bunny on Oceanborn in a previous GLSL season that went for really fast Cloaked Widow Mind Drops into battle cruisers or something like that in oh. the TVP. I'm pretty sure that was a build. Oh. This could just be a fever dream that I had a couple of nights that's ago. Just, when that's I just your average day on ladder <laughs> that you just thought was a real game. <laughs> uh, but no, it will just be a cyclone opener here for Bunny. Is this adept coming in actually finding some good value? Is able to get the SCP, but unfortunately the follow up shade not going to be there in time. So he's going to get the best possible trade he can against a cyclone to pick off one more SCP. And actually, I missed this on the production tab. It's a Phoenix opening here for Classic, and that is an interesting choice here for me. Now, for a long time, Phoenix was one of those viable openers that you would go to if you saw the Terran base, the Terran go for the really fast wall off there, the main base expansion, because it almost always telegraphs a two gas opening with a late expansion. And Phoenix, generally good against everything they're going to throw at you. If they have Cyclones, at least pre patch you'll be able to, you know, pick them up with a Graviton Beam, get some damage done. If they go in with a drop, you could, of course, lift the Widow Mines. You can kill the Medivac. Kind of a really good all-around unit to dealing with that. But since the change with a patch, you don't see Phoenix as a response to Cyclones quite as much anymore because they just pack so much more firepower. Is kind of a, a standard battle unit in the early game, especially before you get Immortals out, before you have Stalkers with Blink that are really able to maneuver across the map. So Classic going a little bit old school here with this opening. and. Thus far, it's been working quite well. Bunny really doesn't have the kind of setup back at home to deal with it. And a really fast Robo Bay too, even before the third base here for Classic. Yeah, he actually does like to go for this. It's it's He's like one of the only Protosses, I feel, that actually goes for Phoenix Colossus very regularly. Even all, I looked at the, the qualifier games as well that he was playing leading into this. Uh, he played against Maru and did it both games against Maru in the qualifiers for GSL. So he actually loves going for Phoenix Colossus, but you know, like you said, it's it's kind of strange because it's been kind of phased out essentially. Most of the European Protosses and, and whatnot are really favoring the blink openers and whatnot, but he really just loves, absolutely loves going for Phoenix Colossus on essentially any map. And I mean, it's it shows 
pretty decent success for him at times, but at other times it feels like it's just, you know, maybe there's a reason why no one else is going for this <laughs> strategy. But, I mean, let's see what, where it goes in this game. It's, it's still, you know, very early. Not much has happened yet. We haven't seen any crazy engages, no super early aggression or anything. So the Phoenix will still be pretty decent to be able to deny any sort of early harassment. What medevacs getting uh, thrown across can easily get picked off and stuff like that. But we just haven't really seen that much from Bunny. He's been playing very passive. Uh, so it's going to be really a mid-game focused game this this time. Yeah, and for Bunny, with no thir third command center just yet, he is absolutely gearing up for a timing attack. And I'm wondering whether he's going to try and queue this one up with plus one infantry weapons. I think this drop might barely get there once it's finishing. Might be just a hair early as he is now boosting across the map. And with only a handful of Phoenixes out on the map, it's not too scary here for Bunny, and he actually is going to be catching this move out with the Phoenixes. Of course, Phoenix is an excellent unit for scouting as well if you are able to keep them alive and not fly them over the Marines like I often very want to do. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Classic realizes that there's no medevacs here with this push out. Mm. I think that should be a pretty big key in the fact that there should be something else on the map. Realizes it now, brings the Phoenixes back with a Stalker Warp in as well, but not quite in time to be able to get all the units from unloading. Does pick up one of those Widow Mines, which is pretty decent. And now with these units getting warped in here, should be able to help shave off some of these Marines and will push this back. Uh, it loses, I think, a Phoenix and a half. We're gonna lose maybe the second one on the back end here. So forced to recall as well onto the third base. A bit of a scrappy situation as Bunny now punishes from the bottom side with this other reinforcement. But these Colossi are still very strong. They can deal a lot of damage to these low Marine counts. They have basically no cover for them, so some probes getting pulled there. And this is really a bare bones defense here for Classic. He has oh. the Immortal to deal with the Marauders, but they're sprinting forward regardless. Both Colossi get taken down. That Immortal has almost no HP. And this is one of the cruxes of going for this build here, as Classic is. He has, I think, only two gateways. There's very little support for these high tech units, and unless the engagement that he gets is basically by the book a miracle engagement. It's going to be a really tough situation because Bunny, especially with these low unit counts, he can absolutely nullify some of the splash damage here with some good splitting. Phoenix is going to lift up one Marauder and one Cyclone, taking a substantial amount of DPS away from this army, but with no shield battery, those Marauders are going to get another Colossus. And I don't know if Plasic is going to be able to stabilize. He has two Stalkers and one Phoenix. The shield battery only just now completing. I think this third base is going to be forfeit, and unless we have at least the Colossus is about to pop, and yes, it finally does. I mean, that's the only attacking unit he has right now besides these two Stalkers that just warped in. Yeah, this is uh, a slow and steady burner here for Classic. I mean, losing all of the probes at this third base as well. The one thing that was going for him was that he had an incredible 60, uh, 60 probe economy behind all this, but now also losing that, trying to get on top of some of these units, but you're stepping so far forward as the Protoss are trying to defend this third base with no battery support, nothing there. Bunny takes a very swift first game in this series. Yeah, and I, I feel like Classic had all of the tools at his disposal to hold on to that. But I love how you caught. You were wondering if he noticed that there weren't any medevacs with the army. And I, I feel like if he had known, if he had caught that a little bit earlier, if he identified there weren't any medevacs, then suddenly he has a chance to actually intercept in the main base. But when you have two gateways, you don't really have the main advantage you have as Protoss, you know, warp gate as a mechanic, being able to warp in a handful of units in the main to actually stop a dropship like that. And Bunny hitting even before plus one finishes was able to get so much damage done and it just snowballed from there so hard. If you're going to run that kind of composition as classic, you have to have basically a perfect engagement and he did not get it. Yeah, and it's just also the problem with this strategy on some of these maps. Classic's been running it on so many different maps. These maps are small. It's very right. easy to suddenly get punished out of nowhere. And that is what we kind of just saw that game. These are, it was a very swift attack. He got out of position once and that was it. Can he do it in game number two? Will it be the same strategy? Let's find out. I wonder whether Classic is going to go for the same opening here against Bunny because here in Solaris, you know, it does. It is a little bit of a bigger map, but you have those high 
high speed, I don't even know what to call it, the speed zones speed in the zones. center of the map. And that can what? be a little bit tricky. It's what, what, what did Tezos used to call them? The, the Wubulas or something like that? What, what did he call them? <laughs> did he call them that with no, me? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it was like a while ago, like when they first got introduced. Like there was something like that. They were like the, I don't know, some some weird word. <laughs> that just doesn't it's Tezos, I don't know, man. Go through the Wubulas. I think that's when they were the slow zone still. I don't know if they ever came up with the name for the speed yeah, zone. Slow zone, I, I could see that being a Wubula. Yeah. What's a speed zone then? I'm not even gonna go down that road, man. I'm not as <laughs> I'm not as quick on my feet as tasteless road poses would be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, classic here. Getting ready to throw down that nexus quite soon. Seven eight score four first. I, I like that he sent that probe down to the natural expansion just to check for anything hairy Bunny might be throwing at him. You can see a little bit of paranoia right there in terms of preparation because Bunny, Bunny, there's a reason why. You know, over the past couple of years, he is consistently making it to the top eight, to the top fours of GSLs you know, seemingly every single year because he is not just a well-rounded player, but kind of still in Amaru, he is very good at preparing for a best of X series. I mean, he has a wide range of builds he can throw at you. He is not afraid to whip out the cheese when he needs to. Oh, yeah. And as a player like Classic, especially after losing map number one, you really have to be quick with your, your scouting you have to be fast thinking if you are going to go up against that kind of thing. So a little bit of proactivity there for the Protoss player trying to catch wind of any cheekiness the Terran might throw at him. But as it is right now, Bunny opening with a relatively standard. Whoa, scratch but that. But greedy opening. <laughs> oh, fast 3cc coming out. Dang. Off of Marines as well, so not even a Reaper to get a scout off. So he's just going full on onto this. And a fast Robo from Classic as well. This is absolutely not the interaction that I was expecting to see. There's plenty of different things that this could go into. It could be Colossus Drop, it could be uh, Disruptor Drop, it could be some kind of weird like Warp Prism Immortal Push or something like that just completely busts open a fast expand. Like if you go for three CC like this, you, I can see a world where he just randomly makes a Warp Prism and just floats units into the main and then suddenly is able to do a lot of damage. This is a, a pretty wacky way to open this game. I'm really curious what exactly the plan is for Classic here. Because if this is also going to be, oh my, what? I think it's a just... A Stargate afterwards? I think it might be just another way of He's getting... He's just doing Phoenix Colossus, but the opposite way. So Colossus Phoenix. Yeah, Colossus <laughs> Phoenix. <laughs> what in the world is oh, this? Oh, actually, I'm looking at this now. He's getting an observer out. So one of the issues, if you go for the Stargate first, as opposed to mm. the robotics facility, is you're pumping out the Phoenix, yep. and as soon as the Robo is done, you immediately need the Robo Bay. You immediately need to start Colossus production. And you don't really have any window with that Robo to actually get Observers out onto the field, really. And so I'm wondering whether this is a way for Classic to get one, maybe two Observers out before the Robo is really about to go into its you know, absolutely optimal production timings where it's either making Colossus or Disruptors. Yeah, it's, so, like, it's just getting this Observer out really fast, too. Right across the map, we'll be able to get a scout off very early comparatively than what you would normally do. And yeah. it also allows you to then keep the Phoenixes at home, because sometimes if you go for the Phoenix opener, you might feel tempted to throw the first one across as a scout to see what's happening. That's another mm -hmm. way you can play it. But doing it now with an Observer allows you to keep the Phoenixes back at home and allow it to be... Uh, it, it punishes the, the, the Terran if they don't realize that and just throw a meta back at you. Also being able to see this... Like, he's going to probably see this Observer, is Bunny. And so now he's looking at this, scans it, kills it. He's like, whoa, whoa, my opponent went Robo first? That's strange. Definitely yeah. doesn't have a Stargate-producing Phoenix behind this. There's no way, right? But he does, and that's something that is just not standard. You don't normally go Robo into Stargate. That's just not how it's usually done. Yeah, it's an interesting little mix-up right there, but I, I have to say for Classic, from his perspective, it might be one of those moments where you scout the opponent's base with the Observer and your stomach drops a yeah, little bit because... Yeah. Observers are not the fastest unit. You get them after the robotics. It's not something that's going to, you know, pump out like a Phoenix and you chrono it cross map, but then suddenly you immediately get the scout off. And so he realized this was 3cc once the 3cc was basically done and pumping SCBs. Right? So. Did he see the third CC? He, he did see that? it, yes. Okay. So it, was, it was revealed to him. Okay, that's fair. It was revealed, but at the same time, there isn't much of an opportunity here for Classic to capitalize unless he goes really high octane aggression, which he might do with these pylons getting thrown across the map. But if you're just trying to macro out of this as Protoss, then suddenly you're in this scary position where, you know, if you're going to play defensively on three bases, then you know that Terran is going to have a massive amount of bio 
and a really clutch timing attack should they go for it. So Classic instead going to be doing the opposite. Warps in a couple of sentries, continuing Colossus, Colossus production, has that Thermal Lance. And he's going to try and delay this third command center from landing at the third for as long as possible, even dropping a pylon where oh. it would land. It does block it. There's another one down here. Does he? Oh my god, he, he oh. went between both of Oh, but there's a third. How many pylons are there on the map? Oh my god, he really wants to see where this is. Look at him. He's trying to dance between all of them, and he actually gets in between all three. Imagine that. You put three pylons in the bottom of the map to try and scout a drop, and he dodges all three of them. That's not a huge investment, but stats actually. Re er, sorry, classic. <laughs> not wrong for us, player. Classic realizes that that unit, the army is gone, will actually jump on these units. This is very risky for Bunny. Oh. His army is not large, and this is a really random attack. For Classic, given the fact that he did scout that third CC is why he is here in the first place. But this is super risky here for Bunny. The double drop now getting into the natural, but there should be a recall ready, an instant recall as well from Classic. So this will get shut down. Will he be able to get a Colossus before it's able to get to the battery? Yeah. Yes, so that's a pretty good pick for Bunny, but is he gonna suicide all the units for that? He has to, there's two Phoenix here, so everything will get traded out. Bunny actually, Interestingly, focusing down the probes there, is able to get eight worker kills in total, so only a marginal lead here for Classic after all is said and done. And I think the, uh, the attack is just going to resume yet again. Classic is once again using that warp prism, or the, the pylon, excuse me, to start warping in Zealots on the other side of the map, and he wants to levy more pressure here on this third base, but this is not an all-in. Twilight Council and Forge getting built behind this. Surely more upgrades will be coming in here shortly for the Protoss player, but at this stage in the game, of course, no blink does just have to eat this shot right there. Oh. That was a pretty good one, but I mean, this is like, this is a, such a strange attack here from Classic. Force mm. field's also kind of wild there. Doesn't actually get anything. Kind of a waste Ooh. of energy. Forcing himself through the speed zone. Now getting a little bit surrounded almost. Like yeah. the bio unit's getting a sick concave all of a sudden, but the Colossi untouched as there's the Vikings focused onto the Phoenix here. But the bio unit's still trying to trade out versus the ground units of the Protoss. But Somehow, it seems like Protoss is actually managing to win this fight. It looked super scrappy, and without a Warp Prism here to reinforce, I'm actually surprised that he was able to just push on through here. Now this is getting really awkward for Bunny to defend, forced to gimp, keep his SCDs away. Might even have to just lift off this CC as well. Hey, he only has a handful of bio units right now as he's trying to get the Viking count high enough to start pushing away these Colossi, but Command Center will get lifted. Oh, the SED is oh. getting pulled. Those Colossi just absolutely melting them. Gets both Widow Mines too. Viking maybe a little bit too far forward. Stalker's going for it. Oh, one hit away. They do not take it out as four more Zealots come to reinforce. And this bio is so low, Gemini. There's no medevac energy. They've all used all of their energy. These two Vikings are also pretty low. One more Phoenix coming in to help against the, but the, a couple more Vikings on the reinforcements here. With no Prism, they'll be able to juggle these Colossi. They are extremely exposed once the, the other gateway units start to die off. And now, Bunny can punch. They're, there's a uh, uh, chase. I don't know what, punch? They can punch the Colossus out of the sky, apparently. I don't know. They can, uh, yeah, I don't know, take those out. So yeah. Total scrappy fight. I'm not sure what was even going on there. there was a what, what, oh, that was a medevac or something. I was like, what the hell? Yeah, really yeah. a chaotic engagement there. It's hard I, to call. I, I mean, feel like Protoss is totally fine afterwards as well. Absolutely. I don't think that Classic minds losing the Colossus count because he is completely resetting the starport time and a lot of the bio here for Bunny. Unless he has, you know, an absolutely dismal engagement coming in, which I don't think is possible with one century with this army. This is a relatively tight choke point right here. He can continue to push forward, and as you noted earlier, Gemini, there is no medevac energy, basically. The next stim, all these units will all get healed up, and there's only one starport. It's only making Vikings, so there aren't more medevacs in the card here as SCPs get pulled once again, and charge is actually done. Plus one ground weapon's about to complete as well. Stalkers are getting on top of the Vikings there. Two more of them are going to fall just barely, and the bio stimming forward might have just enough with a good split to take down this army as zealots are warping in but there's very little healing coming out from the Metamax. This damage is almost permanent damage. There's no sustain here for the bio. Bunny has to start microwing backwards, and I feel like Classic is getting so close to just breaking the Terran here. These 
fights are so scrappy and Classic is able to pull it out. What a wacky game this was. Yeah. Not something you normally see with this style to begin with. It's so rare that you're actually the aggressor with the Phoenix Colossus army. You're almost always the defender in these in mid games here versus Terran. So to be on the map the entire time, of course it lends it, the reason why was because of that fast third CC and that's what kind of kickstarted all of this. But the fact that Classic, even after that drop forced him to recall, went right back across and continued to just, con just pile on the aggression. Even without a prism, he was using slow warpins from one of those pylons and he was not even thinking about making a prism. He kept rallying Colossus across the map. It's such a weird way to play it, but it ends up, ends up working I, I don't know, this was a very strange uh, style out of Classic, but I mean, gets the win, very solid. It was almost a hero-esque timing attack. If, if yeah, we were playing yeah, a yeah. hidden cup and we didn't no, know the player's he, names, I'd be no, like, yeah, that, that's, that's hero. 100% <laughs> that's hero. I would lose so much money on that bet, it would be unreal. <laughs> All but your no, channel points. Yeah, no shot that is not hero in that game. But that was just such a scrappy game. It was oh, so weird, but third game it's going to be here, tying it up here. Very nicely done by Classic. All Let's right, see classic. what he does, has to go for this one. My turn. <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> It is fun casting for with the first time with a new person. Oh yeah. You know, because I do know you out of out of the game and out of casting, yeah, but yeah. Trying to get that chemistry right, <laughs> like, trying to get the, ca <laughs> the, the the cadence of your your co-caster right yeah. off the get-go, it could be a little bit tricky. It's like, no, I want to talk now. No, you, no, you, you can talk now. <laughs> just become Canadian all of a sudden. It's like, no, you, you can you can talk now, Dave. If you want to, go ahead. I just have so much to say about that previous game. Tasteless, you're missing out. He so really true. is. He man. chose the worst series, the worst day to miss out on. Yeah, this is how we're over having fun over in wherever land he is. He's just chilling. We're watching the sickest games you've ever seen. Yeah, these are really good matches. Watch, watch Tasteless come back for Group C and Gumi Home Beyond just absolutely dumpster like your yeah. creator. Just <laughs> like, a bunch of two raxes <laughs> and just the, 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 the day is over in an hour and a half and it's like, wow, that's just like literally the quickest GSL day of all 14 years of history. Like, oh my God. <laughs> wow, thank God I came back to this day of StarCraft. Oh uh, my God. I mean, the games really have been stellar so far here. And this is only the second series of the night. It feels like we've been casting for a minute because oh, I know. I was <laughs> Dark versus stats went so long and the games were so epic but really just a fantastic treat. And Classic, I love the way that he adapted there in game number two. And I feel like it could, it was almost a by-the-book game-winning play because in that kind of situation, there is money. I mean, when I'm playing PBT, I obviously don't play the level of these guys, but I do play at a relatively high level. When I'm playing, oftentimes, the one unit that I'm thinking in my mind is the Starport units. It's the Medivacs, it's the Vikings because Bio, if they don't have Medivacs to support, you can trade really well with Bio. Those stims add up very quickly. And so Classic, when he went for engagements like that one, where he would just rally Colossus across the map, continue the attack pretty much no matter what, even when at one point his army was like three stalkers and a Colossus, it felt like. I, I was so sure he was overcommitting. Like, but you... he wasn't because he knew his opponent had to make Vikings in that position to deal with the Colossus, and there were like three medevacs all very low on energy. And as long as you keep engagement, engaging, they're never gonna be able to heal the second stim. If you can prolong the fight until that second stim, then suddenly a situation where it looks like Bunny might actually have the edge if he can get a concave and come in for the fight, those Marines are getting one or two shot by the Colossus because they're at half HP. So really just a beautiful textbook Timing attack there by Classic is just a good read on the game as yeah. well. Just be able to make that decision. Because if you do overstep that just a little bit, which it looked like he might, that can swing on you super hard as a Protoss player. So that was just a really good understanding of just where that awkward game really was at. So very good by Classic. In this game three, he's also yet again going for the Phoenix opener. As I said, it's just something that he likes to do. And it seems like he really likes to do it stay because it's literally the last five games I've seen him play in this tournament, including the qualifiers, all of them have been Phoenix openers versus Terran. Nice kill on that Reaper as well. I think there is some value though in, in kind of playing your own style a little bit at this level, because as you said, most people, especially the Europeans, like Max Pax, for instance, really tend to favor the Blink Stalker style. But yep. 
if you can mix it up and just kind of play by the beat of your own drum the way that Classic is right now in this PBT, it can really throw your opponent off because here for Bunny, it, it might be hard for him to have found practice partners that can play this style as effectively as Classic can. It's hard to emulate because not everybody goes for Phoenix Colossus and it is one of those compositions as we saw in game number one that very quickly can just spiral out of control into a loss for the Protoss player if they it's don't very do it flimsy. perfectly. It's very flimsy. Like, you can suddenly just swing a fight and it will just be a perfect defense for you. And in this, in like, if you run that back like 10 times, uh, uh, surely like half of those, you could end up actually just dying as well if the, the, the micro is correct or something, if someone's mispositioned or whatnot. So it's very finicky. It's like you can very easily just get killed at, with these early pushes. This map specifically, though, I think is actually pretty decent for it. And it, like once you actually get that three base setup, it's it becomes very difficult for the Terran player to actually punish you, and it's very good defensively for that regard. What you know, leading up to that point again is the problem is the problem. So similar to Oceanborn, we need to see if Bunny can make some kind of early strike to really just blow all the wind out of the sails of Classic before he can get everything set up. Classic continuing to power that robotic spay nearly completion. Did train one immortal, similar in game number one, before going into that Colossus tech, which surely will fire up in any second now. And Bunny, about as standard as it gets in terms of a two-base play. He has not yet thrown down that third command center, which makes me think that like, more akin to game number one, we are going to see him go for a similar type of pressure here. Perhaps trying to find a timing where it lines up just about there with plus one. And it might be these first two medevacs that kind of key him in on going for the aggression. And this looks almost identical in terms of opening to what we saw there on Oceanborn. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to go back to the one that won it. I mean, it was a, yeah. such a solid, convincing win from Bunny. Like, why not try it again? Even if it gets defended, it's not something that you really need to... It doesn't have to kill the, te the Protoss either. Like, he did get a third base behind it just a little bit later than what you would normally do, but it's still something that is very potent. This time, though, Classic seems a bit more well prepared for it. Has his Phoenix back a little bit more in position. Oh. Finds the Medivax. Luckily for Bunny, the boost was still on cooldown, or off cooldown, I should say, so he was able to get away. Luckily, does not lose two Medivax full of units. So that would be absolutely tragic. But we'll be able to group everything together now. Still a lot of units for Bunny, but Classic. Got a pretty decent setup here defensively. He's not getting pulled apart like he did in that game one. Yeah, and he has four force fields worth of energy here on the top of the ramp if he decides to you know, forego Guardian Shield. So that is a very tough position for Bunny to break. And the window where Classic's army composition is exceptionally vulnerable is starting to pass because now he has two Colossus out. Those sentries are continuing to build energy. Thermal Lance is 10 seconds away from completion. And once all these critical upgrades come in here, for Classic, then suddenly it feels like his army can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe here with Bunny. Now poking a little bit forward, able to get a Marauder right there in the lift. And it's these little tiny pickoffs as Classic that can really start to add up. I think if Bunny wants to get a good engagement here on the Protoss player, it's going to have to come from a big drop play. And we see him gearing up for that right now. These four Medivacs pivoting down to the south, but the Adept... Oh is going God. to spot it. I mean, just the game sense coming in there from Classic. He has five Phoenix, so they have to drop. And Classic might pounce on this with force fields if he decides to do so. Oh. Yeah, he sections off the army. They have to retreat to the corner. The Widowmine shot's not the best. Able to get a couple of units. Meanwhile, a counterattack here. The natural expansion will be defused by two Colossus and a handful of Zealots. And Classic so far not taking much damage. A couple of probes will go down here in the natural expansion, but Bunny, he's losing Medivacs, he's losing Bio, and he has yet to find that critical opening. Classic is stabilizing. That was an excellent defense there from Classic. Again, getting Medivacs in the back end. He's going straight into Fleet Beacon, by yeah. the way. This is an incredibly early transition. Something he likes to do, but under this much aggression to already go for this is kind of insane. These units Bunny, are dead. It, this is such a committed play by him. He's really trying to get this damage done, but all these Colossus swipes are getting huge amounts of damage, continually trying to pull Classic away. But there's so many Phoenixes on top of these Medivacs. Sure, there's a couple Marauders in this third base, but is that going to be the thing that's going to pull it completely break classic here i don't think so 16 probes were killed off during all of that though i think a widow mine shot was in there it somewhere was. that might have hit something big which is very good for bunny he absolutely needed that because before that was happening he was not getting the damage done that was not what you were looking for as the terran player classic was on top of that losing seven medevacs though is something very notable here 
for Bunny. Yeah, he, he still has four medevacs on the map, but that means that he has no Vikings on the field at That's all. That's four Colossi. Yeah, I, I feel like Classic with his counterattack might just do it. Bunny really overextended with that drop in the main base against five Phoenix. And yeah, the third base instantly getting, li getting lifted off. Force Fields didn't catch quite all the SCVs, but I mean, Classic fighting in from this position, this is one of the natural expansions that Colossi are excellent at attacking into. It's one of the reasons why Hero, when we say, see him play PBT, loves to go for Colossi timing attacks on this map because look at the arc here. If you want to actually pounce on these Colossus with a ground army, you have to go through that little tiny choke point. Meanwhile, Classic can just poke and prod forward. All the supply depots are here. Two barracks are here. The second starport is here. And Bonnie's infrastructure is just getting absolutely decimated by these Colossi. And I don't see a world, unless he can somehow EMP the sentries, that he can actually push forward and stop this. And Classic is pulling back. That's, that's, it looks weird <laughs> because it's I like, am surprised. Because it's like, wow, there's nothing to do with these Colossi right now. But also, why should he do that? Mm. Why should he attack? He's got carriers on the back end at 10 minutes in a PBT, denies a third base, knows that his opponent is completely on the defensive and says, you know what? No, this is how I actually possibly lose this game. Right here, if I just go in too far and it's an overextension, I am gonna take the safe play, I'm gonna come back, get my carriers, max out. That's a solid play out of Classic right there. He Sure, maybe he could have gone for that. An SE, a, a CC lift with an SCV pull or something, that mm -hmm. could swing fast. He doesn't exactly know. So I think this is a solid play, because look at that army. Yeah. How is that going to die to this little thing? It's He's up 40 supply. I, I think the only way is a Doom Drop that pulls Classic dismally out of position and then somehow gets out of there. But there's Phoenixes on the map. How, that's not going to happen. I'm sure plus one air weapons is going to be underway here soon as well. And Buddy's army just straight up does not beat this. If the EMPs are perfect, I, I could see a world. This Maybe. drop is excellent. I love this as well. It knows exactly this army is super far out on the map. Look at this bunny. He's pulling oh. back. Oh, my God. That's so much time bought. And even going to recall the prism so it gets back home so he could do it again a little bit later. This is excellent by Classic here. Just pulling bunny as thin as can be, knowing that he's, he's, he's essentially on two bases. That third base is landed, but there's nothing there. Yeah, there's this still is so well done. I mean, the, the main anti-air here, besides this handful of Vikings for Buddy, is just Marines, which are going to get obliterated by the Colossi. We even have Templar on the field now. All right, EMP comes in, gets a ton of the Stalkers. But the Stalkers are doing a good job of pushing away the Vikings. And the Stutter Step Micro, really not good with Vikings in this kind of situation, is the Phoenix now are going to come forward. They're trying to catch the rally there on the Vikings, but a little bit too late. And again, it's just a handful of medevacs. I think we only have four in total as Bunny is forced to make Vikings. So even after that stim, the Benavax with high energy are struggling to do anything. Guardian Shield pops yet again, and the Phoenix are coming in. Classic really wants this engagement. The Colossi are getting so much damage done. The Stalker is eventually trading out. There's no ground army left for Bunny. GG is called, and Classic has defeated Bunny 2-1, to one, going to the winner's match. We're going to have a PvP. It's a what? PvP winner. What year is it? What are we doing? This is not what's supposed to happen. We have two Protosses advancing to the winner's match, and both of them are players that I think, especially, I mean, the first one especially, Sats versus Dark, is not one we expected to get there. Classic, we could sure see it, for sure, but wow, what an amazing situation that we have here. Two Protoss players are now gonna be fighting in the winner's match to possibly get out first in the group. This is an exciting refreshment. I love this, this is great. I wanna see more. Yeah, and let me tell you, those were not cheapies either. Stats and Classic have been playing out of their minds today. And you know, Dark and Bunny eventually, one of them is going to be knocked out in the elimination match, which blows my mind. Guys, we're going to go to a short break. When we get back to the winner's match, Classic versus Stats. Did not expect to say that. We will see you in a minute.
So hold on to the highs while you're all right Cause you know you're gonna come down Just a matter of time and you will find Everything comes back around Comes back around, comes back around Back around, comes back around Comes back around좀 많이 떨어졌어가지고 좀그 회복하려고 되게 열심히 아예 준비하고 뭐 나이 먹어서 그런지 시간이 너무 빨리 가서 뭐 그냥 매번 똑같이 연습하고 뭐 운동하고 술 먹고 이렇게 지냈던 것 같아요 좀 쉬웠고요 아예 그 예선 준비하면서 네, 다시 스타트 연습 달리고 그랬었던 것 같아요 사실 아예 카토비체 예선 준비를 한창 하다가 떨어져 버려가지고 이제 남들 연습할 때 저는 놀고 있었습니다 아 그거 생각하면 너무 아쉬워가지고 잠을 못 자겠는데 그한 경기 딱 이기면 은 진출 확정인 상황이어가지고 그게 좀 아쉬웠어요 기억과 손이 옛날로 돌아가서 한 싸움으로 그냥 압도를 했단 말이에요 그래서 이길 수 있겠는데 라는 생각을 했는데 갑자기 다른 사람이 들어와가지고 <웃음> 좀 많이 아쉬웠던 것 같아요. 세트 가면 또 몰랐는데 사태란 조회 관계 12강 진출하는 게 많이 힘들겠는데 라는 생각을 했었는데 었또 어떻게 상대해야 되는지도 좀 알게 된것 같아서 잃은 것도 있지만 얻은 것도 크다고 생각해요. 제가 2대0으로 이기고 있었는데 이제 스피리 선수한테 역습 당하고 좀 멘탈이 많이 안 좋았어가지고 그리고 날이 너무 아쉽네요. 예선을 충분히 뚫을 수 있었는데 못 들어가지고 
오늘 친구랑 대화하면서 하는 느낌이 들었고 재미가 있었던 것 같아요 제가 뽑고 싶은 사람, 선수들이 다 다른 조에 가 있고 막 이러니까 생각처럼 그 재미가 없었던 것 같아요 근데 제 개인적으로는 어, 랜덤적으로 좀 어, 이렇게 조가 걸리는 것도 되게 재밌을 것 같아요 항상 조 추첨을 하면 굉장히 안 좋게 조가 많이 됐었어가지고 제가 한명 뽑을 수 있었던 게 굉장히 좋았던 것 같습니다 아, 미친놈인 줄 알았어요 아, 제정신 틴키랜드 뽑아가지고 그나마 뭐 장욱 선수나 경재형? 경재형이 근데 시드시더라고요 그냥 이승해서 8강으로 빠르게 올라가고 싶은 마음이 있습니다 라인의 모습이라는 걸좀 느꼈고 아 이게 무슨 의미가 있을지 모르겠지만 은 그래도 윤수 제가 이겼습니다 네 일단 성주만 피하면 좀 그래도 저럭저럭 잘 풀리는 것 같고 윤수랑은 저랑은 실력 차이가 좀 크기 때문에 좀 당연하다라고 봅니다 뭐 명을 올려 보내고 남은 세 명에서 뭐 경쟁해도 충분히 할만하다라고 생각을 해서 충분히 올라갈 수 있을 것 같습니다. 그러니 좀 특유의 견제하는 스타일에 많이 휘둘리면서 졌었는데 뭐 이번에는 뭐 저번하고는 좀 다른 결과가 있지 않을까 싶어요. 연습 때 많이 올라왔거든요. 저 뽑으면 질것 같으니까 안 뽑지 않았을까요? 코스가 약해서 그나마 대화를 합니다. 쉽진 않겠지만 지면 안 된다 생각하고 무조건 1등으로 진출하려고 생각하고 사우디 스포츠 월드컵에 진출을 하고 싶고 정말 열심히 한번 준비해 보겠습니다 어, GSL 우승 한번 하는 거랑 어, 월드컵 가서 우승하는 거랑 1등이 되는 게 목표 뭐 옛날 같았으면 이제 우승이라고 했겠지만 우승은 힘들 것 같고 자강 가서 포인트도 없고 좀 그럴 계획입니다 음. 어떻게 보면 제 라스트 댄스기 때문에 참가하는 대회는 다 우승하고 싶고 불태울 생각이거든요 많은 분들이 와주셔서 제가 열심히 그리고 재밌게 하는 경기 보러 와주셨으면 좋겠어요Welcome back, everybody. We are living in a parallel universe where Protoss players win games in the GSL. <laughs> we found the one universe out of unfathomably large amount where we actually have two Protoss players advancing into the winner's match, and we are guaranteed at least one over into the round of eight. That's right, they, they can't both lose. <laughs> It's literally impossible. It's literally impossible. We found the one chance where it's actually impossible for a Protoss to not lose. That's insane. It's honestly, awesome. I mean, honestly, this is, we're only halfway through the day so far, and the games have already been so fantastic. And it, it really is a breath of fresh air to see players like Stats and Classic that, I mean, I have loved for basically their entire StarCraft II careers, except for that one time that Classic uh, proxy gated me in a pro league. I did not like that. <laughs> but besides oh, yeah. that, that was besides him. Besides that, that's right. Besides that, I have loved these guys forever, basically. And so it is so thrilling to have Classic versus Stats coming in here. That's they been have both shown away at you for years. Such good games. One of them is going to be advancing to the round of eight. Let's go to game number one on Oceanborn. <laughs> You don't even feel a little bit, just a little bit of hate for this I'm hoping player. he loses. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he somehow gets revoked and he can't even play the game anymore because of that. No, that's too far. Okay. This game is too fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, classic, by the way, the blue Protoss spawning in the top left. The stats, the red Protoss in the bottom right. Don't get confused. I feel like there's not enough drama in the StarCraft scene. We need to start that between you and Classic from that one <laughs> pro league game. I'm so far below his level. Ten it's not years possible ago. for drama. <laughs> You're going to beat him on ladder as well now. You're going to find mm. the cheekiest way you can beat him on ladder. You're going to steal 50 points from him. Because <laughs> I'm so low MMR. Yes. You're going to take, your, your, you know what you're going to do? You're going to do my Classic that I stole from a Russian Protoss where you proxy both your Robo and your Dark Shrine in the corner of the map and <laughs> drop it into his base at four minutes into the game. 
and you're going to grab Four him. minutes? Yes. That, that is pretty quick, actually. You get 50 points. If I ever go up against Classic, I will, I will message you on Cacao. <laughs> <laughs> Try to figure that out. But man, what a treat to have Classic versus Stats here in the winner's match. This was yep. by far... Oh, Stats wants this kill. He's going to pull a probe out of the gas. It's one HP. He gets oh. it. There you go. So Gamer. first blood drawn here by Stats. It's kind of a big little pick. That's, that's a, it that's is, because usually you can kind of probe around for a little bit and maybe even potentially drop a pylon at the the ramp right there and see what yeah, units like, are going to come out you of the gateways. You could very easily at this point just make, even if you weren't going to go for a one base strategy, at this point you can do that very easily and just pivot because you have no uh, confirmation as the as the opponent to know okay are they just going to throw down a really fast gateway are they going to chrono warp gate right away when it starts you know it, it's actually a it looks like small it's because it's just one pro but get yeah, having the scout in the other person's base the entire time until they put that third pylon on the low ground as well it's like actually a pretty big deal to, to get that information so if Stats wanted to, to go for something cheeky. He could. Doesn't look like he's going for it, though. So no. at least this is still might be in the back of Classic's mind, given the fact that he hasn't actually seen what the early units are or anything. I wonder if Stats is going to queue up another sentry here, because there was a while where Stats was doing, I believe it was a five or six gateway unit expansion. Stalker sentry, stalker sentry, stalker sentry, which I really liked. I was copying that build myself on the ladder for a while because it was such a safe way of getting your expansion up, especially with the Hallucination Scout, as we see the Phoenix moving cross map now. But a little bit of a deviation here for stats is he hasn't really been hammering the Sentry production too much, instead going into Double Stalker. Meanwhile, Classic is doing a classic one base strategy, throwing down the Robotics Facility already there in the main base, as well as the third gateway. But this is going to get scouted instantly. In. The thing about PvP is oftentimes, even when you do scout builds like this, it does not guarantee a hold. You can know what kind of pressure is coming and still have a very hard time holding on with it because the micro potential of, you know, just pure stalker with a warp prism or even one immortal with a warp prism is so deadly. Look at the production tab right now with that warp prism already coming through. I'm imagining this is just going to be three gate stalker pressure with a prism, but it can be a lot. And actually, Classic coming in with a Shade decides that he can't really get too much done here. It's instead going to be a late expansion. So instead, we'll see if that Warp Prism will be utilized to potentially get those Adepts into the main base to pick off probes. There's a couple different ways you can approach this from Classic's perspective. Yeah, I was about to say as well, th this is something that similar to what I was talking about before with the probe kill. PvP is a lot about pivots, where you can get Sir, so you get scouted, but you can use that information to initiate to immediately go and do something else. Because so now Classic still brings the warp prism across and warps units in and is like and it's like, hey, yeah, I am attacking you. You scouted that I was supposed to be attacking you, so here I am. But he's still expanding behind it, making probes behind it, getting a tech building as well, and is now using the warp prism in a different way to try and get into the back, get a few probe kills, and even up the worker count, which is exactly what he's doing. It's even at 28 now, and Stats had stopped his probe production for a decent bit there, assuming that his opponent was going to do what he scouted was happening. So PvP a lot of times has this, this these opportunities where, sure, you get scouted, but that's actually almost can be a benefit, to your point, if you use it in the way that Classic has done in this game. Yeah, it can be a very tricky matchup, and to even compound the advantage that Classic is able to eke out by that, he has a Twilight Council already researching Blink, whereas Stats, because this entire time he's been suspecting a potential all-in, because that is what he scouted, He's only just now throwing down his Twilight Council. His blink is going to be like 45 seconds at least behind his opponents unless he pours every single Chrono Boost into it. And with stats now, or Classic, excuse me, taking a third gas, he should have a lot of money to make a lot of Stalkers. And if you're playing Mass Blink Stalker, should Classic decide to go down that pathway against an opponent with such a late Twilight and such a late blink? Oh, okay. Careful. Wow, neither, was, <laughs> neither player was paying attention, so yeah. luckily... <laughs> That didn't go back to Classic. Yeah, but. some stutter step, step there, and that War yeah. Prism is dead. Oof, that was a bit risky, but uh, Stats is also actually going to be making his own Prism there. Mm. Likely will be for that double Immortal drop. Could be very potent, as the Blink, again, will be a bit later still for Classic. S Classic's still trying to find anything he can with this. Ooh, a little flank possibly for Stats. Might be able to find this Prism in an awkward position if Classic's not paying attention, but he will stick it into that dead zone. Uh, just recalls it right out. Nice, safe play there. Knows that the units were on the hunt. He will keep that safe. But 
The Blink 4 Classic is still a little bit later than normal, considering the fact that he opened Robo. So the fact that this Prism is out here right now could lead for some uh, some Immortal drop, or it could just be a straight frontal push to try and use those Immortals in the actual fight with the War Prism uh, reinforcing as well. Because without any Immortals here, actually there's one on Classic side. So this actually, I don't know if this is actually the correct move from Stats to try and go into this here. We'll be able to pick up those two Immortals, put the Blink forward, snipes down that Prism, and then is able to bring some of the units back as well with his own. But these two Immortals didn't actually get picked off here. And now with two Adepts into the Natural as well, this is a bit threatening here for Classic. Yeah, I'm actually really surprised by that Blink forward by Classic. I think that, I mean, yes, of course, picking off the Warp Prism is huge value, but he traded so many units to do that. And now he's really stretched thin. He's going to lose this third Nexus more likely than not because he lost so many Warp, or so many Stalkers trying to take down that Prism. I mean, yes, you do have a Warp Prism, yes, you do have Blink, but your opponent is basically double your Stalker count right here at this third base. More Stalkers reinforcing in. That Nexus is, it's going to be dead. I'm amazed that he was able to take that good of engagement without Blink. Blink is only just finishing right now, and thank God it did, because otherwise Classic might have been able to jump on this army and pre uh, prevent it oh. from retreating. A forward Blink from Stats as well to punish onto that Immortal, and that is going to be that. Stats takes the first game in a bit of a surprising way. Yeah, Classic really overplayed his hand leaning forward onto that Warp Prism. I, I think that was the critical mistake right there because, you know, Stats coming in with that attack, he didn't have Blink, he did have a Warp Prism for Micro, but there were three sentries with high energy on the other side of that. And the army count wasn't too advantageous for him. Blink does more than enough to make up for that difference. But the fact that Classic thought he could get Brave, Blink forward, take out that Warp Prism, and still have a favorable engagement, I mean, those are the split-second decisions that decide the fate of PvPs time and time again. And he absolutely did not get the better of that trade. As a result, he loses his third base and then stats. I mean, his blink finishes at just the right moment and he is able to clean that one up. And now stats, I mean, the black horse coming into this group, he was by far the underdog defeated Dark 2-1 to one, is now on match point to advance in first place to the round of eight. Not what we expected whatsoever. Can he close it out in a 2-0 or will it be going to a game three? Let's find out now as we go into game number two. Classic, the blue Protoss down 0-1 in this best of three, spawning in the bottom right. And stats in the top left, leading 1-0. One map win away from the round of eight. I mean, what a beginning to the year here in GSL for Stats, a player that for a long time was arguably the best Protoss player in the world, if not the best, then top two or top three without a doubt, who has been struggling so much since returning from military service, has been consistently underperforming the expectations set on him by the fans, by the community, to now come in here and play one of the best nights of his life, certainly of the best, <laughs> the past couple of years. I mean, yeah. This is definitely his most uh, impressive performance, I would say, so far that we've seen him back. This is the first time that I'm looking at this and be like, yeah, this is actually the stats of old. He, he is playing to that level. And it, it's, it's, it's a, it's so great to see because he was so good for so long and now it's you know there was that couple years about a year or so since he's been back and it's just like seeing him falter was it was kind of un, uh, it was like oh my god is it this is it like is this how he's gonna go it's like okay oh, he comes back and then he just can't really do anything else again it's like oh that'd be kind of sad yeah i mean coming back from iam going 0 for 5 in the group stages yeah that was uh, it was brutal i mean that was also kind of the, the group of death for a protoss player true very true <laughs> But it was one of the most one of the most stacked groups of like <laughs> top tier Terrans that we've ever seen. But to come back from that and show up in GSL undeterred and play some of the best games of the past couple of years is just I am so impressed with stats. And even if he doesn't make it out of this group, although he is so close to doing that right now, I mean, as a, as a fan of this guy going back years and years, I am so happy because honestly, my heart breaks sometimes when I see players like Stats who used to be so good come in and then struggle. Same thing for Classic, same thing for Sue. 
I mean, these people are legends in the StarCraft II scene. And Classic now up against the ropes here. Down 1-0. Playing with a really aggressive opening. That is a fast proxy Stargate. And I, Stats should know this, too, with a scouting probe, by the way. He's only seen two pylons in the main base. So I, I actually love the way he's doing this, though, because at the, uh, the way he's done it, he's gone for Stalker Sentry with this as well, which is extreme. You, you don't look at that and think, oh, yeah, there's definitely going to be a proxied Stargate on the map with that. So, yes, the third pylon is absent, but seeing the Sentry there, mm. it's going to make him make Stats scratch his head, being like, well, what, what exactly are you doing here? Because... Surely you can't afford the gas to be able to go double stalker sentry with a proxied Stargate 4 and Oracle as well. And you can see Stats isn't quite realizing this just yet. I don't think oh. he's got a battery in his main. Definitely not. He saw the, the hallucination coming across, so he confirms that, yes, it was a sentry. I wasn't just hallucinating the sentry in front of my <laughs> eyes. So he knows exactly what is possible for Classic. And Stargate is not in that rotation of what he's expecting right now. He's got all of his stalkers across the map, and there's no battery back at home. This Oracle could go huge. Yeah, the battery's only about a third of the way done right now. As Stats will take a favorable engagement here in the natural expansion for Classic, but that Oracle's about to reach the mineral line in the main base across the other side of the map. War Prism not done just yet. We don't have a sight line on it yet, but you can see the probe start to fall. Actually went for a sentry there, so only two probes in total go down. And Stats still has two stalkers up here in the main. With some micro, he can take down another one, but a nice probe surround there, almost getting one of those low HP stalkers. And I was expecting, I was expecting the Oracle in the main to get more done, but it seemed like Stats had just enough coming out of those gateways to deal with it. And even recalling those stalkers and getting them back home. Wow, that was, that, that went really interesting because the battery for Classic actually wasn't finished yet, which is what allowed those Stalkers to dive so deep. I wasn't even like considering that as an option because I was just mm -hmm. assuming that the battery would have been done already. And then he would have been able to just deflect the Stalkers and then uh, Stats has a panic recall back at home. But the Warp Gate finished just in time as well to allow the double Stalker warp in back at home. And I think Classic was a bit preoccupied with microing his Stalkers at the front. It didn't allow him to actually target down enough probes in time before the Stalkers were warped in. So the aggression got pulled back onto them. So unfortunately for Classic, that actually didn't end up going as well as it really could have. And he lost a lot back at home at the same time. So now he's actually been down a couple workers in this whole mid game. So a bit of an awkward uh, interaction for the early game here. He still does have double Oracle though. And when you have two Oracles, there's always an opportunity as a Protoss player in this matchup. I do feel though, with the Devil Oracle not getting much damage done at all yet. And with a later expansion there for Classic and Stats taking a favorable trade. Right now, oh, oh that Oracle is going to go down. Oh, Last hit gets it. That's huge. It is 10 Stalkers to 2. Both players are going blink. Classic is throwing down an additional two gateways, I think, because he knows if he doesn't, he will die. And Stats, I would not be surprised. Oh, he's actually going to try to do this aggressively. I, I don't think he has quite the read that he needs because I am worried for Classic's life right now, not Stats's, <laughs> given the count of units that we have right now. And Stats, he's not cutting back on the Stalker production. If, if you don't slow down warping and Stalkers, you don't really need to add that many gateways. He is building one Robo, but he is still slowly warping in additional Stalkers. And this is kind of a scary position because Classic is effectively going all in with these Proxy 2 gateways. He did make a... Th oh, my God. Oh, he's taking the gold, gold base. Yeah, I was going to say, there's no wow. third just yet, and now he's going for the gold. I think he recognizes what a bad position he's in, and he's like, game I goes. have to make this game weird. And Stats now calling for a pause. Stats also being like, hey, this game is weird. I need, I need, to think I need about a second this. here. <laughs> <laughs> he takes out a magic eight ball. He's like, is he, <laughs> is he forgetting me? Am I actually ahead? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, obviously there must be some little uh, tech issue or something, so we'll get that solved out. But I mean, this game already is looking a bit interesting. I mean, the I, I like what you're saying though is that Classic definitely does realize that something's not good for him right now. This isn't he realizes this is obviously not going in his favor. So throwing as many cards into onto the field to hopefully try and just throw stats off. He's like, okay, I'm going to proxy some gateways, maybe go for some early soccer pressure, uh, pressure while I go onto your third base. And then it's like, oh, stats, look, I'm attacking you. I'm, I'm trying to kill you. But at the back end, he's taking a third base at the gold, which if you're stats and you don't realize that soon enough and you see like, oh, my opponent's going for a big two base, two base attack. I'm just going to win if I hold this. But on the back end, it's a gold base. That's actually not too good for classics. So 
or sorry, for stats. So I like the way that Classic is doing this, just throwing out as many weird things as possible to possibly bring this back into his favor. Yeah, I, I think when you're in a position like Classic is in right now, where your stalker count is maybe seven or eight behind your opponent, you're effectively going for a mirrored composition. that It will be Blink Stalker versus Blink Stalker. You need to make the game weird. He's not going to find much more damage with the Oracles. Maybe that could happen on ladder, but it's not going to happen at this high level with Blink Stalker's Sidibe on the map for stats. So it's got to be him doing something funky. I think he's going to try and set some stasis traps and see if he can catch as many Stalkers as he can. And the gold base is a pretty good way of buffing that mineral income because you really don't need that many gas to actually pump full Stalker production. Is yeah, that's true. He could probably just stay on that four gas at his uh, yeah, for at, sure. from his first two bases, and that, that one extra on the gold base should pretty much do it for, for that. So I think the swell of the stasis wards could be pretty big here too, like you're saying, because uh, since he still kept one of them alive, he could actually put the stasis like back behind his army a little bit and then push forward into the into the third base and pressure it a little bit and be like, hey, like, look, I've, I'm on my army so small. Why don't mm. you come and blink onto me? And then he blinks forward and then you just stasis everything as they blink right. in. And that could actually turn our fight really quickly. So those kind of plays could be very good. That's something that he needs to be able to try and bring this back a little bit again because, yeah, at the moment, unless some of these things go well for Classic, he's still definitely in a bad spot. Yeah. We're getting confirmation from production that Stats actually has a keyboard issue right now, so currently the tech team is trying their best to resolve that, but might be a little bit before we actually get him back in the game. But as it is right now, I mean, if I just look at this on paper, if Stats plays his heart, his heart. If Stats plays, if he plays, <laughs> if he plays with his heart, if he follows, and never gives up. If he follows his dream, maybe. I, I think, I think he might be first place in this group. Classic yeah. is really up against the ropes. He went for that kind of awkward build, which I love how you pointed out the stalker in the entry there, because usually two pylons in the main base and no third pylon of the natural or anywhere else is going to be the tell that there's some kind of proxy. Typically, it's an oracle. But the fact that he went for that and still proxy to Stargate, really clever tactic. Yeah. Especially when you're, you know, one game away from getting knocked out of this best of three and falling into the final match of the day. Right? So I like the tactic, but the fact that Stats was still able to at home defend with a sentry and then warping in two stalkers before the battery finished. And I think he only lost like two or three probes. Two probes, yeah. That is pretty remarkable. Yeah, that's so, a solid defense it's for something that you had no idea was coming and were mm -hmm. actively being tricked to believe wasn't happening as well. Like, that's a good reaction for sure. It's very well done by stats. Now, even the Nexus on the low ground and the yeah. additional stalker there on the low ground, it was three stalkers and a sentry. I mean, you know there's some kind of tech behind it, but you might be like, well, maybe he's going for a really fast Twilight or really fast Robo or something funky is going on. You don't really have it on your radar that it is going to be that proxy Oracle. Yeah. So stats just... I mean, he showed the same kind of gameplay against Dark, where he just really has been good at rolling with the punches today. It feels like this is some of the best StarCraft that he's been playing since he returned from military service. No, it very well might be the best StarCraft we've seen from stats in years. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, he is so close right now. I mean, what a time to bring that out, too, as well. Like, just, you know, just in time for the GSL, the GSL here. I mean, before this, uh, before this day, against these players, Versus Dark, he had only won a single match against him in the last year. Against Classic, the, the the last time that Stats won a series against Classic was literally last night. Before <laughs> last night, he was he lost every single match against Classic. He was 0-4 against Classic since returning to the military. The only time he beat him was literally last night in the Stars War qualifier, and it was a, it was a two, a two I think it was a two one or two zero, oh, but it was. And up until literally the last 24 hours, <laughs> Stats was not playing the best StarCraft that we've seen, that we've known that he could possibly play. So the fact that he's suddenly turned it on for this group is impressive to say. And, I mean, he's literally looking like he's about to walk away with first place in this group. Think he's hustling us? <laughs> you think he was intentionally <laughs> he, he playing? He hustled R.E.M. Katowice, the, <laughs> one of the biggest tournaments of the year, specifically so he could get out first in this group. You think for the past couple of years he's been playing below his level? He's been smurfing mm. on the pro scene? He's been <laughs> formulating this plan in the military the whole time. He's like, what if I just look terrible for the first year and a half and then suddenly be become good for one day? It might not just be one day. If he it's a like, real he's hustle. He's like talking to his, his like bunkmates or whatever. He's like, guys, I got the best plan ever. You ready to hear this? And they're just looking at him. It's like, what? 
If it's a like real hustle, he's, he's like, you know about. what? GSL 2024, someone's going to pick me first in their group because they think they're weak, but actually <laughs> I'm strong. <laughs> I'm going to purposefully lose 05 in all the IDM Katowice matches, and then I'm going to blow GSL out of the water. All right, so just taking a really quick look in-game. It seems like we might be ready to get back into this. Stats is testing out his keyboard a little bit with some spam. Lots of fours in the chat. Lots of fours. Are you I mean, a four on Nexus guy or five on Nexus? I'm a or five on Nexus five guy, on actually. Nexus. But you I was going like to say, because stats is act I mean, we are in Korea. And did you know that the four is the, the death number in this country? Did you know that? Uh, it comes from, I think, traditional Chinese, doesn't oh, it? it? I think it's a Chinese thing. I, I could be wrong about this. I'm not an expert on numerology in, in Korea. And <laughs> it seems like, actually, we will be resuming from replay. So oh, okay. just bear with us for a couple more minutes. But yeah, that is interesting. The first time I came to Korea and I noticed that on a lot of the elevators out here, especially the old ones, the fourth floor is just listed as F. I was so confused. <laughs> F to pay respects to those who died <laughs> under this number. <laughs> so good, actually. <laughs> what a coincidence that is. Oh yeah, yeah. If you ever come to Korea, I'm sure. I mean, we have some people in the audience right yeah, now that yeah, it might yeah. be their first time in Korea. Yeah, you take an elevator, and especially in the older buildings, you will see F replacing four yep. on a lot of elevators, it and make it's any always sense just been at like. All. But yeah, for some reason, the yeah, like you said, I guess it's the Chinese letters or something. The the yeah. death number for for Koreans, the stereo, the the superstition is is that four equals death. Also, did you know that if you write your name in red, that apparently means you're gonna die. I didn't know that. That's yeah, yeah. it's bad that, luck. So, I, so I, of course, I, I mean, I so like uh, whenever I'm like with the uh, you know the students or whatever at school, they're always like. I write my name in red on the board, and they're just like, you can't do that! Like, and it's, like, so funny. They just, like, <laughs> lose their minds. It's like, oh, my God. Uh, all right, so Stats still has the same issue with the keyboard right now. They are going to be restarting his PC before we, excuse me, resume from replay. But I'm still liking his position, man. I think it's pretty good. And it kind of does suck for Stats because everything is kind of going his way right yeah. now in this game. He's got a lot of momentum behind him to now run into a keyboard issue where you're going to have to resume from replay, where you need to restart your computer, and maybe they restart the computer and there's still some driver issue or something that they need to troubleshoot a little bit. It's also kind of interesting, too, because it's like, of all the scenarios for this to happen in, this is also an, an opportunity that does kind of favor Classic in a way because he is the one that is about to start throwing a bunch of weird stuff at him. True. And so Stats is the one that kind of has to be the, the guy that's understanding everything and absorbing it and putting all the pieces together and realizing where he actually is in the game. So it's like if this goes on for too long, then it could be I could see a world where like Stats is a little bit shaken by it and maybe miscalculates something because he wasn't, you know, he maybe like forgot that something was happened. Maybe he missed the. You know, he doesn't quite catch some movement on the map or something from before. And he's like, oh wait, maybe there was a probe going to the gold base. I should have mm. checked for that. And then he, like he doesn't or something. I don't think he actually did scout for that. But the point is, is that you know he has to now be the one that's dictating where this game actually continues because Classic is going to be throwing a bunch of weird stuff at him. Yeah, oftentimes when when I was a pro player, if I found myself in the position where I would need to resume from replay, right before the countdown, I would just kind of summarize the game to myself in my head. I'm like, okay, like if I'm in Stats' position, look, I'm ahead right now. I surely have at least five more Stalkers than him. I just need to defend my third base, and then eventually my army all hit like a plus one timing or a plus two timing. I should be good. Mm -hmm. And you'll say that, and everything will be ni nicely wrapped up in a little present for you. You'll be like, I got this game in the box. Like Give Everything is here in my head. <laughs> and then you go in, and there's this curveball. There's two proxy gateways outside my third base. What? And then suddenly, yeah, wait, yeah. he still hasn't taken his third base back at home. He must be really all in. What? And it can be really hard to leave that flow state and then get back into the game and try to re-enter it very quickly when, as you said, a lot of curveballs are about to be thrown his way. And this might be the kind of situation where maybe he doesn't have stasis wards immediately on the front of his mind because this has been maybe, what, a five-minute delay? Yeah. I mean, it becomes like, what do you prioritize now? Like, you have to remember, like, when you're going into this game, what were you about to do? Like, yeah. you, like you, it breaks your immersion so quickly when you suddenly have such a long break and you go back into it and you realize, like, wait, wh what was I going to What was my next step? Like, what was I about to do? Was I about to, like, go to my natural and make this thing? It's like, oh, my God, yes, I was. And then maybe you forget that, oh, I was actually also about to then put, a, like, a stasis ward somewhere, like, at the same time. Like, it actually does kind of break you up a little bit, and you have to, at that point, remember what your actual, actual priority was of what you were about to do. And, I mean, that could 
play, in a, play into effect here with this game, this long pause. It's another thing, if you haven't resumed from replay before, is you join in and the game is paused, and when it's paused, you, you can't look around the map at all at your base. You can't cycle through your hotkeys and be like, okay, my robo is producing, my gateways have 10 seconds left on cooldown. You're just thrown right in. You're thrown right in. You don't know what your probe saturation is on your bases. There's a lot of kind of little small things like this that, as you said, they, they can throw you off mm -hmm. a little bit. But luckily, this is a PvP. We just make stalkers, so it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, not, that it's not like this. It's like some crazy late game uh, PvZ situation where, like, you know, it's just been a total chaos like that first series we had or anything. So, yeah, there's not too many things that could go wrong at this point in the game. But, you know, just the fact that Classic is about to just do a bunch of weird stuff does kind of make, you know, make it a little bit weird. But... Yeah, I know. I mean, if you ever had a game and you're at your own house where you're playing and you get a pause for a long, for a long time and you're a nice person, so you let them pause. <laughs> I was going to say. Instead of just <laughs> immediately unpause. You kind of understand what we're saying. Sometimes you probably felt this where, you know, you, you repause, you, you unpause, and then you're like, wait a second, what, what was I even doing for a second there? Yeah. Have you ever done that? Have you ever unpaused on somebody? You think I'm a bad person? No, I'm just, I'm just curious. How can you even ask me that question, Gemini? Because it's like, you know, sometime, because, no, like, even if it's like they are... You know, not because you want to be a jerk. I'm offended. But because maybe they just like pause and then don't say anything, and then oh, they've no, been paused for like three minutes or five minutes. At any point, you're never even thinking like, actually, let me just repause right now or unpause right now. You've never done that. Maybe if it's like a five minute pause with no explanation, then yeah, you're gonna get lost, buddy. I'm, I'm <laughs> pausing the game. I mean, come on, you have five minutes. You don't yeah. tell me anything that's going on. Like maybe your keyboard, maybe your house is burning down. I mean. In which case, this game in which case, be your priority in anymore. which case, twenty ladder points should not be on your mind. <laughs> I mean, they're losing to me. It's probably a lot more than that. But let's. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on, you're high um, up there on ladder. You're higher than me, even. You're up there. Eh, it's been a minute, though. It's been a minute. I, I try my best. I'm surprised we haven't matched against each other ever since we both started playing a lot more recently. I've, I always expected to eventually find you on the ladders. Are you a barcode? No, of course. Nice. How could you ask me that? A lot of Come people on. play as barcodes. You oh, know? I hate oh, barcodes are the worst, man. I'm with Roddy on this, man. Barcodes I'm, are just. Uh, I'm also not. If you're a barcode, barcode, get out of here. Close the stream. I don't want you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You should donate to the Patreon. It's very important. <laughs> We need the, we need you really have first GSL cast in a while. You really have the hang of this, man. Oh, You're pumping you. the Patreon up and everything. I like <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> well, so just to up you, update you guys right now, we are we're still in the lobby, which means um, I mean the replay lobby. We're not yet loading into the game, which makes me think that they are still trying to work out Stats's issue. And I know it's a little unprofessional for me to turn around like this, but I actually do want to see what's going on on stage. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, production is talking to us. Yeah, <laughs> you guys sorry, can't I just us. We're just staring into the abyss <laughs> as we suddenly freeze over in time. We've lost all ability to speak. We just don't know what we don't have anything left to say. No, production was letting us know that it might be a little bit more time. There is a chance that we will throw to a break if they can't resolve this anytime soon. As it does still seem like uh, admins are trying to work on this. Okay. All right, fellas, we're going to take a short break as we try to get this issue resolved. We'll be back in about maybe five minutes, so don't go anywhere. I 
was born, I've been a big deal. Everywhere I go, they want to take my picture. They liking it, loving it, they got to zoom in. I don't care about the rumors, it's amusing. I don't care about no drama, I get hotter in the summer. I just get to the money, that ain't never been a problem. If you want it, then I got it. I ain't ever gonna stop it. Either love it or you hate it, it don't matter cause I'm popping. I'm a hot girl, I'm a hot girl. I get anything I want, this is my world. I make big moves. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, seems like we might have Stats' situation under control. Um, Stats' PC and keyboard during that break have both been replaced, is what production is telling me. And you might be like, Stay, that was only a five minute break. How did you do that? We actually have the F13 Grand T Grand, I really, I really blundered that. That's the okay. Grand Prix team down here swapping the tires out of his PC. But my goodness, what a delay. So we are still waiting for stats to get everything completely set up. Of course, here at the GSL, usually the players get here about maybe 30, 45 minutes early at least to get all of their settings right on their PC, make sure they have the correct repeat rate, make sure all their settings, their hotkeys are right. And now that we had to replace Stats' PC and his keyboard, it's probably going to take him, I would imagine, at least a couple of minutes to fully confirm everything is correct because you really do not want to miss something critical before you go back into the game. So Stats is going to make sure that all of his settings are correct on the new PC, and then we will be going into resume from replay. So thank you so much for bearing with us. I was actually telling Gemini during the break that this is Possibly the longest tech delay we've had at GSL since I started casting a couple, what, like a year and a half ago or something? Yeah, I mean, it's not like 
I mean, th we run a tight ship over here. It's you know, it's very yeah. rare that we get some uh, some difficulties. So you know, it's unlucky, I guess. But it is what it is, as they like to say. But after the first two series, I was thinking you might be the lucky charm. Yeah, you know, man. having Gemini. I you know, bless the, the day. We get two Protosses like, advancing. We get sick games. Gemini shows up early to the studio, and all the Protoss players rub his head for good <laughs> luck. <laughs> <laughs> that is why I shaved my head specifically, just for that. Yeah, exactly. But um, now I might be thinking you're bad luck. Maybe it's some yin and yang thing going on. And yeah, you can't be perfect, all right? Come on, don't don't blame us all on me. I'm just I'm I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm doing my crazy my my caster voodoo magic to make the game as <laughs> good as possible. It can't be perfect, all right? Yeah. Well, thank you guys for bearing with us. I know it has been quite a long delay. Hopefully, stats will be able to get his PC completely set up. As luckily, looking down at the stage right now, there is no more you know tech team surrounding him. The admins have vacated the stage so it is just him making oh, sure everything is back. correct oh hello it's armani and dream sticking the around fans in the crowd Ooh. are also trying to bear with this one man i haven't seen them in a hot minute i mean th uh, of course armani and dream have uh, retired by this point so they are they don't play anymore but uh probably cool. still could beat us yeah no absolutely <laughs> they walk on they jump on the pc right now i'd be dead in five minutes by either of them it's so true but uh, no, it's cool to see them drop by. Always nice to, I mean, the pro, the pro players in general here are just kind of, they feel like they're in this nice little tight-knit community. They, they yeah. like to, to, to come around to root on their, fr their, their friends, essentially. They've been playing this game together for years, so. I think Seed might have actually been uh, Incredible Miracle Seed, which is a really big throwback name, oh, yeah. if a lot of people remember him. I think he actually won one GSL at his peak. He's one of those flash in the pan, pan players. That, he he foregated every single map or something sounds no no, no. wasn't that <laughs> mc that four gated him every game every map and mc one wasn't or, or was it the opposite i feel like now you have it was, MP, it was mc myself. seed wasn't it wasn't that i think it was, was i'm pretty finals, sure right? seed won was it was it him four gating every <laughs> every time it, went it was a pvp and this is like a decade ago so yeah, there was a yeah, lot yeah, of four gating yeah. i assure you but um <laughs> yeah i think he was at the gsl finals if not this past one then you know maybe a season come by and yeah, it is nice having the pro players come back in and it's one of the advantages actually of living in Seoul or the greater Seoul area is, you know, everyone is still here. Most of the pro players are still here. I think yeah. actually some of them might have moved down to, you know, Busan or Daegu, a couple of the other cities here in Korea. But, yeah, it is a really tight-knit community, more so than you might think unless you start following all these players on, like, Instagram and you see them all grabbing dinner and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's cool to see, of, of course. Yeah. We are, I believe, oh. possibly going into the game. Nice catch. Perhaps. Guys, I think we're oh finally my ready. God, we're doing it we're back all right classic is the blue protoss stats is the red protoss <laughs> stats currently up a number of stalkers he has a significant lead in this game and we were just talking about how in the break classic is going to start throwing some real curveballs on him and that has immediately begun stasis ward here at the main base stalker is blinking forward i'm going to pick off one pylon oh love that defuse right there and Classic is going to blink right back out. Now, just to put you guys right back into the driver's seat, we have these proxy gateways down here in the bottom left. The skins have bugged out a little bit. <laughs> I was about to calm say, down. What was that? Resume from replay. I thought both of them had a gateway proxy <laughs> next to each other for a second. I was like, how is that possible? <laughs> but Classic right now here in the bottom right, he does have more gateways in production. So the soccer count has actually equalized. It is 14 to 14. Stats still with the economic lead. But let's not forget, Classic does have that expansion at the gold base in the bottom left about to come online. In a couple seconds, that will be complete. And I guarantee we'll be seeing some probes recalled in there and his mineral income balloon. But Stats once again getting caught out of position. This third base battery immediately goes down. Pylon might go down as well, but instead actually just gonna take this fight and it's not a bad one here for Classic. This is pretty decent from him. I mean, the misposition from class or from stats, I should say, is the the big player here because he's expecting another blink up into the main base. Not taking a, a triangular third is the you know that lends itself to that weakness where you can get blinked in the main. It's pretty normal on this map to not go for that style. So uh, he obviously expected that going into this game, but now we're gonna get another blink war happening here, and I feel like. Classic is doing a pretty good job here. He's just got so many stalkers. Since he killed the battery earlier on as well, there were no batteries close enough to heal just yet. They did finally get morphed in there, and an overcharge is able to be put down. And now the gold base starts to get kicking in here. This is when stats is, like I was saying before on our break, where he sees this attack from Classic, and even if he defends, he might be like, oh my god, I'm in a such good position because I'm defending a two-base all-in, but he doesn't realize that there's a gold base behind all this. So this is where it gets very, very dangerous for stats. Yeah, the chaos that Classic has just quickly ushered in here after the game resumed. 
There's been so many curveballs here for class er, for for stats. Excuse me. Now I'm getting them a little bit confused. <laughs> it's hard to keep the momentum after that. But stats. We have to say, his upgrades are ahead. The warrior count is still even, although Classic does have that gold base, so a little bit more mineral income coming from him. Is another blink forward into the natural expansion and a very aggressive blink there from Stats. Just gonna use the warp prism to try and micro. And he has plus one charge zealots as well. So not the worst engagement for him as Classic starting to flounder a little bit. The stalker counts have almost equalized and Stats has one dozen zealots too. Yeah, definitely not the worst. It might even just be a really good engagement because that was actually something to really pull the wind out of Classic Sails right there. Even also able to deny the warp ins on the left side as he killed off the pylon. So no more fast warp ins to be able to reinforce this push right here. And since Stats now has charge on his Zealots, that's what was able to really swing that fight, especially since Classic forward blinked into the natural there. And now you can see the punish that could be happening here from Stats as he chases Classic back across the map. He might not even need to know that there was a gold base on this map to begin with because his army is just so big. Those Zealots are such an immaculately strong front line right now, taking all the damage from the Stalkers and Stats He's up at Army Supply. He's pushing here into the natural expansion. He sees the third base, or what is the fourth, coming online. Shield Battery will stall the attack for now. But once that expires, Stats, not only is he oh. up at upgrades, he scouts the gold base in the bottom left. Warp Prism is going to fire in another warp in. Classic now has to worry about an attack, not only here in the bottom left, but in the natural expansion. And Stats is knocking on the door of the round of eight. Blinks right in, the battery's right there as well for him to target if he so wants, but it looks like the overcharge isn't even gonna come through as more and more charge slots swollen through another forward blink out of stats, getting on top of all of these stalkers. Classic forced to blink back behind his mineral line, trying to get any extra surface area advantage that he can, but everything is falling one by one. The charge slots getting on top of all of the stalks. You cannot blink back anymore, Classic. That is gonna be that. Stats advancing first out of this group when I thought he was gonna be out last. I think all the fans watching at home thought Stats was gonna be the first player out as well. And even after all those curveballs thrown, as soon as we were resumed from replay, Stats, he dealt with the punches and as soon as his economy came online, he fought back. And I mean, what an underdog story. Stats, first in a group with Dark, with Bunny, with Classic. I, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. I mean, what a tremendous night from this guy. Yeah, I am just super impressed by this. I, again, just not expected to see this at all. And I mean, just the level of play that he's been showing too. These were not easy games. All right, interview with stats. Well, it wasn't an easy series, and you had a really tough opponent in your group. But you were able to play a lot of late games, you were able to play a slow defensive style. Do you feel like the games went to plan? Yeah, this is the style that I prepared. I feel like I understand Dark's mindset and his gameplay. I knew he would be aggressive against me, so I decided I would try to play a slow defensive style. But I can feel his strength even in the late game. Throughout the games, there were a lot of really close moments. I felt like I was in crisis. But I was able to hang on through to the end. So in the match against Dark, Dark was ahead at several different times. But at what stage during that series did he feel like you had a shot to win the series? And Stats says never. He didn't know until the end that he was actually in a winning position. He constantly thought he was up against the ropes. I feel like Zerg's army composition is really strong. And he was able to stably take the majority of the map. His army control was excellent as well. But in terms of decision making, I, I think I got the edge and I was able to pull him apart. You're asking, it, it feels like both these matchups are very hard for you. And as of late even, you're usually eliminated first in GSL, but today was a great performance. Well, last year, 
I remember I didn't win a single match in GSL. I was eliminated right away, and I was disappointed in myself. I felt sorry for my fans. I knew I was underperforming their expectations. Honestly, it, it made me feel a little bit depressed, but I wanted to fight through it and try my best, and this time I felt like I was finally able to gather myself and show what I'm capable of. So before we wrap up this interview, do you have anything you want to say to your fans? Honestly, even though I made it to the quarterfinals, I, I feel like my play isn't at the level that I want it to be. I need to keep practicing hard. I need to keep grinding. So keep watching. I'm going to show good games for you guys. Keep cheering for me. I will do well in the quarterfinals. Wow. Well, you heard it from stats. That was an incredible day. Guys, it's not over yet. When we get back from this break, Dark versus Bunny, don't go anywhere. This is gonna hurt, but it's not gonna work Listen to my feelings and call it a lesson I hate to kill the moon But I'm just not like you So long, goodbye I think it's about time that I let you know That I feel like The sum of these numbers isn't adding up, yeah If I, if I
Welcome back, everybody. GSL CODES Group B is continuing on. Stats, the first player to advance from this group to, I think, pretty much everyone's surprise. And now in the elimination match, Dark versus Bunny, two of the best GSL players over the past, I don't even know how many years. One of them will be knocked out first in this group. And I, I honestly can't believe it, Gemini. This yeah. has been truly something incredible. Yeah, this is not the loser's match that we were expecting going into this. I mean, I, we thought it was going to be swapped. The winner's match was supposed to be losers, and the losers were supposed to be the winners. I mean, this is kind of crazy that we have a situation now. We have actually found the one universe <laughs> in the infinite multiverses where Dark might actually lose out 0-2. Yeah, we were joking about it coming into this one. It's like, maybe there's a way. I'm like, one of the multiverses, yeah, Dark will Dark will lose. But we're not living in that one, Gemini. Surely not. Surely not. But, I mean, maybe. If anyone in this group can do it, I mean, I guess stats could do it. I, but I, Bunny I guess, could like, also everyone can. do it. I guess Dark just stinks now. He's terrible. I don't know. <laughs> He's washed. Yeah. <laughs> Phone him in, man. Get Rainer and Sarah over here. We need more Zergs, man. Yeah. <sighs> I gotta say, I, I am I am floored by the way this group has played out. Both stats and classic were out of their minds in in the first two series to start off the day, and now Dark versus Bunny. I mean, Bunny, every single GSL, I'm like, okay, this guy is gonna get top eight or he's gonna get top four at this point. Like, if he gets top sixteen, I think that's a bad performance for him. You know, my expectation for Bunny is that he is going to do better than that. Despite the fact that he's kind of been overshadowed by Kieran, by Maru here in Korea, he is one of the best Terran players in the world. Certainly top five, in my opinion. And the fact that either him or the best Zerg in Korea are going to get knocked out now? In the first group, this isn't the round of eight. This is the round of 16. I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. This is absolutely crazy, but... I mean, it's, it's the same thing for Dark as well, though, where it's like, if you you would never expect him to bow out at this stage of the no. tournament. You're always expecting him to get to round of four at least, it feels like. Like, he's the one that's essentially going for the championship every single time. If he's not there, it's like, oh, wow, that's kind of crazy. So, I mean, for him to die out at this point as well is also super crazy. So, this series is... Not ex what we expected, and there's a very good reason for that. And because we are going to be surprised no matter what happens with this. Well, one of these players, Dark or Bunny, will be eliminated from the GSL Code S this season. This is the elimination match. The winner will go on to fight against Classic. Let's get started. Set number one here on Alcyone. Spawning in the top right as the blue Zerg. Bunny in the bottom left, the red Terran. Now going into this game, it's actually kind of interesting because these two players actually play each other in the qualifiers for GSL as well. They did play against each other. And surprisingly, you might uh, be surprised to know that Bunny actually won their their match and that actually qualified him straight into GSL where Dark had to play uh, again in the losers bracket and uh, it was actually a totally crazy series since the, the GSL replays are up on the Patreon which you can get <laughs> by a, a measly $10 subscription if you would like you can get all of those replays yourself to look at I looked at those as well and it was actually incredible on this map specifically was game number one as well and it was an actually insane game it was a 50 minute literally all Minerals mined out game. Dark wow. was able to win at the end. It, it was a total ridiculous game. Literally every single resource mined. So he then morphed everything into spore crawlers and had a 199 maxed army. And eventually won in just the most insane game you've ever seen. Then we go into game number two, Site Delta. You want to know what Bunny does? What does Bunny do? Sends two barracks right across the map in Dark's natural and I would wins do the and same. kills his hatchery. I would, I would do the same thing. I would do the same thing. Game's if I over played. in less than 10 minutes. <laughs> it do? was, I literally laughed out loud when I saw it. I was like, in my head thinking about it, like, there's a possibility that he just does this the next game after that insane game that I've, I've just never seen a game like that. And then he just did it. I was just like, oh my God, that's incredible. That, that's the most Terran thing I've ever seen. Don't work hard, work smart. <laughs> that's Bunny's MO, man. 
You think about the wins per minute right there. Way the higher for, per minute. Way higher for Bunny than the dark. WPM. WPM. Not the words per minute. His typing speed is actually the wins per minute. How many times can he cheese out a Zerg and get a filthy dub? I'm telling you, if I had to play a late game against Dark, I would I'd probably do the same thing. Proxy <laughs> proxy three gates right in the natural expansion. Like, you know what? Do the flower. Four Die gates. by the sword. <laughs> All right, well, first Reaper coming out here for Bunny. Getting some nice kiting here as the Queen, a bit slow to pop. Also slow to attack that Reaper as those Zerglings very bruised there on the high ground. And worth noting, that this is not the same opening we saw from Maru in day one of the GSL last week. This is Eric's on the high ground, just a single Reaper. So not too much in terms of scaling with this infantry, and Dark knows it. So he's pulling out this Queen. And it, Shoo this Reaper away from that third base expansion is you know, any damage you can mitigate on there. You know, should Bunny go for a three, not a three base timing, but a two base timing and try to hone in on the third base of Dark, you want that hatchery to be on as high hit points as possible to buy yourself the maximum amount of time. Now coming to the main base, that's why they will get a drone. So about as vanilla as it gets in terms of Reaper Micro up until we really saw the Yun build start to gain popularity. This was kind of the MO for Reapers for what felt like years, where they would poke in, they would damage some links, and that would be pretty yeah. much all of it. Interesting. And, wow, hey, look at yeah. that. Yeah, I was going to say, Bunny's actually going for something uh, a little bit different. He actually did go for, he's not going for a normal 1113 CC style, which you normally see out of the Terran players. He went actually for a faster second gas, and is now using that to get a fast. Uh, Banshee, he actually had Cloak researching there, but it looks like he canceled it. It looks like he was just trying to mind game in case a, a Ling came in to scout that. So it's not actually going to be for the Cloak, but he is still going for that extra gas income and not a third CC. It's going to be extra barracks on the follow-up after this initial Hellion Banshee pressure. So it looks like he might be trying to gear up himself for some si sort of very heavy two base aggression, which is very on point for Bunny. This is the style that he really does like to employ. It's this very aggressive two base style. It's, it's, he will always try to mix this in in any series, it feels like. So this is definitely uh, on the cards, what we uh, could be expecting. Even more barracks mm -hmm. getting put down there. This is absolute pure bunny right here. Yeah, five barracks, the late engineering bay will be a plus one timing, more likely than not. Oop, with a miscontrol there on Banshee, taking more hull damage than needed. And Dark so far, not really sensing any danger. He's continuing to drone up. He did make a handful of roaches just in case Buddy came out with something crazy like a big Hellion run by. But his drone count is healthy. He's gearing up to take that fourth hatchery. He has started his lair and taking two additional geysers, bringing him up to four gas in total, as well as double evolution chamber. Now, the double Evo is a little bit scary for me, Gemini, because Bunny is gearing up for this two base aggression with five barracks. Should he time out that aggression with plus one, it's going to be a minute before Dark actually has his 1-1 one, one upgrades complete out of those evolution chambers. So the two drones that go into making those structures, the minerals and the gas invested, is going to be less units that Dark has on the board when the push really starts to kick into high gear. It's kind of interesting as well on this map, just because of the fact that the it's kind of unique where the bottom side is essentially all blocked off by minerals or small rocks. And so being able to take a fourth base on that side as dark is, is pretty good for him because it allows then for any sort of really big parade push on two bases from the Terran. To, it's, it's all funneled into one area, right? You can't really easily get to that fourth base. What it does lead, though, is for potential drop play to be coming out before the actual push happens. So that might be what uh, Bunny tries to go for. Or he could just even lift up everything over kill off those little rocks even in between the gold base and still find a way to funnel through to the low ground because there is still that high ground position uh just uh or sorry the low ground position underneath next to those uh, minerals where you can really stick a couple tanks under there and i mean bunny is someone that just absolutely loves going for these early tank plays with the with the, uh, the bio as well so there's a lot of potential for this push dark doesn't have link speed what he just oh started my. link speed failing that's also just started oh he wanted to hold on with his Roach composition, but E does not have Link Speed. I'm not sure how he's going to be able to hold on. There's no way to get the Splash Damage to the Siege Tanks onto the Roaches, so Bunny now pushing up. There is a good arc here on top for Dark. Bios are raining down, not really able to connect with anything except for the Banshee, and the Bios are stimming forward. Dark, his supply is high, but that's because he has 14 Roaches in production. It's not on the board just yet. Drones are getting pulled. Three have already gone down. The Queens get pushed to the side, and Bunny is continuing to stim to win right now. Drones fully surrounding. 
the Marines, and yes, they are on very low HP, the, but the economic damage that Dark is succumbing to right now is massive. I mean, I didn't even notice he didn't have link speed. He's trying to hold on with just these roaches. He is getting on the takes. I mean, to Dark's credit, this control has been phenomenal this far, given the, God, the hand that he has been dealt. He will eventually be able to push this back, but 49 drones now to the 42 SCVs. That was scary. That was a very scary engagement. Now on three tech labs, Bunny is starting to pump Marauders. He's getting concussive shell. I'm amazed that he held. Yeah, that was surprising. That was insane. I thought he was just dead. I he, mean, he looked like he was about to get absolutely wiped off the map. All his drones were getting completely eviscerated. The surround wasn't even a surround. The vials were barely connecting with anything. The tanks stood alive for so long. And now he's actually in not, I mean, um, still lost 20 something drones or whatever, so it's not like the most amazing position ever, but it's like, I mean, he can absolutely leverage this into this late, into later in the game. It's crazy that you see Ling Speed finishing about the same time as 1 1. <laughs> <laughs> I like how Ling Speed finished right as the push was pushed back as well. It was just right. like, ah, now I have Ling Speed after I, everything is dead. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if that actually was. I mean, intentional here for Dark. He was going Roach Ravager anyways as yeah, his defense, but right? It's just so rare to see Link Speed delayed this much, yeah. you know? I mean, if you have to deal with double drops, for instance, it's hard to deal with that with just Roaches, especially if there's some Marauders getting dropped with the Marines as well. It's true. And it's very true. I mean, right now, the Marine and Marauder count is really high. Splash damage is not part of the equation here for Dark, it is just pure muscle. And Bunny playing very conservatively, by the way. He's showing a lot of respect to those Ravagers. Those siege tanks are so far back. So I would love to see the production tab and see exactly how close we are to some typical hooks. In fact, it might not even yeah, be. He, he's going for investors, actually, as the defense. He's going to okay. try to get some investor fungal off on this army. If I mean, if those connect, that is absolutely going to help to destroy this army in com combination with Vials as yeah. well. Could be huge on this Vial. Trying to set up a flank now is Dark going on the left side as well, trying to get some of those Vials Ooh. to connect. Gets a few little shots, but not really anything super huge just yet. The first fungal does get dodged. Only a few bio units getting hit by that one. That's a very crucial micro uh, situation there for Bunny to be able to win out on this nice little counterattack. Should interrupt things for a little bit, but the third base is actually under siege here. It's gonna get killed off, sniped by the bio before the transfuses can come down. And now Bunny finding a situation to really push into this in this uh, this area here. Yeah, I mean, the. The bio is very bruised, but Dark, his economy is basically back at the Stone Age. He's hardly mining off that fourth base at all. Mineral income is really suffering here as War Biles rain down. And maybe there is a world that he's able to stabilize, but this composition is so flimsy. It is mostly Ravager. There are only a handful of Roaches, although reinforcements are on the way. And Bunny is, it's all, we're about getting to the point where Bunny is going to need to lift up his command center and draw yeah. it down to the third base because with 40 SCVs, he is not mining that efficiently, but let's hold that thought right now. Bio stimming four vials, basically scattered all the way across. Every single one of them gets dodged. One siege wow. tank does go down, but army supply is still favoring the Terran. And when Zerg is on Roach Ravager, that is not what you want to see. Yeah, this is getting really tricky here for Dark. The Biles really need to find some kind of connection. And a couple of those medevacs are very low, but they are also low on energy. Mm. And so every stim now from the Terran player is going to get more and more difficult to deal with. Plus two also about to finish here, but he doesn't even really have any melee units for that to, uh, to do anything with. So it's not really that big of a deal that that is finishing. It's really all on these Ravagers trying to get these connections, forcing the Terran player away as much as possible. Nice connections there, finally getting a couple of those medevacs, but is that a step too forward as Buddy now just goes right in and will take this first game versus Dark? And Buddy just going for the jugular right there. And I mean, part of the reason why that fell apart for Dark and that final hold is because the third hatchery went down. And when that hatchery goes down, yes, plus two melee attack was done. He didn't have the larva. The queens have to be in the front. They have to assist in the fight. They have to try and pick off Benedax. They have to transfuse. They have to tank. They're not injecting, and he's basically on three hatch. You know, maybe he had one or two queens in the main of the natural getting some injects off, but I guarantee in that kind of high stress situation, it's not 100% of the time. It is not optimal. And so Dark investing all these resources in, you know, plus two melee attack and really not getting an opportunity to use it. Same with centrifugal hooks there on the banelings. I don't even know if we saw a single baneling that map. I mean, there were two. I saw two, and they didn't really do anything. <laughs>
I mean, Bunny just really putting him up against the ropes, and whether it was intentional or not, that Ling speed was delayed so long in that game number one, I doubt we're gonna see the same approach here from Dark in game number two, as now it is match point. Dark, one map loss away from being eliminated in the round of 16. I can't believe I'm saying it, Gemini. Let's see if Bunny can win this next game and book his ticket to the final match. on the top left. Playing for Talon Esports, it is dark, bottom right. Bunny, playing for, what is he playing? Is it Mystery Gaming or did he leave that team? I can't actually remember. There's so many team changes, I have a hard time. I have is a hard time keeping up with it, man. Right now? I actually forgot to look. Wow, what a terrible caster I am, State. Jesus, what am I, what am I doing here? <laughs> forgot one team. Oh. The golden rule is if you don't know, you don't say anything. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, it's all right. Ooh, a pool first, though, out of dark as well. Oh, yeah, mm. it is a pool first. Wait, what's going on here? Might be expecting some kind of two racks, because this is the map. Also, Site Delta was game two. That's the one mm. where he also did the, he did the two racks behind the, the natural. You redeemed yourself already. Ha, ha, ha. I'm so <laughs> knowledgeable. Look at that. Is he going to check for it? Oh, he doesn't check for it. That would have been so cool if he did. I mean, look but at he's the, going pool first anyway, so it isn't It's pool really first, to, I guess. and also the overlord patterns are really good for scouting for proxy barracks, I must say. True. I feel like the majority of the locations you would proxy in, these overlords would probably find them. I just find it funny, though, because it was like literally behind his mineral line in the natural where where the two barracks were. and he. Oh, is that where they yeah, were? That's, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> they were literally behind. It was on this this, this spawn, so it was behind like by the gases or whatever. Yeah. That's where that's where the, the two barracks were. So, but he still <sighs> he didn't even bother checking, even though he, he went, <gasps> oh, rav oh. Ravager. Let's go. Roach Ravager. All right. A nice, spicy early all-in. These two players saw that tech delay and was like, hey, don't worry, guys. I got you covered. We're getting this right back on track. <laughs> we got a timetable. We're getting some quick games <laughs> to counteract that, and here we go. This is not the German train system. Things will things <laughs> will run on time. <laughs> I swear. Yeah, so I wonder how committed this is going to be for Dark. I wouldn't be surprised if this was the kind of situation where... I mean, it's dark, so I guess I, I wouldn't be surprised by anything with how we decided to play it. But this might just be, you know, a couple of Ravagers, a couple of Roaches, biling down the wall, sieging the natural expansion, and macroing behind it. Because, you know, given the new Cyclone, should Bunny follow up with Cyclones? That does really well against a lot of early aggression. Zerg can throw your way, especially, you know, the all-ins. It's harder to make that happen as a Zerg player compared to previous patches. and. So I, I'm not sure Dark is going to risk it all here in the elimination match on match point. I'm expecting this to just mostly be Roach Ravager pressure with droning behind it, and he's already starting three drones. Yep. I'm so smart. You are just the smartest person in the world. God, are you even a Protoss player? God, I could have sworn you were reserved by that. <laughs> Good lord. Look at these two Protoss players analyzing the crap out of this TVZ right here. God, we are so good. I mean, it's dark. You might as well be casting a Protoss player, to be honest with you. This guy is... <laughs> this is a very Protoss strategy that we have thrown out here by this Zerg player, that Man, is for sure. He's got a lot of tricks under his sleeve. But, I mean, Bunny with pretty much the perfect response right now. The bunker, it is late, so not ideal exactly. But with two Cyclones already underway, you know, with perfect control there, dodging Biles, he should be able to handle this. And Bark, Dark... I almost called Bark. Dark... Bark. Bark. <laughs> Bark. Bark. <laughs> He really wants to take He's down this reactor. up that ramp. <laughs> he really wants to take down this reactor before the second cyclone pops. And he might have had a chance for it, but repair coming through in time. That cyclone a little bit low on HP, but Bunny with some nice conservative micro able to keep it alive. That should pretty much, you know, be the nail in the coffin here on this attack because the cyclone just so good at thwarting this kind of early aggression play. Man Center will get lifted, but behind it, you know, Dark Key is not all in. You might be looking at this and thinking, okay, Bunny is going to finish parrying this attack, and then the game will be his to win, but not quite. This is pretty much going as Dark is expecting it. He's getting a lot of idle time here on these SCVs. The second Command Center, notably, not only is it not mining from, but also there is no SCV production, so Dark is also inching ahead in work production as this comes along. And taking down the reactor is just the icing on the cake here. Poor Dark. This is also pretty nice micro oh, out, of, out of Dark. I was so close. <laughs> I was I was so certain that Cyclone was going down, man. That bile 
Good micro from both players. Yeah, that was almost like a frame-perfect dodge right there from Bunny. This guy's been yeah. playing a lot of Tekken or something. I don't know. <laughs> He almost sniped it earlier with just the Ravagers and Roaches attacking the Cyclone, too. He's been yeah. keeping these Ravagers alive for about as long as possible. At this point, you probably should just be coming home with them. I'd be amazed if that bile actually landed, but uh, yeah, it should definitely come on home with these. No, are they suicide them. going to survive? I mean, those miles were so perfect at the time. Bunny basically had to dodge every single one of them to keep moving across the map. And yeah, this is a great game for Dark thus far. You know, he has 42 drones to 34 SEVs. He's continuing to power back at home, getting his lair, taking an additional hatchery. And although this isn't quite the most standard game, standard is not Dark's element. So oh, yeah. he is very happy to be playing from this position. And I mean, that's even to say that he, he doesn't... Bunny has no tricks up his sleeve. The entire hand has been shown because he needed to show everything really to Stop the attack that Dark was throwing at. I don't know why I keep blending words together. This is longer Barks than GSL. Bark this, this is longer than GSL usually goes. I woke up too early this morning, man. I am. Uh, it's fine. Man. I am too aged for this. You're too old. You're such a boomer gamer. You you lost a classic in pro league 20 years ago, and now it's all coming back. Oh, I understand. He's still in the he's still in the group, and you're like, oh god, no, he's not dead yet. All right, well, funny with a nice little cute move here. Landing this Viking, trying to stop as much money as he possibly can. The Viking will go home and just kind of taking inventory here of both players' situations. Dark with really a healthy economy going back into the Roach Ravager composition. So it seems like this is kind of the style he wants to play here against Bunny. And notably, he's also not going into melee attack as he did in the previous game, this time emphasizing range. So he is really leaning into the Roach Ravager this time around. Yeah, I mean, it is really his bread and butter. Like, yeah, like you said, he doesn't really play that standard when it comes to, to, to it. Like, you know, think you think of Serral, you think of Rainer as these super solid standard Zerg, uh, you know, trendsetters, essentially. Dark is really just kind of out here doing his own thing sometimes. And I mean, Roach Ravager, yes, is, you know, other Zergs do that. It's not like the most unheard of thing in the world, but he really does love going for it more often than not. It is really something he likes. He loves going in for that mid-game Infester, the very fast Infesters compared to normal. So, uh, you know, this is something that just, like, is, is pretty comfortable for him. He's, he's feeling very good in this game, I imagine. He gets the early damage. He de delays the natural from mining for so long. Now he's able to set himself up pretty freely, just kind of batting away the light pressure of a Viking here, a Banshee there, and just kind of setting himself up pretty decently right now. Bunny, on the other hand, is the one that's going to have to now find a way to really crack the egg of Dark at this point because he has not really found much of a counter damage after that initial push, and so it's going to be up to him to find out what he can do. Is it, though? Because Dark's been sitting at 66 drones for a quick minute here, and there are a lot of roaches on yeah, the map right is, now, Gemini. It's quite a lot. I think he's just going to try and pulverize this third base location. So now he has to decide if he wants to defend the third. The or Banshee not. hasn't seen it yet, even. Bunny does not know this is coming. In a perfect world, Bunny would have that Banshee attacking Ravagers right now and basically putting a clock on this attack. Oh, he has no, no clue. The Banshee is still idle in the middle of the map, but Dark moved around on the side. He's coming in right now. Biles dropping down. Now, Bunny, he is stimming forward, but the first Siege Tank has already fallen to the Biles. The Roaches, they have plus one armor. They are tanking this right here in the front. As he's getting pulled, the second tank is also going to fall. This is pretty clinical here for Dark, but I mean, Bunny is still able to push it back on the back end of it. Oh, only losing wow. six SCVs in this attack. There's a lot of roaches still coming across on the reinforcements here, though. So it's still not over, but I am actually pretty impressed with how well Bunny was able to defend that in the end. Yeah, especially considering he basically got caught with his pants down. He had no idea this was moving across the map, but... The tank count did get reset down to two. A third siege tank just popped. A couple of SCPs did go down. And notably also, the Banshee died to a bile during all of that. And so that's a lot of sustained damage that Bunny could have uncontested that is basically out of the equation. And that means the Dark has a little bit more of a window here to get something done. But this time, coming in from this angle, siege tank placement just a little bit too good. Yeah, I mean, delaying the, the, the gas mining is also still really annoying, though, for Bunny. It's going to delay any sort of extra uh, tech he's going to try to go for, of course. the Like you said, the tank, out, get, tank count getting reset is very important. Going against Roach Ravager, you really want to make sure you have that back line of tanks set up, so that way, if they do try to dive onto you, then you're just constantly shelling them with those tank shots from afar. So very important to try and keep those alive as the game goes on here. Bunny now trying to get oh. some more 
pressure off into the middle of the map. We'll catch a couple random Ravagers and get a giant highway of creep clear. That was actually great. One creep tumor only was uh, spreading all of that, so it gets all of that cleared. And the, the queen count doesn't seem like it's super high either, so it's not going to be able to get replenished super easy here. But Dark is just going to go right back in again, trying to go for another attack here. Will Bunny be able to defend this time? Yeah, there is not a lot of defense there in the third base. A lot of the forces for Bunny are here in the actual expansion. That's actually some quite good position because it means that he's able to isolate a lot of these Ravagers on the top side. And the third base is sustaining a lot of damage. Dark trying to break through the top, and he actually might have done it. That's another siege tank going down. There's only one siege tank on the board here for Bunny. And what looked like it might be a good engagement on the top side, suddenly the dominoes just start falling after that third base collapses under the pressure. And Dark, with just pure power, is getting so much damage done right now. What a swift and just precise attack that was from Dark. De got defended the initial time, was like, you know what, no, I'll just drone up a little bit more, just get a few more Ravagers. I'm just going to do it straight again anyway. You were able to defend, but not enough for me to then, to dissuade me from doing it anymore. So he goes back in yet again, jumps on the army, completely negates the third base, and now he's just going to be able to in be in full control any time that we try to go back down onto this third base as Bunny. Dark is just going to punch, uh, punish, sorry, jump right on top of him yet again. Yeah, I'm not sure Bunny's able to move down this ramp and try and secure this. This is almost a pure Ravager army, by the way. This looks yeah. ridiculous, but the Biles, Dark is one of the best in the world at landing Biles. That command center very close oh. to going down. Just a smidgen of HP left. Now there is a, do a drop in the top part of the map here for Bunny, so a little bit of counterattack is going on, but the third command center is going to fall. What? In the end, what does it matter that you damage this hatchery, that you kill maybe a handful of drones? It eventually gets cleaned up and you can't thwart this army. Yeah, this is looking real bad for Bunny here. I mean, he's going to be down over almost 70 supply at this point. He's going to try to go for some kind of counterattack, forcing these Ravagers back as the reinforcements aren't quite grouped up just yet. We'll be able to get some of them, but what is he really expecting to do with this when all of the Roaches are still going to be coming back from the other side? Dark is about to be maxed yet again, and Bunny can barely get over 100 supply. This is an insane arc on the top of this ramp. As soon as those Ravagers pop. All right, let's see Bunny trying to push forward. The huge Lynx around coming in from the flank. Able to surround one of the Siege Tanks. Biles raining down. <laughs> All the tanks in the front do fall. And with it, Bunny's hopes of winning this game. Dark has tied the series up one to one. Clinical. Clinical from Dark. That was the type of game that we want to see out of him. If you are a Dark fan, wanting to see him continue on in this and not just bow out 0 2 in the round of 16, this is what you are wanting to see. Very nicely done. We want to see more of that type of aggressive play out of Dark. He is that type of player that really likes to go for those types of weird strategies. He'll throw in a Roach Ravager opener here and there. Even if he usually does it in the mid game, he'll do it right from the beginning as well. And it caught Bunny off guard. It was able, he was able to control the game going on into the later stages and just do a precise, clean attack. And Bunny couldn't do anything. Bunny was close to holding, but close doesn't cut it here at the GSL. Now both of these players, Dark and Bunny, are one match win away. The winner of this upcoming map is going on to the winner's match for a chance at redemption. The loser is out of the Code S. And again, this is Dark versus Bunny. I still can't believe Dark is in the loser. In the losers match, out of this world, just a, I don't know. It, it, it's so wild that we're even still possibly saying that Dark could be bowing out 0-2 right now. I mean, that game was absolutely excellent, and it was exactly what we needed to see, like I was saying. But you know, it's still it's still just one map that he has to lose. Anything could happen at this point. It could be an unscouted two racks that just you know, just like the the game I was talking about before, that just completely shuts him out and throws him out of the GSL. Anything could happen at this point. And so Dark really needs to make sure that he doesn't fumble this because a lot of people, a lot of Zergs are looking for him in Korea to be like that leading Zerg player, essentially, to bring them, you know, some solid wins, some hope, etc. So, you know, it's a bit scary if you're a Dark fan. I'm hearing now from production that it seems like there might be some kind of sound issue right now on the YouTube channel. Apparently some viewers are saying that they don't have any sound, so hopefully we're not just barking into the void right now <laughs> through <laughs> this. But uh, yeah, the GSL, they are aware of it. They are working on it. We're probably going to take a short break and see if we can get that issue resolved. And that'd be unfortunate if they can't hear us at all. That's like, you know, kind of the whole point of this whole thing. They're supposed to hear what we're saying. <laughs> that'd be really tragic if they couldn't do that. So Yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice to get fixed. But uh, I think we might actually 
not be going to a break. We might just be going right back into this next game as the lights have dimmed and the players are looking like they're ready. It looks like Dark was having some problem with uh, some of his audio as well, but that got resolved pretty quickly as well. So, Man, what is going on, on today? In. I must I say, know. we usually have no tech issues at all. This thing, as you said, we were in a tight ship, but were you sabotaging? Were you sabotaging the computers before you came in, Gemini? All <laughs> part of my grand plan. All I right, guys. Final match here in the losers match. Loser of this map is out of the GSL. Let's get to it. Bottom left, the blue Zerg Dark here in the losers match against his opponent, Bunny, the red Terran in the top right. I, I do sound like a broken record, but this is just, I, I cannot believe this way, the way that this group has panned out, frankly. The, the fact that one of these players is gonna be knocked out here in the round of 16 after some stunning international performances, after frankly dominating the GSL over the past couple of years. It's been quite a shakeup, but to start off a GSL season, you know, sometimes it's those kind of shakeups that really lead to a fun storyline. I, I think back to, you know, GSL last year when Mar was the first player eliminated in oh, Group yeah. A. Yep. Even losing to Scarlet, that was <laughs> you know, something that you do not expect. And it is sometimes fun when the top dogs get knocked out early, like a Maru, like a Dark, like a Bunny. Hey, man, like that Stats Dark series was all super fun, if you want to ask me. I'm telling you. I had a fun time watching that. Sometimes, like, for these other players that it feels like, you know, they flounder sometimes the round of eight or even the round of 16 to suddenly rise up and take down these top dogs and start to fight their way deep into the playoffs. I mean, that is, those are the kind of moments that these players will eventually look back as you know, the shining times in their career. It's the kind of thing that you carry with you, you for a lifetime. So, love to see shakeups like this. Love an underdog story. Even though, I mean, Dark and Bunny, one of these players getting eliminated just still blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, I wonder what, you know, I always think about this too, because like I was, you know, I, I played a lot of video games. I was the <laughs> one Did that, you, Gemini? I, I, I wanted to be a little pro gamer, you know? There was a little pro gamer me at one point trying to, you know, go full time. And I'm just like always thinking like, God, what would it actually feel like to win a tournament? You know I, I mean? couldn't tell you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you didn't need to throw yourself on the bus. I wasn't going in that direction, all right? You, you, could, you didn't have to do that, but you know, sure, anyways. But uh, no, it's like I can't even imagine how much it would like what it would feel like. The, just the the raw emotion you must feel, mm. being able like on the stage, everyone just like going absolutely nuts, it, just knowing that like you did it. You're like at the end. You don't have another match you have to play. You don't have to, an, another series to prep for. You just you just did it. You won the whole thing. Like God, that must feel so crazy. I think all of us are envy envying the life <laughs> lifestyles of these guys on stage right now a little bit. All right, let's see how these openings are shaking out. Double Hellion opening here for Bunny after the early command center. Reaper not able to get too much done. Interesting to me that Bunny hasn't really deviated from this opening at all so much this series. He loves the Hellions early, occasionally Cyclones. I mean, that frankly might have just been a response to the Road Travager that pushed him there in game number two and oh. actually gearing up with a Marauder. It's going to be Hellbat Marauder. Yeah, it might be. He actually did this as well recently, I saw. Uh, I think it was also the Sars War qualifier last night where he was doing this against, uh, I think it was Solar that, that he was playing against in that in that series, where, yeah, it's with one Viking as well, <laughs> and he's going to go for some really cheeky attack. It actually ended up working. It didn't look like it was going to work, and then it ended up working anyway. So we're looking to see, there's the concussive shells. We're looking to see where that armory is getting placed down. I mean, if he doesn't put it down, I'm going to lose my mind. I love that little tiny tactic by Bunny, by the way. He canceled the Marauder and restarted it just to be absolutely certain the Overlord could not scout mm. that he is going for the strategy. He wants to keep this as secret as possible. Just as you said, Gemini, Armory underway right now. And we think back to game number one and game number two. What was the composition that Dark was running in both of those games? Road Travager. What are Marauders pretty good at? Killing roaches, man. What That's are Hellions their good job. at? <laughs> Killing Lings. Everything's covered with the strategy. Surely it's a perfect one. 
Surely nothing can happen. He's got the perfect counters to everything, right? I wouldn't go so far as to say it's something <laughs> like a blind counter, but I, I, in terms of build order selection, if this is Bunny adapting to the playstyle that Dark has been showcasing over this entire series, I really like this as a tactic. I mean, that's the kind of adjustment on the fly that you expect from a top player. And so for Dark right now, he's at 39 Ooh. drones. He's not droning much more. He's actually going for a Roachling counterattack of his own. So both players right now are building these armies, trying to gear up for their own attack. And here we go. Buddy through the first one coming in. The Hellbats are transforming. Force two queens get immediately bopped right there in the center. But there's only a handful of Marauders with this one. Now I guarantee they are shifting down on these Roaches, trying to get as much damage done. Will Dark have enough? Even on only 39 drones, it's looking very close right now, Gemini. Yeah, this is actually extremely close here. The, usually you want to try to get the Hellbats on top of the drone lines to be able to really de uh, deny the, the Zerg's economy, but there's so many units out right here that it, Dark has already destroyed his own economy to defend the push to begin with. So you want to try to clear out the Roaches, get on top of everything later. That's what he's trying to do now is funny, but I mean, Dark is defending this. He did go, I, I mean, uh, he must have pieced something together. Whether or not maybe he was trying to attack in the first place, may, maybe up to debate, but he might have sniffed something out as well to be able to defend, uh, to prepare for this. And he just had so many units ready that he just destroys the push and is now able to walk across the map himself. The Banshee on the back end from Bunny is a great play though, because there's not going to be any anti air to deal with that right now. Oh. But it's still going to be a lot of units here from Dark. He's forced to run away from this natural. Yeah, the bunker isn't done just yet. And also a little bit of unfortunate positioning here for Bunny as the Hellbats are in the back and the Marauders in the front. This natural expansion taking a ton of damage right now. But I mean, these are slow roaches. These Marauders can kite for days on this army and the reinforcements for Dark. There aren't many coming. He's queuing up a couple more drones, a couple more links. He might be just fully committing to this attack. I, yeah, I mean, he's got a couple of drones coming in right at the back end there, uh, so he might be having second thoughts about how much he wants to commit here. But, I mean, w was that really what the damage he was hoping for for that counterattack? I don't I, think it so. It felt like he really wanted to get some huge counter blow. At least, like, force the CC to lift and, like, fully evacuate or something, because I, I don't feel like that was what he wanted. Right. And in the well, later stages of that attack, he was still building roaches and links too. It, yeah. it felt like he wanted to keep committing, and then just the attack completely floundered on the front line. And really the surprising thing for me too is that Bunny held on defensively back at home with a third command center underway. Mm. So his economy is about to be very online. He's adding two additional barracks. He's adding two engineering bays. And with a lair only just now, you know, close to completion, with no evolution chambers on the map just yet, no upgrades underway here for Dark. After that attack, frankly, failed so hard, Bunny is gonna have a huge window with plus one infantry weapons and plus one armor to punish the aggression of Dark. I mean, even just these two Banshees are already finding use of that window as well, even splitting them up here to keep both of them alive away from the Queens. Excellently done by Bunny. Oh, just barely. Ah, oh, just loses that one just at the end. Nice try to try and keep both of them alive, but unfortunately will lose one out anyway. But great counter damage already, getting six drones with those two Banshees. Excellently done by him. And like you said, the third CC is already finished, so that's going to start pumping out SCDs. That's going to start getting mules out as well. So the economy for Bunny is actually going to be looking pretty decent here. And with zero anti-air, except for some of those queens, he's free to go forward with these drops as well. Yeah, Bunny is going to have potentially a 30 or 45 second window with plus one infantry weapons before Dark is able to start slowing him down and matching on those upgrades. So I, I, I think that is where Bunny is going to try and find his timing if he wants to go for some kind of game ending blow. But also in the position that he's in after killing additional drones with those Banshees, after getting you know, pretty substantial damage done, even if it was just defending the attack back at home, if Bunny wanted to, he could also just kind of hunker down and play for a macro game. It really is his game to play at this point. Yeah, I mean, he's doing what he can here with these medevacs and the, the Marauders, and we're not trying to deny creep here and there, trying to just keep Dark contained with whatever he can. You don't want to let the Zerg just willingly spread everything on the map. You want to keep it as contained as possible, make it a little bit difficult for the Zerg player. And like I said before, the anti-air isn't really there, so it's very easy for Bunny to really go for those types of moves wherever he pleases. The thing is that he might be wanting to use his uh, his CC energy a bit more for mules. We'll drop a scan here to get this nice large bit of creep tumor clearing here. So that's actually a lot. Doesn't quite get that one, but overall still pretty decent. But 
you do kind of want to still get some of that uh, mule income coming, so he might not have too many scans to, to throw around here and there to really clear out a lot of the creep, but that one was actually uh, a well-placed one, getting a lot of creep tumors. But, I mean, the, the, the game will pretty stabilize at this point. It's going to be going later on into the game. We've got the extra tech coming in, the infestation pick coming for Dark. So he's likely, yeah, he's already got the infestors on the way as well. So going for that normal st uh, Roach Ravager infestor play that he really loves so much in this mid game. Got to say, I am scared for Dark, though, because he, he knows that he's a little bit up against the ropes, and there is a lot on the line. If he loses this game, he is out of the GSL code S. And you really don't want to over drone and get eliminated from a push. So he's been staying on a relatively low drone count. He's now worked his way all the way up to 72, but he's done it very incrementally. He's been working out a couple of units here and there. And what does he have to show for it? He has 88 army supply to 111. And a lot of Dark's army is in Roaches and Ravagers, which are not very supply efficient. So I think if we want to see Dark win this game, if we want to see him hold on against this push, he is going to need some miracle fungals from those two investors because Bunny's army is massive right now and Dark is actually going for a huge counterattack. Yeah, this has got to do a lot of damage here for Dark if he wants to find this. And Bunny retreating Whoa. with this as well. That's exactly what Dark wants to see here as a lot of units getting pulled back. Because this is, I mean, this is a lot of links. He mm -hmm. absolutely needs to respect this. Bunny was not planning on going all in with this push. He wanted, he has a fourth base getting set up. He wants to continue with this game. He's not trying to just kill Dark. If he does kill it, that's great, obviously. But... He needs to come back to defend against that. Nice fungal Ooh. picking off some of those units there. Oh, nice little split off as even though they're very slow on that movement with the fungal, he was still able to dodge that vial set right there. So very nicely done. Dark doing his best here to stay into this game. That was a crucial run by that needed to happen for him to not just instantly die. All right, another attack coming in here for oh, Bunny. Fungal should be able to catch all that bio. That's a Pretty big chunk of army getting taken out right here. And I mean, it kind of feels like Dark is trying to chip away at a mountain in terms of working hard against this army. But these are the trades that he needs to make if he wants to come back in this game because Buddy right now is sitting at 140 army supply. 2-2 two, two is about to finish. He already has plus two infantry weapons. Those siege tanks have plus one vehicle weapons as well. So his army is such oh. a punch. Failings come in, Buddy does spot it. So he shouldn't be losing too many SCVs oh. at all. Oh, in fact, burrowing there under the siege Did he tank. realize? Yeah, Dark is trying every trick in the book Did right now. Did he realize now. that happened? I don't know if he was actually paying attention to see those things burrow right there. He might have been looking at the front with his army. He's going to try to go into this natural, natural here. Does lose some of those bio units. Luckily, those medevacs weren't too far forward to die to those bios. Okay, thankfully, he was looking at those bane links at that third base. So he does not just suddenly lose 20 SEVs to them. Very nicely done. But now the Vipers are out. So we'll be able to get blinding clouds off nice. on these tanks, allowing Dark to to try and get into this engagement here. Doesn't quite force him away just yet, but still, I mean, I actually, I don't even think these trades are even that good for him at, at this point. Oh, those bailing hits are really Ooh. good though, Gemini, and he gets even more. Dark somehow is finding a way to win these engagements where Buddy has eclipsed him in army supply and for the first time in what feels like minutes, Dark is starting to stabilize back at home. Now 86 army supply to 87, it is dead even and Dark is starting to unlock all the high-tech units. He's getting his Vipers out. He is getting his Infestors out. He has done everything he has needed to do to chip away at the Terran army. And finally, he has thwarted it. There are no more Siege Tanks on the map. The army is pure Marine Marauder Medivac. I, I can't believe he actually got those Banley connections. That was like, that felt so out of left field. It felt like he was getting whittled down so quickly. And I mean, Bunny was on top of the micro the entire time in all those engagements. To suddenly then just get hit in the face with all those banelings is, uh, like you said, it just completely stunted everything. And then the bile is on top of the tanks. This is looking now quite drastic for Bunny. It really has to find some extra damage here and force off some of these bases to get killed off. I mean, it is good for him though that he was able to kill that base before that engagement even happened. So it has forced Dark still onto an awkward economy, but he is someone that thrives in that position. He is able to maneuver these weird late game army or late game situations with strange armies, with low econ. So this will still be somewhat in the comfort zone of Dark. And so it's definitely catering more towards him at this point. But Bunny needs to find something now to go into this later game. Dark now finally close to max supply, throwing down an ultraless cavern, trying to gear up for his next transition. 
As the game quiets down a little bit, Buddy only sitting on 51 workers, so once again, it seems like he is trying to just amass an army. He's no longer producing SCVs. He's not going for 3-3. I hesitate to call this at all in, but Bunny is trying to end the game right now. He does not want to let Dark get out of control. He knows how good Dark is in the late game. As you said, Gemini, it's what thwarted him in the qualifiers in game number one there. And now he's up against the ropes again, and Dark with a great surround able to pick off a good number of that buy or at least damage it. And once that Ultralist Den is underway and Dark has every single tool in his tool belt at its disposal, I'm just really liking the way this, ge this game is shaping up for him. And it's, I'm still dumbfounded that by the fact that he was able to work his spellcasters and his army control well enough to stabilize oh. from a position where he was almost dead. I mean, look at this. He even catches the medevac with Fungal. This is the new patch Fungal. It doesn't have the range it used to have. I mean, Dark is the best spellcasting sir in the world, yeah. in my opinion. He is so good at Absolutely. you know handling these really finicky, awkward armies. He just does it so incredibly well. And now Buddy's at the ropes. This might be his last hurrah. He's at 50 SCVs, not going for 3-3, not going for additional vehicle weapons. He needs to win the game with this army or at least do devastating damage if he wants this game to continue on. Yeah, I mean, he has not made a single SCV since some of those other ones died earlier on in the game. He has been going full throttle to get the biggest army possible. Ling counterattack yet again, perfectly timed by Dark, right as Bunny is trying to siege up and get a forward position. Ling's backstabbing, Bane Ling's backstabbing, forcing Bunny to come back home. It is killing more SCVs, which, you know, usually you would think about, oh, wow, that's so great. He's killing so much economy. But that still does also mean that Bunny's army is going to get even larger. So, yes, that's very good for a long game. But if Bunny can still find a very decisive attack with this gigantic army, he still has some chance. Bunny working his way towards 160 army supply. This early in the game is something we do not see very often here in a TBZ. And really, as you said, it will be the, the decisive engagement that decides who is going to be winning and who is going to be going home out of the GSL Code S. And Bunny, it seems like he's getting wise for these counterattacks. He has thrown down a sensor tower at the Triangle Third, has some Marines rallied there for protection. Planetary on the fourth base as well. And now that he might be stabilizing a bit at home, this might give Bunny the leverage he needs to really start to pressure through the front. And Dark, are you going to commit to this attack? That is a scary angle to attack into. But if you don't, it means that Bunny can actually go for this high yield base. That was kind of scary there for a second. I really thought Dark was just going to YOLO it into that choke point, and I was a bit scared for him there. But just using it, again, to delay and, and distract for another lane counterattack, killing more SCVs, lifting two orbitals out of the ground as well. There's so little income. Right now for Bunny, this fourth base is really doing the heavy lifting here in terms of his economy. He's on 24 SCVs, but his army size is at an insanely large amount. It's at 160. Oh. Nice pick up there, keeping all those things alive. Oh my, but some of these medevacs might even just die from the from the uh, Viper. What, what the, what is that called? What is blind? Don't put me on the spot. What? Is, what <laughs> parasitic what? bomb. Parasitic <laughs> bomb. Oh my god. How can I even forget what that's called? I mean, he, Bunny is lucky though that there wasn't a Fungal there. I actually don't think there are any more Infestors laid on the map, so that is one less Spellcaster Dark has available as gas is hard for him to find after you're losing the high Vespian gas yield base there in the center of the map as Bunny just continues to posture here in the middle. Still not producing SCVs. Bunny is down to 18 workers at home. I mean, this is almost unheard of in a TVZ in this stage, and yet he is still showing so much patience here in the middle of the map. He's waiting for the perfect opportunity to fight because he knows it just takes one moment. Now Dark moving a little bit too far forward there. He does get nice parasitic bombs. Actually, he's going to get a lot of medevacs. They're all clumping up. Oh. So many medevacs just went down. Yeah, that's going to be pretty big for Dark here as Bunny does take the opportunity, though, to walk over and kill the base. Doesn't want to step too far forward, though. That high ground position could be very difficult to engage up into. This is where he lost the fight last time as well. The exact same spot It's going to happen again as the Banelings get ridiculous shots on all of the Marines. Bunny forced back again. Oh my, it's the same exact spot. It was exactly the same. <laughs> History repeats itself yet again here as Bunny cannot get up this ramp. Bunny, it feels like no matter what army he assembles, no matter how low his worker count goes, he cannot crack the shell of Dark. He tried pushing up that choke point. The Ultras and the Banes ate him alive. And here comes Dark yet again. 
Blinding Cloud on the Siege Tanks. The Ultras are pushing Bunny into a quarter. He's going to have to lift up and try and get out of here. Maybe go into the main base. No, just retreating back home. A little bit of indecision there. Finally now going into the main, but Bunny is sitting at 93 supply. I think Dark has done it. What what an absolutely crazy game here. Just, just like the most insane all-in of all time. Like the most long all-in. Dark finally finding it at the end there. Does not bow out. Wow. Still alive in this group. That was an unbelievable match. I mean, Bunny going down to, what was it, 14 SCVs at the end there? He had no and workers. still being almost maxed. That was absurd. What a series. We are getting treated today, man. Tasteless is missing out back here. <laughs> what a nerd, man. What a nerd missing out on these games. Oh, I, I, I just can't believe he tried going up the same spot again. And it was just like, I mean, the amount of patience you have to have as the Terran in that position is absurd. So, like, you have to get forced eventually. And it's just like, the, all it takes is that one moment. You just break it that one time, and suddenly you try to go for it, and you're like, oh, crap, I can't actually get up this position. And you just get flooded by the Banelings, and it all comes tumbling down. Just unfortunate for Bunny that he just wasn't able to have enough patience. Unfortunately, loses out. Guys, when we get back, the final match of Group B, Dark versus Classic. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you soon. So hold on to the highs while you're all right Cause you know you're gonna come down Just a matter of time and you will find Everything comes back around Comes back around, comes back around Back around Comes back around Comes back around
Welcome back, everybody. It has been a long night. But at last, we have arrived at the final match of GSL Group B 
Classic versus Dark. One of these players is going to the round of eight. One of them is going home. Imagine if we get two for it off again. Imagine. Oh, imagine. I can't. Just, just think about it's it. It's beyond the scope. Just think. Imagine how amazing that was. Beyond the scope oh my God, of my so imagination. Cool. But really, I mean, Stats and Classic, they have both showed up today. Stats had some incredible PBZ against Dark earlier. I know Classic was in the wings watching that play out. The thing is, Stats did kind of play his own unique style, really heavily on, leaning on the mothership, playing a lot of late games. As for Classic, I, I feel like just knowing him as a player, that doesn't play to his strengths. He seems like one of the Protoss who just has a bit more of a killer instinct that wants to hit timing attacks, that wants to go into your face and, I mean, frankly, destroy you. But we'll see what's going to happen. Classic versus Dark. Let's get to it. Classic already defeating Bunny. We're falling to stats in the winner's match, going up against Dark, who so far in this GSL hasn't won a match against Protoss, Gemini. Sample size of one, but... <laughs> Protoss has broken, nerf it! <laughs> get the balance council on the phone. We need to get, we need to solve this problem of Protoss winning a game. I like it though, this is refreshing. No, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I love it. It's absolutely incredible. I, give me more, please. Give me two Protosses. Not biased at all. This is the least biased casting you've ever heard of your life, all right? <laughs> I do. I absolutely am not biased in any way. But if Dark da bows out here in 0-2 fashion, uh, I would love it. It would be unbelievable. I mean, the fact that Dark came so close, even in that final match against Bunny, the fact that I mean, Bunny had amassed an army of like 170, 180 army supply, and Dark was still able to... Fedangle his way out of that Fidangle. situation without infestors too. It's it a great word. Uh, I, he, he's a magician, out. really. But we'll see what tricks Classic has up his sleeve. So far, relatively standard opening here for Classic. He did not go for the hatch block there on the natural, so Dark is able to take it safely here on Alcyone. Instead, Classic opting for a little bit more of a macro approach. Had a bit more time mining minerals with that probe. Went for the gateway scout. Yeah, we'll see what goes on. Obviously, we have to wait for that Cyber to finish, as always, to really know what's going and cooking in the Protoss book. But, uh, yeah, I mean, as memes aside, I mean, losing Dark this early as well would also just be kind of tragic. I mean, especially getting uh, recently signed by Talon Esports. Uh, it's, and it's really cool just to see all these new orgs coming in as well, right? So we, they obviously want him to perform very well. And, I mean, I, I was also I was in that little uh, that little intro video of his. It was oh, yeah, very you were. Fun That's do. right. It was very fun doing that. It was actually hilarious to, to do all that with uh, Taysis and Ziggy and all them. But, uh, you know, it would be it would be kind of tragic for him to, to bow out so early here. So, I mean, as much as it would be cool to have another Protoss go through, I mean, losing Dark this early is definitely, a, you know, I, I'm, I'm joking when I said I want the, the you know the two Protoss a little you bit. You don't have to explain I, I, I'm yourself kind, to I me. I kind of want it, but I I mean Dark is I'm I'm, I'm a Dark fan at this point. He, he plays so well. I think instead of looking at the, at the glass half empty, we could be happy with either player advancing because Dark in any round of eight is exceptional. But for Classic to kind of have a resurgent tier and to you know hypothetically beat Bunny and then also beat Dark to advance, it would be a great storyline. So for Classic now, Stargate. About as quick as you can get it without being really greedy with the probe scouting. Starting that thing up right around 304, 305 seconds. Should be setting that Oracle cross map, or actually, perhaps just going for this Overlord first. And the way that he is setting up in terms of macro, I would be surprised if he didn't throw down a very early third Nexus here. Yeah, it could be the case. He does kind of like throwing that out every now and then. That's definitely true. I wonder if he'll actually use that Oracle to uh, kill off the Overlord on the perch there. Sometimes yeah. people like to go for that. He already really rallied. For it. Will he reveal the Oracle to the... Yes, he will. I guess he will go ahead and just do that. Do you know, actually, I, I just did that strategically. There was actually a Reddit thread uh -huh. as these lings start to get in here. There was actually a Reddit thread saying that the, the way casters say revelate... Oh! Stalker's dead. What? Overlord lives. Oh my god. I don't care about Reddit, Gemini. No one likes Reddit. <laughs> this is what you wanted, Reddit person. You wanted to be to say the thing and then 
It oh. makes me, oh my god, this is gonna is get the crazy. third as well? This almost feels game ending. Oh Obviously, god. it's gonna continue on from here, but Dark just did a jujitsu move <laughs> on Classic. He baited him with the Overlord, intentional or not. He made a kind of an awkward amount of lings. I think it might have been six or eight lings very early on in the stage of the game where you generally wouldn't at this level. And the Oracle was chasing the Overlord, trying to get vision there for the Stalker. And then it chased the ones that went to the main base, leaving the Stalker wide open in the linear third to get surrounded by lings. That's your first gateway unit dead. The Overlord survived. It's going to come back and scout you later. Even Morlings are coming in now. This attack will get repelled, but the oh. whole crux of this build is getting an Oracle out. Instead of going for two or three drone kills, he wanted to get the Overlord first, which he failed at. And you should have that Nexus at least half a minute faster than Classic is actually going to get it. So everything for Classic right now is effectively a tempo behind what it should be. And Barring any big misplays here from Dark, where he lets these Oracles come in and pop six or seven drones, he is really in the driver's seat. This is a nice opening for him because anytime your build gets derailed like this as the Protoss player, it does not feel good. Yeah, no, this is going to be a, a big uh, hit to the momentum Classic was hoping to go for here. I mean, he's going to try to send a couple random Adepts over into the natural, and Dark not quite prepared, but does have those links nicely oh positioned. Goodness. Nicely done. Jumps right on top of them, forces the recall out. Does still have those two Oracles, but still not really anything get to, to get done there. One drone gets picked off there by that double Oracle hit squad. This is, yeah, I mean, Classic is not finding anything after taking that pretty decent early game damage. No, and those are uh, six adepts, are units that you, you built to defend the third, and then you want to pair them up with the oracles coming in on another expansion. You want to get damage done with the adepts, even if it's just trading them out for lings cost effectively, picking off a couple drones, forcing your Zerg opponent to lose some idle time, and potentially creating an open for the oracles. And none of that really got done. It isn't necessarily a disaster here for Classic because Yes, they were recalled and they survived, but those are six units that are not going to scale very well in the remainder of this game, especially with Dark already going into Roaches and a Hydralis dead, oh. and even an Oracle is going to fall here. Oh man, Classic just not with the start he was hoping for in this game. Yeah, things are just kind of falling apart here and there a little bit. I mean, it's not over by any means, but it's it's not been a smooth ride. He's also going Robo. Uh, Robo Bay behind us with Colossus very quickly, which is quite interesting, doing it even before he had his Twilight finish to start mm. setting up Blink and all that, and even going straight into a Fleet Peak and another Stargate as well. Very interesting style. I mean, you were saying before that Classic's the guy that's going to do a very Killer Instinct blow and just kill the Zerg, but here he's just going ahead and trying to sit back as much as possible, going to try and tech up to the farthest reaches of the Protoss tech as early as, hu as humanly possible here, it seems. And I mean, this could be a really long game. That's like the, the stuff of nightmares there for an Oracle. You go to try and kill a drone, and there's like seven queens waiting <laughs> in the mineral line. If they made horror films for Oracles, that would be like one of the one of the key moments there is... I mean, classic, I, I think part of it, Gemini, goes back to... Dark actually hasn't scouted this at all. I was not aware of that, but part of this goes back to just how much tempo he lost in the early game. The, the third Nexus was delayed significantly. The six Oracles, or not six Oracles, the six Adepts with the Oracles got nothing done. And so Classic, you know, a Twilight Council is kind of the structure that you make where it's like, you know what, this is going to give my gateway units a lot more capability. It's allow, going to allow me to be mobile. It's going to allow me to threaten on the map, take some map control away from the Zerg, and potentially posture a little bit. And Classic going quickly into Colossi and into Double Stargate like this makes me think that him after losing that tempo was basically like, you know what, I am going to slow it down. Tempo is not my strength right now. I'm just going to be as greedy as possible tech-wise and just try to slowly build up because if you can eventually get to the kind of position where you are maxed and your opponent is maxed, then suddenly that early game doesn't matter too much anymore. It only really matters if you actually start to battle it out there for the mid game or for map control. Yeah, no, I absolutely love what you're saying with that. That's absolutely true. It's like you get you get a reset almost if you mm. can get to that maxed out state. And even if you're, you know, you might not have the bank that your opponent does or anything, but you at least are in the position to fight for that 
later on into the game. You you have your maxed army. You still have uh, have a longevity into the game. So it does really kind of reset some things once you get to that state. So yeah, trying to just hunker down and get there as soon as you can and really just stall it out is definitely the play here for Classic. It's I mean, so far it's been working out. I mean, Dark is not fully maxed himself yet and is still kind of getting some of his tech developed with the extra lurkers, getting vipers out and whatnot. So he's getting ready to really start to spread out himself as well just using these lane counter attacks here and there to deny any extra bases and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, we'll see if Dark wants to just go across the map once all these lurkers start to come into play. And with these rocks getting destroyed, it looks like he wants to try to take this pivotal moment to go in between these two bases up on this high ground. Oh, with the Nidus in the back as well, it could be huge. Oh, Nidus in the main base. All right, so there are some zealots getting warped in, so Classic is aware of this. Should be able to stop that Nidus, but with Dark getting so close to the third base and the natural expansion, if he is able to entrench himself in that position with Vipers, Classic is going to have such a hard time dislodging him. Even with a shield battery like this one and a wall in, watch these buildings just evaporate under the power of those Lurkers. And with a Colossus count only at two and the Carrier counts at four, these Vipers are a really scary prospect. Let's see now. Carriers, at least one gets yoinked immediately. Luckily, shield battery is able to save the day right there. Overcharge now getting popped. His Parasitic Bomb also coming in. Lurker's a little bit undefended on the right side, but actually it was Classic walking into them and losing a pretty sizable chunk of units there. And luckily for him, he is able to actually thwart this attack. I really thought it was going to go worse for Classic there once Dark was able to solidify his position in the natural, but still not the best trade from the Protoss perspective. I think overall it was like... If he didn't walk up, oh, losing to Templar like that as well. Mm. Unfortunately, Classic really did lose a lot coming up that ramp from the, from when he where he was on the right side of the map. He got a huge lurker shot on all of his Templar and everything, which was really unlucky. But then he, his carriers were actually doing pretty okay because there weren't that many Hydras out at that point. He, I, I think Class uh, Dark didn't actually expect there to be so many carriers out so soon, so he wasn't really prepared for that many uh, to be out to have enough anti-air. So the carriers are able to keep him in the game for now and push the lurkers back. And now we have plenty huh. of hydras out. We have 22 on the field right now. Only one Viper with one more in production though for Dark. Those yoinks have got to be very on point here to allow it so that way the carrier count doesn't go absolutely unchecked. I'm actually surprised that Dark is making so many more lurkers in this situation going all the way up to 14. That's a lot, yeah. It is a lot of lurkers, and for me right now, if I'm looking at this game from Dark's perspective, the fact that we have almost double-digit carriers on the map, that is scary. And by the way, this warp prism is the luckiest warp prism <laughs> to have ever warp prism because it almost ran into 30 hydras and just by sheer luck was able to go in a little bit on the inside. But you know, my concern here for Dark is that he's not quite going to have the anti-air if a full-on engagement happens. Now, his army is very good at chipping away at the Protoss army if the abducts are solid. But in the kind of situation where the abducts aren't solid, say the Vipers get feedbacked by the High Templar, then suddenly I, I feel like he is going to have a hard time hanging with this high-tech, high-upgraded Sky Toss fleet. And I think Classic doesn't have a clue this Ninus is about to pop. Also, what is with Dark and having empty knights just popping in his Protoss opponent's yeah. bases? Yeah, he's been doing this so often today. It's so insane. <laughs> Look, he's even putting a Sage Sword. He's like, oh, God, I can't kill this in time. Anything's going to pop out at any second. <laughs> <laughs> and he just does it with what? Oh, my God, that's so sick. Wait. Wow, that's... Dark is so cute with these things. It's so incredible. He's actually going to get all these lurkers out now. Is this? This is going to this is gonna force a pretty decent response out of, out of uh, Classic here. Yeah. I'm a little confused if... If Classic had come back with more, he's Nidusing again. I was thinking the Sky Toss was going to be able to take down that Nidus, and then there's nothing to cover for the Lurkers. I mean, if the Carriers just get in and kill the Exit Root, that's Dead Supply. Oh my god, he's not, he's uh, not putting them in the Lurkers! He's not putting them in the Nidus! He's going to lose all of them! Oh my god, a big yeah. misplay from Dark there. Misclicking onto the Nidus doesn't actually get them out. <laughs> what? Okay. Oh god, that's awful. What, what I feared came true. <laughs> and now more like more more lurkers have to be produced now. Lurkers are not they're not that cheap. Yeah, okay. I mean, look at the gat, look at the bank from Dark. It's completely gone. It's 12 Hydras on the field right now. We almost have more carriers than Hydralisks. It's 11 carriers to eight Hydras. Now some corruptors are in production right here, but at any drones, Dark is almost maxed out. 
I don't even know. Do we have Flyer Carapace upgraded? I think we might just be getting level one halfway done. And it looks like Classic is working on either plus one or plus two. Yeah, it is plus two there. Well, this Knight is also still getting up, though, because that vision wasn't actually quite there. Only two lurkers, so it's just enough to annoy. This is actually super, this is super annoying, because, like, it's just one or two, so you think, oh, I don't have to really worry about that too much, but the base isn't even done. But then, oh, look at this, even a, a queen coming out to do a creep tumor and everything. Eventually, something will have to get done with that, and unless he does it, uh, does deal with it, it will actually do a lot of damage. Classic deciding to just go in yeah. to this right side here, trying to pounce as he feels like there's a big opening. We'll try to go in. There's tons of microbial shrouds on the ground here, but there's so many corruptors that need to be focus fired as well. <sighs> Yoink onto the mothership does get it killed, but these carriers still have not been dealt with just yet. The Templar are actually getting zoned away by the lurkers finally coming in, being able to storm some of these corruptors, but not the best storms either. Not a great fight from Classic. How did Dark win that fight so decisively? I actually can't believe it. He had I mean, almost the, as many Hydras as carries on the ground. There was only there weren't very many corruptors in total, and yeah, there were some abducts, and the microbial shrouds were, were clutch. But Classic just with no support there for the carriers. I think he was looking at that fight, and he had a pretty good read on what the situation was, and made a judgment call, saying, "You know what? I can just push in with this with my carriers. I'm about to have plus two. I have plus one. There's no carapace just yet. I can steamroll this position." And he was wrong. And now yeah. the carrier count has been halved. He's all the way down to six. The seventh one just popped. There's only six Templar on the field. You see about three or four of them very low on energy. You don't even have enough for a storm. Oh. And we have GG. another pause. <laughs> I thought no. he was randomly GG <laughs> as he's remaxing. I was like, oh, no. Um, but, yeah, I mean, even so, like as well, like I was talking about, those two lurkers are still alive at that natural. They killed yeah. the natural again as it was building. That's what I was talking about where it's like, Sure, it's just two, and you can be like, oh, I'm just going to ignore this for now. I'm just going to go for an attack. You still have to deal with those. They are still there, and they are still a small nuisance that will continually poke and kill any eco that you have trying to get put over there. So he still has to deal with that. Now he has to remax his carrier count as well, deal with a potential counterattack on the lower side of the map as well. It's going to get a little awkward now for Classic as he tries to recuperate after a pretty failed attack. Yeah, that was not even remotely cost efficient. Luckily for him, he was able to kill those two Vipers. But besides that, the trade was not good. He maybe got a couple of Hydras, a couple of Corruptors, but that is not worth half of the Golden Armada. Because really the carrier fleet was what Classic had been playing for that entire game. He lost so much tempo early on. He said, you know what? I'm just gonna try and play a defensive game. I'll take four bases and then a really slow fifth. I'll build a lot of Photon Cannons. And I'm just going to try and macro my way out of this and build an RV composition that will carry me back into the game. But unfortunately for him, with an engagement like that one, he does just kind of get reset. And I feel like even the two lurkers of the natural expansion, I don't think that's an oversight by Classic. I think that he was looking at that engagement and he's like, you know what? I will deal with this later. I can take a favorable fight. I will lose some supply. My rally will clear the lurkers. And I mean... Luckily for him, he was able to free a lot of supply to clear up those <laughs> lurkers, but... But he still has to clear them up, and it's going to yeah. get a little bit annoying. But, I mean, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. This is going to get a little bit, uh, definitely a little bit tricky here. Right. Uh, hopefully the, the issue doesn't get, uh, or the issue gets fixed pretty quickly here, so that way the their, you know, their focus doesn't get messed up too much here. But Yeah. By uh, the way, um, con uh, production confirmed, sorry to cut you off there, production confirmed that it is a white noise issue for Classic. He, um... Suddenly was able to hear the casters because the white noise cut out and just immediately called for a pause. Very honorable. Very honorable. What they say about Those us, put us players. <laughs> like, Look at that, we're even lie. connected. It's a lie. We even knew what we were going to say. We had the same thought. Oh, we are Protoss players. All right. We? Countdown is coming in. We're connected by the Kala. Countdown yep. coming through. The game has resumed. Dark is still maxed. Classic is trying to remax himself. Actually, those. Lurkers were able to clean up the Nexus, which is really funny. Yeah. Even though there's not too much to mine there, I mean, it is still one of your few mining bases here for Classic, and especially that gas would be useful. Finally, we'll be able to deal with that, so that's very nice. But oh, oh no God, way. the Corruptors suddenly just come out of left field and be like, hey, that's a nice little carrier. <laughs> Might as well try to get that. Nice recall, though, from Classic. Oh, you're it. kidding me. What a weird little situation this is. And now all the carriers have to come back and try and kill off these. Oh, oh my the God, mothership's the mothership's dead. The mothership's dead. 
Oh my god, that's brutal timing. I mean, you, I guess that makes sense why Classic was so worried. I mean, he was rushing back home to try lurker, and help kill these. The Lurker, is he going to target fire the, the Templar? I think he's oh. going for it. He got one of them. It's value, man. I mean, that is so much value. The fact that Dark has the foresight to be like, he's going to use air units to clean up these these two Lurkers. I'm just going to send all my Corruptors there and kill them. Oh, so He got good. a mothership for that. So and almost good. got a carrier. Dude, Dark just love. I, I love watching Dark in these late games, man. He, he's like, he always has these little tricks up his sleeve. He always finds these little avenues to make it slightly annoying for his opponent. Now getting a nice siege position with these lurkers behind the gold base, denying a lot of mining, bringing the corruptors on the side as well, finding two carriers and even oh. a tempest as well off the rallies. Dark is playing oh, extremely well to maneuver around all of this. The Protoss army is slow, it's clunky, it's hard to control and keep all together sometimes. And Dark is really showing how you can just flip them across and just have no way to deal with these super fast corruptors here. Yeah, Cla Classic is, I don't want to say tilted, but he's playing as though he were tilted <laughs> because Right now, he, he's effectively F2-ing his way across the map to try and deal with all of these little tiny fires that Dark is starting, and he is getting picked apart for it. I think in the past two or three minutes, his Air Armada has actually gone down in count because of moves like the ones Dark has done. I mean, how many thousands of resources were lost with the Mothership, those two or three Tempests that got caught out, another carrier that caught out. Oh. He even got, what, the Colossus too, I think? Yep. I mean, just so much damage done. Dark is the epitome of maneuvers that just lead to pure cost efficiency in situations like this one. And it's one of the reasons why we were both so taken aback when Stats was able to navigate the late game against Dark, because this is usually how it goes. Classic is not a pushover. He's one of the best Protoss players we have in Korea, in the world. And Dark is, over the past couple of minutes, just with sheer maneuverability, running circles around him, after one misstep, where Classic misjudged the fight and had a bad engagement, Dark has been making him pay for minutes. And Classic, he is slowly working his way back to max. He's retaking the gold base. He's trying to reestablish himself on the map. But if Classic wants to win a game from this position, I feel like it almost has to be an exhaust play with how inefficient he has been. Yeah, I mean, it, it, he's got to be able to just hunker down even more. I can't believe that he's made. That is an insane. He's even going to get the probes, too. Oh, my God. That was talk about efficiency, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. Usually, Baneling run by are some of the most inefficient harass units you could possibly use. Gets all the static D and then gets all the probes again anyway. What a ridiculous harass squad there. That was incredible. And now, I mean, he does get some storms off onto the corruptors there, but I mean, Wow, what a what a move by Dark here. Even some fungals getting some units as they walk across the map here. Dark is he thrives in the chaos, man. He is so good in these late game situations. This Protoss army is very formidable on the ground, though. Keep in mind those lurkers, their supply, their army value does not really assist, and Dark did get caught out of position. So this base right here should pretty much be forfeit. As should this one in the top. Dark needs to be able to have the Lurkers to zone out the Protoss ground, especially the High Templar, and set up the kind of attacks that he needs, the engagement that he needs. Yes. This recall is so good. I love this. The Mothership just finished. I, I kind of wish he did it a little bit later, though, if the Mothership actually was able to get on top of that base in the, the right middle side or so, because then he would have been able to just get three bases out of nowhere. That would have oh, been an insane play to be able to get that many. I really want Dark to try and take some of these lower bases as well. I, I kind of wish he, like, once he saw that those top two bases were going to get killed off, just instantly trying to take the bottom two bases away from Classic to try and, uh, you know, just recuperate the losses that he was going to see there. But yeah. unfortunately not taking them just yet, maybe just saving them for later, I guess, because the game will eventually continue on, I guess, here. Uh, wants to see. He does take one eventually here, so that's good. But still trying to make these forward positions here with a Nidus as well to hopefully oh. maybe let the Lurkers escape. No detection! But, oh once my. again! No detection here for Dark. This was one of his pitfalls in his opening series against Stats, and here it's going to cost him a lot of Lurkers. There is a nice run by there by Dark, but I don't think Classic is going to mind this too much. The Oracle should be able to clean up the majority of these lings, and... Dude, Classic has 25 pros. He's what, 25 pros. Out of been, nowhere, he's got 25 only. We've been getting so many games with low worker counts like this, and Classic... I mean, we go back to the game that Bunny played against Dark. Bunny's army was not very 
exceptional in terms of its tech, in terms of its upgrades. And of course that was a TBZ, but kind of the math plays out the same, except for the fact that Classic is building and has finally succeeded in building an army that is very, very hard to stop. This is like a one punch army. Yeah. This is not the kind of army that you take a favorable trade and then you remax and the game continues oh, on. This oh. is the army that you have an engagement and if it is a big engagement, you win or you lose the game. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh my god. Revelation Corruptors coming in. Very far forward here, which tries to get one of them, will be able to do so. Does get some parasitic bombs, getting some good damage, but I mean, carriers kind of eat those anyway. They have a lot of health. It's hard to actually kill them with that, but it will soften a lot of them up for this second fight here, as Classic really looks like he wants to push the issue. He has no economy behind this. He needs to find and engage and actually end this game. If Dark can just wipe this army once, he will win this game. There is nothing in the bank here for Classic to remax an army of this size. Dark has to find some way to act to completely break this open, get another remax, and find a way to end this game. Classic maneuvering towards the natural expansion. A neural parasite on a carrier brings it in. That's like the bargain bin yoink man. That's like the Costco package. <laughs> Exceptional. It's classic now. Movers over here to the third base. Now the lurkers do see jump, so the Archons are gonna back off, but. We might find ourselves in a situation where both players are going to lose their tech. Now, these Cracklings here in the main base of Classic, he has lost so many pylons, he literally cannot warp in Zealots to deal with them. Unless he recalls a couple of units, this is just going to continue raining on. So what you see is what you get here with Classic. Some nice feedbacks right there on the Vipers. Classic, I feel like you need to work your way into the main base and try and reset the tech here for Dark, but instead he's going to slowly work his way forward. These Lurkers, not really worth their weight, but with Revelation like this, these Tempests, if they're able to isolate those Vipers, they will one-shot them. We have six Tempests, very high in upgrades. The worry for me is the Remax. Yeah. I, have, I yeah. have confidence that Classic should be able to take one good fight. I don't know what happens after that for him. It has to be an insane fight. Oh, the feedbacks are pretty huge. Well, getting some on the Infestors as well, that one High Templar from the high ground is able to get that. These, these fights are extremely difficult to take at, from both sides here. It's super knife's edge right here. It can just swing so suddenly right now. You can see how cautious both of them are being dark, trying to find the, the one angle to come in with those Corruptors to find a, a pick here and there on some of these units. He doesn't really have any Vipers, I think. I don't think there's a single one on the field right now. So he's not able to really get the pulls. He's just trying to dive in and get on. Going right in the middle as well. Trying to split up onto them. Get forcing the storms onto his own wow. units as well. A massive engage out of Dark to suddenly overwhelm this army. And that is going to be what he wanted. Can he actually clear up the units on the ground? He's got tons of bank to do so. Surely this is just a moment of waiting. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Classic is at 35 supply. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that he is still in this game because Dark is about to max again. I was going to say... I, I <laughs> Insult to injury. I was going to say as well, I was like, oh my god, there's like a thousand minerals. What if we just get a huge charge that warp in and then like the ground no, is only no. corruptors? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. There's like 20,000 resources here for Dark. He, can he has no out. gateways. Oh, look at those broods, man. Yeah. Oh, 17. I mean, this hurts oh for Classic. I, I really do not know why. I think he's just trying to process this loss before he moves on to the next game. But, you know, even if that previous engagement had gone better hey there. for Classic, is, yeah, that's just going to be bye. a GG. Dark Rose up in game one here. But, you know, even if he had gotten a better engagement against Stark, it was unfortunate that his Archons were all the way forward trying to go on to the Lurkers. So he had no real splash besides Storm to hit the Corruptors. But I feel like a remax of Cracklings can just end the game because they will kill all of his structures. At that stage, Classic has been whittled down to, like, a twig. It was once this beautiful tree with a golden armada. It was blossoming. It's spring. It's beautiful. And then there at the end, he had like a nexus and two pylons powering yeah. 12 cannons. It's like, no, man. I, I like totally even <laughs> forgot that he lost all of his production because like, when does that even happen? But like, there was like, yeah, zero production. There was literally not, not even just the bank was a problem. He didn't even have buildings to make units with, which is like so rare to have happen. So yeah, he needed the most decisive fight of all time and Dark was not letting him have that. All right, match point now. Dark is one map win away from advancing in second place to the round of eight out of Group B. Classic fighting for his tournament life. It was a close set on Alcyone. 
We're gonna go to Oceanborn next for map number two. Can he fight back or is Dark going to the ground of eight? Classic on the bottom right, Dark on the top left. Classic's got to pull something out here to really, I don't know, just, I feel like he should go for some something a little bit different. I mean, obviously last game was a bit strange because he kind of, his hand was almost forced a little bit with how poor the early game went for him. But I have seen him also on this map go for some pretty aggressive styles, going for some like really quick, big charge lot all ins after like a fake third and stuff like that so okay. i feel like something like that could really just like after such a long game just really just set the tone and be like okay no i'm gonna try and go for something pretty early just really swift just go right in there and just try to get a really quick win reset everything and then just send us right into game number three that could be the play in a best of three three series like this one but let's not forget that classic almost clawed his way back from a, a truly dismal opening game. If you did not catch the beginning of game number one, the fact that he lost his stalker going for an overlord to a links around with four links getting into his main base, getting a scout off, and then the Canceling overlord the survives. Third. The third gets canceled. His expansion is delayed by 30 seconds, maybe even more. And as you said, his hand was forced by that, but he did a really good job of stabilizing on four bases, four bases. Now, it is a little bit easier to do that on the previous map as opposed to here on Oceanborn, as the fourth bases you take can be quite wide open. Yeah. Even the one that you take close to the, the triangle third, I mean, there are a lot of different angles that your Zerg opponent can come from that can just cause a number of problems. So I don't think we can quite have the exact same slow style out of Classic here in game number two. But I am curious to see what the game plan is going to be. Now, it is going to be a 217 Stargate. At a standard, it is a get tier in PBZ. This has kind of been the go-to for, I want to say, maybe six months or possibly even more now in yeah. this matchup. Stargates are just so good, man. They're just, just get You get scouting. You get harass possibility. You get defensive capabilities. The, the Twilight openers, like, really feels like they have just kind of been figured out by Zerg players. They're just much better at understanding when you can have certain amounts of adepts out, how many drones they need to cut to get the perfect defense and everything. So I feel like those types of openers just don't really find their mark as much. You still see some players try to go for them every now and then. I think they're still okay to rotate in here and there, but I mean, Stargate openers have just always kind of been this just very solid rock for the Protoss in this matchup. And I mean, Classic just going for that yet again here. We'll be going for the Oracle. We'll be seeing, like I was saying before, if he goes for the fast third base, we have to uh, take a look at see what his tech follow-up is and what type of building he's, buildings he's getting after that, because it could very easily switch into a very fast attack. Even though it, the third base is there, it might be a bit deceiving. Small number of links out on the map again. Gonna try and catch down this Adept, but I think that Shade should pop in time for it to survive. And yes, it does with 22 HP, but you know, one of the advantages here for this with Dark is that he is going to delay the third just a little bit, just by a smidge, as that probe does not, <laughs> it's not brave enough to venture forward to throw that Nexus down just yet. And he should be able to, if he throws it correctly or if he wants to, force a little bit of energy out of that Oracle as it's just watching ominously. Don't you dare touch that Nexus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as the Zerg player, the fact that the Oracle is just sitting on the other side of the map and not getting drone damage done is pretty nice in and of itself, especially with how late Dark has been throwing down his war crawlers over the course of really all of his PBZ games. We go back to Dark versus Stats just to kick off tonight, even though it feels like a million years ago. And It's kind of kind of uh, hurting him a little bit. Gets yeah. two drones there, almost lost three, but uh, a bit of a misstep from Classic. Gets a lot of damage onto that Oracle. Almost loses it, but will keep it alive. So that's very good that he does keep it. Mm. But uh, I mean, yeah, getting two drones, not too bad. Getting a fast Robo as the follow-up with a Forge. Okay, I was going to say, if there's no Forge, then this is going to get really spicy real quick. But that Forge does kind of keep us uh, leveled here. We are kind of trying to go for a mid-game push, it seems like, or just a mid-game uh, game itself. So 
uh, I'm curious to see what exactly Classic is going to try to go for this, because usually you, you do a Forge Twilight. Oracle's coming back in, getting wow. actually a lot of more drones. Wow, that's actually an excellent play. Six more in total. Wow, excellently done by Classic. And even a Sazen Sword on the left. Nice reaction by Dark. Doesn't get everything trapped there. Very good. But yeah, usually we see a Twilight and a Forge. This is a Robo and a Forge. Kind of interesting. What do you think about this? I wonder if it's going to be gearing up for a timing attack because so many drones went down by those oracles. Yeah, the Robo Bay already coming up. This kind of looks to me. I want to see the production tab. We still don't have a Twilight Council coming That's in. It's so wild that there's no Twilight yet. Occasionally in games like this one, finally is. the Twilight Council comes in. Occasionally in games like this where you get a significant number of drones early, especially after the Zerg makes, what was that, 10 or 12 lings to just lightly pressure the third base and keep the oracles at home for a while. That slows down the economy of the Zerg by quite a bit. Classic is actually up in workers right now, albeit only by one. And oftentimes this can lead to a timing window where two or three Colossus hitting before a hive with Blink Stalkers, with Stasis Wards, can get a lot of damage done because the Zerg army is just stretched a little bit too thin. But instead, we're going to have a Fleet Beacon in the Stargate once more. He's going right back wow. to the game plan from game one. So. Maybe that was just the plan all along. I guess so. <laughs> that early game deficit last game was just like, ah, oh, no. It's like, oh, wow, great. I'm just going to do this anyway. I'm going to sit back and do nothing. Okay. It almost feels like both Classic and Stats kind of have a similar read on how to play this matchup Yeah. right now. Both players are heavily utilizing the new Mothership. Both players opting for relatively fast Stargate transitions, sometimes with a Colossus, sometimes without them. I'm kind of amazed at how, how this is doing here. The fact that, yeah, they, they are just getting the Colossi early just to kind of sit back onto them. The fact that then you go, go straight into the Fleet Beacon as well. I, I wonder, oh, did we get a, is that a scout on? No, it's a gateway, not the actual Fleet Beacon or Stargate. Oh, nice little stasis. Doesn't quite manage to get too much. But the Spire from Dark is yeah. also a bit of a different, a different thing here. We have the fast Spire coming in. We have very few units having been made. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Oh my god, 10 uh, Mutas, and now Corruptors. Yeah, this is the clutchest scout of all oh time. Oh my because god. If he went 10 Muta into double Stargate <laughs> with a Fleet Beacon, <laughs> that that might just be game straight yeah, up. But yeah. instead, going into Corruptors like this, Oof. that Overseer is worth its weight in gold, I'm telling you. Dang, that was, yeah, you're right. That was like the most clutch timing for that Overseer to come in of all time. Which Actually, that's ridiculous. let's think about this really quickly. I, I, this might be a response to what Classic is doing. That overly, I don't think it's a coincidence that he went for the Overseer scout timing exactly mm -hmm. at that moment because, yeah, he did lose some larva with the Mulisks, but he's about to have 12, maybe 14 Corruptors out on the map in just a second. And there really aren't a lot of Stalkers on the field for Classic. Classic has been making Colossi and carriers. He has eight stalkers and not a lot to support these units that can all get hit by corruptors. So Dark may be able to come in right now, although the zoning for the stalkers is excellent. Oh wow. Just gets one for free right at the start. That's actually a great start already to this defense. I mean yeah, I it's think... gonna put completely push Dark away. So wow. The yeah. little timing he was hoping to get there with that initial corruptor switch to maybe pick off a carrier Colossus or something, it's gonna get absolutely nothing. And a mutilist started up. Oh, Ten meters. He's gonna go, contest bro. We're going toss. into Heart of the Swarm. We're gonna go full Muta Corruptor. Oh my God, that is. When is the last time you've seen this? Oh my oh, God. And in my MMR, I see it quite often, <laughs> but in, in pro <laughs> games, in pro games, it has been a minute. It's been a, a minute and a half, maybe. As oh my we God, have that's Classic continuing to power up. He's getting a second cybernetic score. He is starting plus one air weapons, and he does not have wind of this whatsoever, and there is a window, I think, where Dark, with the Mutalists scan the Corruptors, should he decide to pair them up, can find some significant probe damage, should it be in the main base or the natural expansion, because those Stalkers, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't believe they have Blink, and only just now oh, is it sorry. scouted. All right. He just barely, I, Dark was trying to pull that one Muta away, but it just barely got scouted, so St Classic does know that there are going to be a, a Muta switch coming in right now, does get on top of them, right as they're trying to come in here. And actually a nice uh, little pounce here. A couple carriers are still going to continue to latch on, trying to do whatever they can, as now the Corruptors will come to the right. But there's <laughs> cannons prepared, about to finish up. This is actually, so far, a great defense from Classic. It's all right. He lost 10 probes in total. Oh, wasn't able to kill that many units. And this is one of the things that I'm worried about is snowballing because yeah you do have the four carriers which are going to anchor you quite well defensively but only if they aren't caught out of position right and dark right now he knows classic Whoa. can't really move out of his base and actually hold that thought is 
Darkness is just gonna pounce on this, immediately picks off an Oracle against a Phoenix and a Carrier in total. I think he might have only traded out, what, a couple of Mutas and Corruptors there? I think that's a high value thing because when Dark's economy is powerful as it is now, 85 drones on, what is this, five hatcheries? Soon to be six, I'm sure the injects, of course, with no pressure at all coming out of the Protoss have just been absolutely optimal. He really has the opportunity to snowball this. I wouldn't be surprised if he even got to the stage where he just threw these lings and roaches, the small number that he has, somewhere on the map to try and pull Classic out of position just so he can lean even more heavily into the air. Oh yeah, it's going to be pain lings. Oh, pain lings as well. But I mean, there's a lot of Archons out. The two Colossi could also get a couple swipes off before they die, perhaps. I mean, the Phoenix range is also now here, so he's going to be able to even pick forward, or poke forward with the Phoenixes to maybe bait out some of the, the Mutas and try and get some kills on them. This is still a bit awkward here for Dark. I, I mean, this is actually a great move, being able to just completely dance around this Nexus here. But yeah. he's kind of committing himself pretty deep into this uh, part of that. Classic is not actually following the rest of his army, though, so it's only going to be the Phoenix over here. And the Corruptors are doing a very good job of zoning for now. And now the Probe Gills are really going to start to stack up here as the Mutas get on top of that main base. Very nicely done for Dark here. They really shut. Oh my god, even shutting down wow. two of the Stargates is a massive play. Will now jump on some of these carriers on the left side as well. Gets two of them. And now we'll be able to back out. Loses a lot of stuff for that, though. Yeah, the Phoenixes now should be able to eventually clean up the Corruptors. And Classic is being a little bit timid about this because he wants to make this trade as cost efficient as possible after the last fight. But, you know, Dark, he did get significant economic damage done. Classic is still sitting on only four bases, only just now going for the fifth. And these Corruptors, they do pack a punch. So luckily for Classic, this fight is happening above shield batteries. And guess what, Gemini? Classic, yeah, he is moving across the map. Dark, he's gonna try and hold on to this with a massive ground switch. No more air, it's gonna be match, ro mass Roachling, Corruptor, Banelink. Does he have enough to actually hold on to this though? The force fields are huge on the right side. Those Banelinks have nowhere to go. They get evaporated by the Colossi. Coming in on the left side are Roaches and Ravagers, but the Archon count is remaining strong. And Dark, I thought his army count was looking pretty scary, but actually Classic with incredible army control is making a real fight of this. I mean, there's still a lot in the production from Dark, though, that could help and still swing this towards his favor. But now, I mean, Classic is still getting... Oh, my God, he's catching some of the reinforcements wow. as they come out. Classic on the back end of that fight really did. It looked like for a second he was starting to get spread thin a little bit. The Prism also is no longer here. and The reinforcements aren't able to come in, but the units still are here for Classic. So many of those Phoenix still coming in clutch, even after all the Mutas and Corruptors are gone, lifting up the Queens, lifting up the Roaches and Lings, anything they can to help to swing this towards his favor. And now the army supplies are getting dangerously close here again. And that is always going to favor a Protoss when it gets to these lower unit counts. In a moment, I think Classic is about to have three more carriers pop as well as some more upgrades come in. And I think that is the reason why he is being a little bit more timid at the moment. He knows he has this game in a relatively good position. Oh my goodness, is there no anti -air, air here? It's just one Corruptor. Oh he can God. pick off several of these Ravagers. Overlord gonna go down as well. And look at Dark's bank. He really doesn't have much more. And also, he is so up against the ropes in terms of production. He can't stop pumping the gas pedal on these units, but he is stuck on a composition that is not going to scale well at all. He's making more Corruptors into this, and they keep getting picked off one by one. Oh my God. He doesn't have a single queen? Am I watching Rotterdam play right now? Oh my god, these <laughs> Phoenixes are going absolutely massive right now. There's zero anti-air. He can't keep a single Corruptor alive for the life of him to deal with these Phoenixes. And now they're just picking up Ravagers one by one by one. The Micro has been exceptional as well, dodging the Bios, canceling the Phoenix lifts just in time to move them back around and pick up yet another one. I mean, this is just excellent out of Classic. And on the back end, he's just making more carriers. The thing that has zero answer to them at this point from Dark. I mean, this game just took a turn so quickly. Classic had the most clutch army control. Those force fields were pristine on the route, right side. And that basically set him up for all of this. You know, if he lost his ground army, then suddenly the Phoenix is not going to be doing quite as well because Dark can actually just scatter across the map and get counter damage done. But because Classic's standing army is so great, and he's even compounding the defense with all this static D, Dark really doesn't have an opportunity to move out on the map, and so he is just getting picked apart by all of these Phoenix. It almost feels like we're watching a chess game. I mean, Classic 
has basically made it him. I don't know what Dark does from this position. He's trying to make ultras because I guess Phoenix can't lift them up, but <laughs> they also they don't They should hit. be able to, by the way, <laughs> if you have enough, you like group them all together and just as one lift the ultra into the into the sky here. But I mean, now we have a massive Ling Bane attack going on this bottom side. That's definitely going to get some damage done. But the problem is that this army is just unbelievably large. So many carriers in this as well. The, the, the Ultras are actually doing a great job of thinning out this ground force. So that actually is going way better for Dark than I expected. But how do you kill these carriers? There's nothing. You have Ravager Biles and that's it. Where are the Corruptors? They're all dead or in production. This counterattack is doing great though. This Ling, this Ling counterattack has not been dealt with. So if this is, oh my god, two okay. Colossi out of nowhere. Where did these come? Did he recall those? Yeah, he recalled oh the two god, Colossi. Oh my god, excellently done. Wow. And there, there's no counter to these carriers. I, I mean, there's only a handful of corruptors coming out. GG is called. We are going to a game in three as Dark really went back to the heart of the swarm, was it? The, yeah. We saw Corruptor Nuda against two or three Stargate with Fleet Beacon. And there's a reason why you don't usually th see that. Yeah. I think so. And this is, you know, kind of an excellent example of it. Dark, I have to say, he did an excellent job maneuvering the Corruptors and the Mutas. He was kind of taking advantage of the fact that the, the carriers are very immobile and the gateway count there for his opponent was relatively high, so he couldn't really track them. A lot of probes fell in the main base at multiple points. The Stargates were on power, but at the end of the day, once those armies actually collide, generally the Protoss air wins, unless the Zerg has significant numbers of spellcasters, which Dark did not. He was very heavily committed to that composition. So as soon as he loses the air, and as soon as Classic came through with those absolutely clutch force fields, I mean, that was like 25 plus bailings potentially neutralized on the right side. I think if those bailings get the money shot on the rest of the Protoss army, there is a chance that Dark can somehow scramble back in the game. But the fact that the control was so clean from Classic I mean, there was no longer any answer. We saw the Phoenix lift up and kill something like, what, more than a dozen Ravagers? All of the Queens, at one point there were no Queens on the map. The Corruptors were getting picked off one by one. The Protoss players have been stepping up their game. Oh yeah. I, I mean, must say. This group has been excellent. You you are feasting if you are a Protoss player today. Because these, yeah, these games have been very good. I mean, the micro decisions have been great. Like you said, that force field wall was pristine, just absolutely perfect. Uh, I mean, I, just the defense from Classic as well. At first, the Muta Corruptor, you, it's, it's similar to Swarmhost in that way, where you really need to start to snowball it quickly as the Zerg player, because if you don't get those first couple waves of damage done, then it actually becomes extremely easy for the pro... Well, not extremely, I guess, but it, it becomes much easier, because you get the cannon set up, you get the shield battery set up, and then you just need one big fight, which is what uh, Classic got in that little bottom corner, where Dark overextended with the Muta Corruptor. And then that's when it really starts to swing for him. Classic versus Dark here in the final match of Group B. It's all going to come down to Site Delta. Is Classic the underdog going to upset Dark and advance into the round of eight? Or is Dark going to fight back? It has been an incredibly close series, an incredibly close day. Almost every single series has gone to game three. Only Stats versus Classic didn't. And we have been here, what, like five hours. These players are tired. We're tired. Endurance is getting tested to its limit here. This almost doesn't feel like a GSL. It feels like a weekend tournament with it. Like the endurance just really being turned out to the max. And you know, I wonder, is Classic going to whip out something special? Is he going to come up with some clever trick? Or is he going to go back to the try it and true? That slow play with double Stargate Carrier or just try and beat Dark at his own game in the late game. It's all going to come down to this. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what's going to come out here. I, I, I just, part of me still wants to see Classic go for some really quick one-two punch in the early game, or perhaps even just, like you said, just stick with the normal, stick with what's been working. Let's see how it goes. Game three. Quick look at the crowd, really quick. <laughs> I, I've never actually seen it 
thin out like this at the end of the day because everyone is scrambling to get yeah, the last no, train yes. home. <laughs> I, I looked at the last train times even like like two breaks ago, and I was like, no, there's no way I'm catching that. It's, it's a taxi for me, for sure. Like, yeah, it's been a marathon, but I, I mean, I would not have it any other way. This day of GSL has absolutely delivered so much, and Classic barely going to miss the block on the 16 hatch there comes now into the main base, but really what what a series we have been treated to. And I mean, not even just this series, pretty much every single series today yeah. has been so incredible. Five plus hour caster. Man, you, you are, are the MVP, MVP for staying in here with us. You Everybody are based else is all home. hell. <laughs> oh my God, that guy is the coolest person I've ever seen. No, it, it's, been a, it's been a great day. I, Man, what are we going to even get in this last game? Like, yeah, I don't cause, know. Because, like, Classic, from what I've seen of him, it's even the PVTs as well, he has a style, and it works, and he does it every single time, essentially. I've seen him mix up, like I said, sometimes he throws in that early charge lot all in or something like that here and there. But he has been going in PVT. He's been going for that defensive Phoenix Colossus into carrier. PVZ, it looks like he's been going for that defensive, uh, I guess, Colossus into carrier, and mm -hmm. then just playing it out late. It's been working for him overall. It's something that he likes to do. Is he going to switch it up now at the last game when everything counts? Or is he going to just continue to play what seems to be working? I think you go back to the same style. Dark really struggled against it against stats. And Classic has proven point. both in game one and in game two that yes, he can hang with Dark in the late game. In fact, if, if somebody in this game was going to try and turn it on its head to close it out, I would have expected it to be dark with something. And, you know, it's still very early on. We might see that eventually as this one continues. But the Protoss players today generally have shown a lot of resilience against these early pressures that Dark has been throwing at them. As once again, we have effectively mirrored builds. The 217 Stargate coming in there for Classic. Exact same timing down to the second. This time with a pylon block actually there in the third base. So he really wants Dark to take the linear third. And I'm a little curious about that. This might be for him trying to set up a bit of a better angle for the Oracles to come in. Because Dark noticed in his series, I noticed Dark in his series versus Stats in his series. Now against Classic, he really has been a bit lax with the Spore Crawlers. And it's come back to bite him a couple times. In the previous game, Classic got, what was it, like seven or eight drones with yeah. his oracles coming in because, you know, frankly, if you're a Zerg player, it, it is really hard to perfectly split your queens. We don't have Spore Crawler crawl coverage at everything. And even then, it's not particularly easy if you have that third Spore Crawler because there are still some angles like the Gas Geyser in the main base or these far patches in the natural or the third base where an oracle can come in and just chip away at you with one or two kills. and. For me, one thing I really want to keen in on, or hone in on, I guess I should say, is I really am starting to feel the fatigue. <laughs> it's okay, man, you're doing good. Keep at it. Is uh, how much damage these oracles are able to do. Because I think if Dark can handle them with minimal losses, you know, maybe just two or three drones, that's absolutely within the acceptable range. I think he will be in a fi fine position. And once again, he's going for the double sport crawler as opposed to three. I wonder what would happen. A long time ago, we used to do this as Protoss players. Every now and then, you throw in a random proxied Stargate Oracle mm. in the series as well. I wonder if what kind of value that would. You don't really see it much anymore because I feel like it just, in general, Zergs just aren't always ready to defend against them. But I feel like, yeah, like the, the Spore Crawlers in general have been kind of late this series and in, in this day in general with Dark. So I'm curious to see what how that would even uh, play out there. Maybe if you oh. can get something super early. Whoa, Whoa what in the. Okay, that is not your they friend. They love that Overlord so much. They want that to is, jump from the ground and hug him. That is a canonical Overlord. He's like, I control you. You will not. <laughs> you will follow me now. <laughs> Before the Overmind finally steps in, it's like, no, actually, that's not how we do things around here. But yeah, just Dark so. steps in, man. He's the Overmind. He is. But luckily, only a little bit of lost mining time there. Shouldn't matter too much, especially with Dark oversaturating the natural a little bit. You could tell that he is trying to play a little more conservative here with his drone spread, with his queens, taking them a bit more to saturate that third base is... We, gotta we switch up. have a switch up. Yeah, this is Blink and five additional gateways. And That's going to bring us up to seven. And a Phoenix. I, I think to pair with the Oracle for the harassment, Wait. and then he goes in with a Blink. It's Oh, my. Yeah, but it's... Oh, it's so Cancels weird. It's, it's, it's oh, like no. late. Okay, it's, uh, what am I it's talking about? It's like a late about? random Phoenix. Does he, is he like... Ex 
respecting the. F I mean, there's the Muta thing again. So it, oh no, so this, is, this is what I was. So this is what I was thinking about because you are going. It looks like Classic is going for the same strategy. He's opening exactly the same. Coming in with Oracles right now, actually, to get a couple kills. Loses one, not overall the best, but we'll be able to actually get into the main base here because the spores of it in this place. Classic, though, on the back end, is doing what looks like the same thing. He's going for the same or uh, Oracle into Robo Stargate for uh, for the you know the eventual Colossus, whatever, like he did last game. But he's instead going for Blink. Dark thinks it's going to be a similar style to what he just played against last time, going for the Fast Muta again. This is, this is actually very difficult now for Dark because Classic is aiming to go for a big punch with this Blink. I love this adjustment out of Classic. Yeah, this has kill potential, especially because Mutalisk is the tech of choice there for Dark. And plus one melee attack is also relatively late. Now, it might be a tell, that there isn't gas at the third base, but Classic has played this so by the book. And Dark with this Ling coming in. Okay, he's gonna see no is units huge. in the third. No this units are massive. defending the third. There are no gases. Classic is faking a gas right now. And suddenly Dark, he starts Road Traveler production, immediately throws down a bailing nest. He knows something is coming his way, but is it too late? This is going to be very close here. Dark is scrambling to get as many units as possible out right now to be able to defend against this. This is a lot of Blink Stalkers, a forward gateway as well to help reinforce. He's got the Oracles to clear the creep, so that way eventually, if this does get a bit scrappy, uh, Classic will have the opportunity to blink backwards away from the creep. This is gonna. Oh, this is a lot of stalkers right now. We got 21. This is gonna be full on on the stalker production here for Classic. Going over, killing off this fourth base to start is going to be good. Limiting the production from Dark here, and Dark is gonna try to push this away as much as he can for now. Doesn't want to get too over eager here, and might get blinked on. So he needs to be very careful with this. Additional gas coming down here for Classic. We'll see if he continues to warp in the stalkers. Just killing the fourth hatchery enough? Is he sated or is he going to continue the attack? More stalkers now warping in, so Classic is fully committing. That stasis on the two queens, by the way. That is huge. That is two less transfuses and two very tanky units that are going to be out of the next fight. Blinks forward, gets a Ravager, finishes off that queen, and there are so many stalkers warping in. And one thing that Classic did, again, right there, just a little bit of a mind game, is he waited to show his hand that he warped in another round of stalkers. So. He's trying everything in his power to just throw Dark a little bit off his game. And now Gemini, the big push coming through the center. There's not a lot of legs yes. up for the Ravagers. He blinks forward. More Vials now coming down, are going to scatter across the front. Stalkers, but the Ravagers have been almost completely cleaned up. How many Lings we have reinforcing? Another blink on top of the Queens, on top of the Ravagers. The Anti-Air is almost out. The Oracles are now coming back as the Lings retreat. And look at the surface area. It's drones getting bold. It's Lings. Classic is getting so much done right now. I mean, this has been an absolutely decisive moment for Classic, seeing that all the Lings were on the counterattack, all the Ravagers completely naked from any other type of defense, blinks right on top of them, gets absolutely all of them, and now he's got free reign over on this third base. All the tech, all of the tech is out over here. The upgrade is here as well. This is so much damage that can come out. The third base is also still alive. A lot of the probes died, but the base is alive. If that is still there, that allows Classic, even if this doesn't end the game, it allows him to reprobe up and go for another push later on. Forcing Dark onto just, a, right now, I think it's just two, because is this base even done? It is, okay, he does have some mining there, but so many of the drones are dead. You don't want to have this oh few drones God. as a Zerg player, even getting more with the Oracle, because all the queens are dead. Dark is effectively on a two-base economy right now, especially without Oracle hovering over the third. Classic, he is retreating with his Stalkers. He knows that Dark has a formidable force right now, but in terms of scaling, Classic should be better. Classic also at home, restarting Oracle production, a second Stargate too. No Fleet Beacon. I think he wants more Oracles. The Queens are dead. There is no anti-air. Dark is trying to respond to this with Mass Ling, and he has some Infestors. Oracles are going to be the unit you want to deal with this. It's a very strange thing. You don't normally say that. To, to, to reinforcing with oracles and whatnot is not something that is generally a, a Protoss strategy. No, but it's out it's... of the box, but that's one of the reasons why I love it. I mean, yeah. that is thinking on your feet here as classic, and it is critical that he's able to keep these structures alive here. He wants this forward warp in position. Oracles are continuing to be rallied across the map. I wouldn't be surprised if double oracle production started any moment now. And I think Classic, he wants to build by time. He wants his Oracles to gain energy because if you're dark, Classic is sharking around the map right now. 
You don't know when he's going to attack. And, oh, so many links are going down, by the way. Dark's worker count oh. has not increased since 46. Now, that is a clutch fungal. He is going to get a number of stalkers right there. Is it going to be enough, though? As now the Oracles are able to start damaging the Infestor. is a high energy Infestor might go down. Does the Oracle have enough energy? Barely oh it does. Oh, my God. That was ridiculous. But it's Dark silly. can't drone. Classic is at home. He is making probes. Protoss can make army and workers at the same time, Gemini. Oh Zerg can't. Oh, my God. This brace is broken. Holy <laughs> moly. The, the, the Oracle count is going to be so sick. This is actually so... You were right. This is so smart of a transition. I can't. They are going to shred the ground. Oracles actually do such insane DPS. That, that was actually a kill on that, not a cancel, I believe. So that's actually a bit of a mistake. But it doesn't matter that much because... Classic's army is huge. His economy is doing totally fine. Dark is stuck so hard on this two base, uh, barely three economy. These oracles are getting so... He hasn't seen this at all. He has no idea that this is about to hit him. He has nothing that can kill these oracles. Dark still hasn't made a drone in like three or four minutes. His worker count's actually, I think, maybe even gone down a little bit because he has to make more yeah. structures, right? He's sitting at 46. The economy of Classic is bigger. He's taking a fourth base. Dark is only just now throwing down that fourth hatch, and this Oracle count, not only is it high, but the energy is going to be massive. These Oracles have been pooling this oh entire time in the main base, and now the reveal! The Oracle's coming in, there is a fungal, but how many queens do we even have on the map? This is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the Oracle's getting a bit separated from themselves, so a, a bit of a jumbled little fight, you could call it, I guess. But he's going to jump on top of the spore over here. Oh, these drones goodness. are going to melt under these oracles. Dark in a scramble, trying to throw some lings across the map. You're like, oh my god, hey, look at this. Don't go across. Oh, oh bring your stalkers home, please. I don't want to. Oh my god. But the oracles can't actually do it. He can't do anything against them. Dark he's has no economy. Dark has no economy. Classic is up 50 supply. Dark now attacking the triangle third with Ravagers and Roaches. But there is no anti-air to be found here. For the Zerg player, the Stalkers are coming in. They might even blink on top of this, and yes, they do. The Oracles, they might be low on energy, but I think even just the Stalkers can clean this up. As Classic pulling all the tricks out of his sleeves here in the final match is going to be able to defeat Dark. Dark right now, he's trying everything in his power to recover back at home, but he's only on 30 drones. And these links, they cannot go anywhere. As soon as Classic sends an Oracle back, that army is dead to the revelation. Oh my god, he can't even bring any units home. He's, he burrows one thing, but then it just gets revelated by the Oracle anyways. Dark is just absolutely done. He's dead. Yeah, he has absolutely nothing. He's got a sharking infester going around the middle of the map, trying to do whatever he can. 40 probes are dying, so it actually does put Classic down in an eco, but, but what are you, I mean, Wait what a are second. you gonna do? Wait. What Dark with that counterattack got 41 probes. I thought that there was no way Classic was gonna lift off the army from the third base he before the revelation. He still got seven oracles though. Oh my god, the Vipers though. Where did these come from? So I, I still think the standing army for Classic is big enough. There isn't yeah. an answer to I the mean, oracles. You, you I mean, these blink links, under the Vipers as well. Yeah, I mean, the Vipers they don't have an attack. You don't, you don't <laughs> have to do anything about them, but... I mean, what a Hail Mary play by Dark going for this counterattack. And even with this, oh, if he can get a fungal, I mean, even killing four probes right now would be so big for him. Dark is literally doing everything in his power to try to survive, but the oh. Phoenix finds! It finds the Vipers! Blink gets one, the Phoenix should be able to get another. Oh, Zealot Celebratory <laughs> killing of the rocks right there. It's part of Iyer culture. Oh my god, it actually survived those same. And I mean, Dark right now, he's just throwing everything in his power cross map at Classic to keep him at home. He's trying to get some anti-air. Right now, the only anti-air he has are four queens and I guess the parasitic bomb from a couple of vipers. I, th this game is actually getting a little weird because in every situation, <laughs> Dark cannot kill this army. I mean, Literally, this army Classic is insane. just needs to get across the map, but Dark to this point has just continually sent floods and floods of units. It's threatening a, a, an elimination where he just loses all of his buildings. Right, but that's, finally. that's all Classic can hope, or Dark can hope for. Classic has finally had none of it. Coming back over, dealing with the counterattack, saying, I don't care what you have going across to my side of the map. I am going to end you in this series. I am going to advance to the round of eight with my Protoss brother stats. Two Protoss coming together <laughs> from this group. No one thought it was going to happen. 
And here he is, Classic, after a total switch up to his original strategy, finding his mark. What a game, what a series. I feel like Dark can't believe it right now. He, he is still fighting a counterattack in the main base there of Classic, but I mean, even a recall to the main base at this stage for Classic should be able to stop this. That is not a large standing army. Even a stasis trap catching a good number of lings right there. Dark, he's just trying everything in his power. He's trying to get enough energy on one Viper. But even the Oracle's back at home. Well, what do you do here as Dark? GG! Classic advances into the top eight. Dark and Bunny are out in the round of 16. One of, the, one of the biggest upsets I think I've seen in GSL, and I, I, I can't even imagine how long. Wow. Oh God, when have we seen this last? What a group. Two Protoss advancing, never. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what an absolutely ridiculous day. I, this series, I mean, both this force field setup was just unreal. That is just... Uh, that that saved classic in this whole. Se I think I, if that does, you were right. If that doesn't go off like that, I think that's actually enough to swing it, and he doesn't actually get the final blow. There's a chance, and then he's just out. He's dead. He's gone. There is a chance. I mean, at the very least, I think Dark could have swung that into a counterattack and have time to build an army that's actually capable. Back at home, and what an unbelievable series. I mean, from from start to finish, today has been. So good. One of the best days of GSL that I can recall. One of the best days of StarCraft this year, I think. Wow. I mean, Katowice was great, but I mean, oh my god. Talk about the GSL round of 16 group B, man. Oh my good. Sorry, Tasis, but Gemini is the lucky charm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just bring me, keep bringing me back. I'll keep <laughs> blessing you with crazy games. Sure, we get a tech pause here and there, but man, the games <laughs> deliver. He gives and he takes. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's hear from <laughs> Classic. <laughs> So that was an incredibly tough series. Every match was hard, especially the final game there against Dark. There were so many moments where the game felt like he was teetering on the edge. And he says, yeah, until the very end, I wasn't sure I actually had it in the bag. Dark was really aggressive. I felt like I was on the back foot. But when I realized how desperate he was with the counterattacks, I knew I had the game won. You were able to defend the attacks quite well with your control. Classic said, as soon as I saw the Zergling counterattacks that are coming in, I was really worried. But with my force fields, I was able to defend. I'm not sure what map they're talking about in that one. And uh, the Korean casters are saying that basically every Korean front us probably was helping you guys to try and get advance from this group. It does feel that way. In the third set, there were a lot of critical moments. And at last in the final game, you were able to kill all of the queens. And you started building those oracles up. Have you been in that situation before, or was this something that happened just completely on the fly? Uh, spontaneously, I just thought, this is what I need to do. This is going to work against what my opponent has, and the oracles absolutely did their job. So you made it to the quarterfinals, and there are so many Protoss fans and Classic fans that are happy. Do you want to give any shout-outs to your fans here? <laughs> he gives the most Korean answer and says, I wasn't satisfied with my performance, but I should have won more. <laughs> As it says, last time I was eliminated in the semifinals in a very close match. I'm going to do my best to try and advance even further this time. And I mean, you, you heard it from him. Classic isn't satisfied beating Bunny and beating Dark. He wants more. And if he can continue to play at this level, I don't know, man. I'm not sure who can stop him. Maybe only stats based yeah, on this apparently data. Apparently the other Protoss player. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Wow, but truly what an incredible day. If you're watching this live and you missed the beginning or if you're tuning in on a VOD and you just wanted to catch this final match, I'm telling go you, back. go back.
every single series was killer. I think maybe only Classic versus Stats was not that exciting, but it still yeah. had its moments of flair, its moments of drama, and yeah, we'll go. this is one of the best days of GSL in memory. I mean, I, I, I literally cannot think of a day where we had more action-packed games, and it's truly a marathon. We're usually out of here at like 10 p.m. It's almost midnight. Yeah, I'm gonna take a taxi home because I don't think I can catch a train. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be, yeah, it's a late night one for sure, but yeah, just incredible games overall. I mean, the, once we had that dark stats game to start us off, I was like, like, wow, okay, this is insane. But surely, surely it can't get any better than this. And then it did. <laughs> it it, it kept just getting kept getting better. getting better. Just like, oh my God, unbelievable. <sighs> next week though as well, we do have another group. Group B is all done here, but group C will be happening next week at the same time. Gumiho, Nightmare Beyond Creator. That's also a pretty decent group. I do like some of those players in there. Creators are pretty good. Can we get four <laughs> Protosses advancing? Calm of the last down, Can Gemini. it happen? Calm down. Bring me back and I'll make it happen. Uh, group C is going to be a lot of fun. I feel like we'll get a really big deep dive into the TVP matchup, which should be, I mean, it should be great, but I don't know if any day of GSL, except maybe finals day is going to be able to top what we witnessed right here. I mean, you did an excellent job, Gemini. This oh, was a you. marathon. You showed no signs of fatigue. You're clearly much more youthful than I am. You're probably a lot healthier too. I am exhausted. I, I bet a lot of people watching at home, and I'm sure a lot of the fans here watching live are exhausted. Uh, if you're watching live or if you want to watch live next week, make sure you get those tickets. I believe they go on sale tomorrow, 5.30 p.m. KST. Get them early if you can. I mean, it's the round of 16, so it usually doesn't fill up, but, you know, better to get them early than to get them late, you know? Play it yes. safe. The early bird does get the worm, as we usually say. True. And that is also the case for GSL tickets, so be sure to do that. Uh, but yeah, an incredible day. It was absolutely amazing. It was an absolute honor to be here, to be able to cast two Protoss. Oh, it's so good to have you. You are a lucky charm. I am. S <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe it. All right, guys, that's going to be it for us today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you next time. Good night. Shine. I'll wait out all my options